Chapter 8. Thwarting Grudge As the Saturday morning sun burned the dew into mist, James, Scorpius, and Rose picked their way across the grounds towards Hagrid's hut. The half-giant was already outside, whistling cheerily and sawing a hunk of freshly lumbered wood into a rough beam. Thought we'd go all out and replace a few warp rafters while we're at it, he announced, clapping James on the back in greeting while the saw continued of its own accord, spewing sawdust into the wet grass. I see you were as good as your word, bringing along some extra helpers. Morning, Rosie, Mr. Malfoy. As always, Hagrid's voice cooled a little when addressing Scorpius. Some things, James knew, were harder to forget than others, and it was common knowledge that Scorpius's now-dead grandfather, Lucius, had once arranged for Hagrid to be sent to Azkaban for a time. Despite this, within fifteen minutes, Hagrid's good nature and cheerful mood took over, and he was soon hoisting the blond boy to the roof and showing him the ins and outs of nailing shingles. Very nice, Mr. Malfoy, he nodded encouragingly. You've got quite an eye for detail. Couldn't make those shakes any straighter with a ruler, I'd wager. Scorpius nodded half-heartedly, but James could tell that he was pleased with himself. By mid-morning tea-time, the sun had risen to a hard diamond, warming the late autumn air and revealing a nearly completed new section of roof, its fresh shakes a pristine cedar pink against the faded grey of the rest. The smell of sawdust hung in the air of the hut, mingling with the crackle of the fire and the steam of black tea. Midnight flying, Hagrid shook his massive head, smiling as he poured. Sounds like something your dad would have done, I admit. Oh, he would never had the gall to crash through my hot roof. He plunked his tea onto the table with a chuckle. Scorpius reached for a cup. Potter certainly seemed to have a knack for trouble, he said pointedly, arching an eyebrow at James, and dragging other people along for the ride. Rose stared seriously into her cup, swishing the tea from side to side. Hagrid, she said suddenly. What do you think about Mr. Filch being granted magical powers? Hagrid looked up, surprised. Magical powers? he repeated, smiling in confusion. You can't mean Mr. Filch. Why, he's a... well, you see, he's a... He paused, his brow working furiously, trying to fight the inertia of his mouth. He's the caretaker, Mr. Filch is. What's he er, need magic for? Everyone knows he's a squib, Hagrid. Scorpius rolled his eyes. But the headmaster has given him a magical cane. It runs on Grudge's own magic somehow, and Filch is going a bit mad with it. Well, Hagrid said, easing himself into a chair, a cup and saucer balanced in his enormous hand. I don't suppose there's any harm in that. I dabbled in a little illegal magic back when I wasn't supposed to. Had me one made into an umbrella, just to keep it secret. Old dead master Dumbledore knew about it, of course. Couldn't get anything past him. I still use it these days, even though I don't need to hide it anymore. He nodded towards his pink umbrella, where it leant next to the door. We know, Rose said, smiling slightly. The pink umbrella was fairly hard to miss, but still, even when Dumbledore was allowing you to use your magic umbrella, he never gave Filch any magical powers, did he? I never even thought such a thing was possible. You think Grudge is just a better wizard? Hagrid looked so sharply at Rose that his tea slopped into its saucer. Albus Dumbledore was likely the best wizard ever there was. I'll have you know that he could have given magic powers to a walnut if it had a mind. There's nothing any wizard alive could do that Albus Dumbledore couldn't have done better. Blimey, he's liked when we invented half the spells in your textbooks. Of course, Rose demurred quickly. You're right. So why do you suppose he never shared his powers with Mr. Filch, though? And Headmaster Grudge did. Hagrid settled back into his chair with a long creak. Headmasters is different, that's all. That doesn't mean Mr. Grudge's wrong. It just means he does things his own way. You lot don't need to concern yourselves about it, believe me. Don't go making the same mistakes your parents did. And not just once, neither. They was always doubting the powers that be. 
coming to me with wild stories about how Professor Snape was out to get him, and how Headmaster Dumbledore was foolish to trust him. If they knew half the things I knew. You mean the half you didn't accidentally tell them? James murmured with a grin. Exaggerations, Hagrid proclaimed with a wave of his hand. You've been reading too many of Professor Revalvier's stories. Why, if she was here and not on holiday, even she'd admit most of that was made up just to keep the tale interesting. He pushed further back into his chair and sighed wistfully. But it's true that things were very different back in those days, and that's mostly because of Headmaster Dumbledore. He was a great man, and don't let anyone ever tell you any different. James suddenly found himself thinking uncomfortably of Professor Avior. It occurred to him that his father, Harry, wasn't the only person who would be rather unstrung by the existence of a dodgy doppelganger of Albus Dumbledore. Tell us about him, Hagrid, he said. Did Headmaster Dumbledore have any, uh, secrets? You'd know as well as anyone, wouldn't you? James half expected Hagrid to chafe at the question, but the huge man merely gave a shrug and stared out the window. Everyone has secrets, I expect, he said. And the greatest of us probably have the greatest secrets of all. I never pride, of course, but I can tell you this. All those stories that have been told about Dumbledore since his death, especially the trite written by that horrible Rita Skeeter, it's all just plain rubbish. He may have had his secrets, and he may have done some things he regretted in his youth, but all that was nothing compared to the good he did overall. Why, when he was still a young man, Dumbledore dueled and defeated the infamous Gellert Grindelwald, who had once been his best mate back before Grindelwald turned old dark and vicious. That takes more power, mind. That takes strength of character, fighting someone who was once like a brother to you. Hagrid grew silent and stared hard at the window. The fire crackled merrily. Trife snuffled and stretched by Hagrid's feet. Outside, voices called in the distance, enjoying the unusually warm Saturday morning. A great man, Hagrid said again, shaking his head as if snapping out of a trance. He sipped his tea. You know, there were those who didn't believe the news when he died. Said it wasn't possible, especially the way it happened. Silly, of course, but that's the kind of legend Albus Dumbledore was. Even at his funeral, there were those who refused to believe it was all over, refused to admit to themselves that there was any body in that crypt. It had to be a trick, or a mistake, or some sort of elaborate plan. Even today. He paused and studied the dregs of his teacup. In a lower voice, he went on, Even today, there are people who think Albus Dumbledore is still out there waiting, watching. Just biding his time, working out some last master plan. And when the time is just right, when the perfect moment arrives, why, he'll show himself again. He nodded to himself and sighed hugely. He'll show himself again and make everything just the way it's supposed to be. He shook himself once more and looked around at the students seated at the table. But that's silliness, of course. Even great men die. I expect we all know that by now. They die, and when they do, why, there's no coming back. James nodded slowly, emphatically. He did know that. He knew it all too well. At breakfast the following Thursday, just as the first frost laced the windows and the fire in the great hall was stoked to capacity against the creeping chill, Nobby returned. He landed clumsily on the table nearly stumbling into James's porridge, looking unusually bedraggled and exhausted. That must have been some journey, Rose commented in surprise, putting down her pumpkin juice. James reached for Nobby's leg and began to untie the parcel of notes attached there. It's about time, too. I've got a nice fat letter all ready to go back. Just wait until Mum and Dad hear what's been going on here. He untied the notes from Nobby's leg and then paused, frowning down at them in his hands. What? Ralph asked in a hushed voice. Should we wait to eat them later, do you think? No point, Scorpius muttered, leaning close to James and peering at the letters. Look. He took the letters from James and held them up. Lily, Rose, and Ralph leaned close. Those are our letters, Rose hissed in surprise. 
She looked around at the others, alarm dawning on her face. The ones we sent to my parents and Uncle Harry. They came back unopened. What's going on here? James turned to peer up at the head table. Headmaster Grudge was seated in the centre, neither eating nor drinking as usual. It was difficult for James to tell from so far away, especially without his dreaded glasses, but the headmaster seemed almost to be watching him. After a moment, the old grey wizard stood and tapped his empty goblet with his wand, calling attention. The babble of voices died away as everyone turned towards the head table. Some of you will have noticed, Grudge announced calmly, his deep voice ringing through the hall, that there have been some changes regarding school post. Due to the current stresses placed upon the vow of secrecy, external measures have been implemented to ensure the continued security of the magical world. For the time being, no unauthorized post will be allowed in nor out without the consent and approval of school officials. A wave of whispers rippled over the room at this rather incredible turn of events. Rose met James's eyes with growing unease. "'Calm yourselves, students,' Grudge went on, raising his voice. "'There is no cause for concern. If you have need to contact your families, you may do so at any time. You will merely be required to do so via myself, or, if you prefer, Professor Votary. If we approve your correspondence, it will be sent without delay by a fleet of especially charmed owls currently in our employ. Alas, your own owls, and those in the stable of the school owlery, would simply circle the school endlessly, unable to break the temporary boundaries. James reached to stroke Nobby's bedraggled back. Sorry, mate, he whispered. I didn't know what I was sending you into. They can't. Do this, Rose whispered stridently. It's, it's not legal. Scorpius frowned up at the head table. This is no new rule, he muttered. I'd wager that boundary has been up for weeks. He's just telling us now because people are starting to ask questions. But why? Ralph shook his head. Are they really worried that the old magical world will get blown open by a stray owl? James shook his head. Guys like Grudge don't care about the security of the magical world. They care about power. He's shutting down the post because he can. Or perhaps, Lily said in a very low voice, he's just trying to keep his secrets. Scorpius looked at Lily sharply. Are you suggesting that Grudge has stopped the post just to keep us from blabbing to our parents? James shuddered. The thought was almost too chilling to consider. Next to him, Lily shrugged slowly. Later that afternoon, Rose and James caught up with Professor Votary outside his office. Yes, students, he said, clutching his enormous badge-covered carpet bag to his chest and locking the office door with a tap of his wand. We just wanted to ask about the post, sir, Rose said, falling in step next to the short, fat wizard. We have some letters that got returned to us. We were hoping perhaps you could just... just stamp them. James added quickly, or whatever you need to do to just, you know, send them on. A necessary measure, I suppose, Votary sighed brusquely. Personally, I suspect a few stray owls leaked strategically into the muggle world would be an excellent way to break the news to them gently. Strategy and moderation is what's called for, nothing like the fiasco that occurred across the pond. Still, the march towards progress is always uphill, and equality is an egg best broken, uh, slowly. He seemed to consider this analogy critically for a moment as he walked, then shook his head. Be that as it may, the headmaster is quite wise, quite wide indeed. Can't allow things to slip any further out of hand. This must be handled delicately. So, where are your letters? Rose glanced quickly up at the professor and then at James. We, uh, don't have them with us. We were just asking, what would it take? You implied you were in rather a rush, Votary frowned as they turned a corner. Bring them to me and I will inspect them and send them straight on. It isn't as if there is a queue a mile long at the moment. They're up in our dorms, James answered lamely. But, uh, you'll need to inspect them. Votary nodded briskly. Why, of course, that's the entire point. Purely a formality, I assure you. 
he explained. I abhor any infringement of privacy, of course, but desperate times call for desperate measures and all that. The headmaster wants to ensure that no overly incriminating objects or comments fall into the wrong hands. Sensible, if a bit, well, uh, totalitarian. Peace at any cost, eh? He hefted his carpet bag and tilted his head towards a prominent badge affixed to one end. Peace at any cost, it flashed in red letters. James nodded unenthusiastically. Rose spoke up. We'll just bring them by your class tomorrow, won't we, James? Sure we will, James muttered. Votary frowned at them vaguely. Well, that will be fine, I suppose. Good evening, then, Miss Weasley, Mr. Potter. They waited for the professor to walk on without them until he rounded a corner. Then, without a word, they ran down the stairs and out of the doors of the entrance hall. The sky was low and steely, packed with clouds and seemingly pregnant with icy rain. Wind marched across the lake, wrinkling its surface into long, iron-coloured breakers. The waves thudded against the dock, spraying mist over Scorpius, Lily, and Ralph where they waited, their shoulders hunched under heavy cloaks. "'Any word from Zane and Nastasha?' James asked, as he and Rose hurried to join them. "'I contacted Zane with a shard,' Ralph said. "'They're coming to get us here in the next few minutes. Experimental Communications Club is meeting early today, in some super-secret location, so they got special permission to escort us over.' James tilted his head quizzically. "'They couldn't just meet us outside the cabinet once we get to Alma Alaron. Ralph shrugged and tossed a hunk of stale bread onto the waves. A long, pinkish tentacle surfaced, dabbed the bread, and then coiled around it, dragging it down. Dane was all weird about it when I talked to him, like he was afraid to say too much or something. Chancellor Franklin was going to forbid both of them from leaving campus ever again, but Zane's head of house convinced him to go easy. Good old Professor Cloverhoof, James sighed. Sometimes I guess it really is good to be a zombie. Sometimes nothing, a voice declared from behind. James glanced back to see Zane clumping towards them along the dock, Nastasha close behind. Sneaking around is almost the zombie cardinal virtue, the blonde boy went on. Still, the Jersey Devil had to pull every trick in the old zombie handbook to get us out of that one. I was just a poor innocent bystander, Nastasha added, batting her eyes meekly. We pixies don't like to play that card much, but it works in a pinch. I got a stern talking to from Mother Newt and a week of cleaning cauldrons, but meh. She shrugged and looked out over the choppy waves. James tried to catch her eye. Ever since she had promised to tell him her snaky secret, they had not had a moment alone. He hoped to corner her after today's discussion. So what's going on with XCOM? Ralph asked Zane curiously. Why do you have to meet us here? Zane glanced around furtively. Top secret stuff. Need to know basis. I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. All right, all right, James said, rolling his eyes. They're reading our post, Rose stated, getting directly to the point. They're reading it? Zane repeated. They can't do that, can they? James's brow darkened. Desperate times call for desperate measures, he said, quoting Professor Votary. Peace at any cost. Bah! Votary's going along with it because he's a dupe. But Grudge is definitely clamping down on communication for his own reasons. Perhaps Lily is right, and he is trying to keep us from reaching our parents. Zane tilted his head consideringly. I could take your letters back to the Aleron and mail them from there, I suppose. Already thought of that, Scorpius shook his head. Owls don't cross oceans, remember? We use kitchens, Nastasha corrected haughtily. They totally cross oceans. James plopped onto the end of the dock between Lily and Ralph as the others crammed around. It's a good idea, but it would take too long. We need a way to contact my parents and Uncle Ron and Hermione, he added, nodding towards Rose. Straight away. The longer we wait, the creepier things get. Filch is totally abusing his magic, Lily interjected, turning to Zane. He's a squib bully with a big old wand now, thanks to Grudge. He's got everyone scared to death, now that he can catch and punish them however he wants. She rubbed her own hand unconsciously, where an angry red welt still formed a scribble on her skin. Felch supercharged is definitely seriously bad news, Zane whistled in awe. Who else has he dropped the hammer on? Ralph shifted. Who knows? It's a new rule that no one discusses their punishment. 
he said, his voice hardening. It's supposed to be a privacy thing, but all it does is make everyone's imagination run wild, and there's Filch always roaming the halls, just looking for reasons to give out his dreaded detentions, banging about that cane of his so we'll never forget what he can do. The whole school is feeling it, James agreed. There was a pause as wind tore over the dock, slapping the waves against its pilings. When it fell away, Lily spoke up, changing the subject. I've been wondering about something. What's that? Rose asked, looking aside. When that horrible, watery woman showed up, Lily said thoughtfully, still staring at the waves. Right before she grabbed me, she swiped at Eves, remember? Scorpius nodded. Serves the little imp right. Lily looked around, addressing everyone at once. Has anyone seen Eve since? James frowned, thinking hard. He glanced at Ralph, then the rest. No, I can't say that I have, actually. Any of you? Scorpius and Ralph shook their heads. I haven't either, Rose admitted. You think it's actually possible? Could that watery woman have really— You can't kill a poltergeist, Nastasha said matter-of-factly. They aren't technically alive to begin with. Lily looked earnestly around at the others again. Either way, Teve seems to be gone. If he really was somehow wiped out by that thing— It's proof that something really happened, James nodded. It isn't just our word anymore. But— Zane shook his head firmly. Who or what was that woman? Where did she come from? How did she get into Hogwarts? James looked incredulously at Zane. It was the Lady of the Lake, he declared. She travels through water. I've seen it myself. She can go through pipes, lakes, even oceans. As long as there are taps, she can get in. Rose was frowning hard at James as he spoke. Finally, she said, are you totally sure about that, James? As sure as I can be, James admitted. I never really saw her face, but it makes sense, don't you think? Rose shrugged nervously. Perhaps, I suppose. Ralph peered at her. Do you have another idea, Rose? She shrugged again, not meeting his gaze. Scorpius rolled his eyes. Oh, let's not beat about the bush. We're all thinking the same thing. What? James demanded, his face reddening. Think about it for a moment, Potter, Scorpius prodded. The water woman called Lily by name. She said she had missed her. And then she tried to run off with her. Doesn't it remind you of something? James shook his head stubbornly. No, I don't have the faintest idea what you're getting at. Petra, Lily answered softly, realization dawning on her. James looked down at his sister, speechless. Her eyes were wide and thoughtful, almost eerily calm. Finally, she looked up at him. Petra took me once before, remember? She magicked me right out of the audience of the play during your second year. She was going to sacrifice me in the Chamber of Secrets, all to get her mother and father back. Lily, that wasn't really Petra, James insisted nervously. She was under the influence of the last shred of Voldemort in her soul, but she fought back. She overcame it and saved you in the end. Maybe she regrets that now, Lily replied. Maybe she wants another chance. That wasn't Petra, James declared, raising his voice. Suddenly, as if to counter his argument, a memory flooded into his mind. The eerie woman's voice that had called out to him from the darkness of first night. His father, watching from the marauder's map, had witnessed the confrontation. It was Petra, son, he had said. Petra Morganston. Petra's the bloodline, Ralph admitted quietly. She may have overcome Voldemort's voice in her head once, but it won't just go away. It's with her forever. Eventually, probably, he shrugged, unwilling to go on. And she's powerful, Zane added gravely. She and Izzy both. Together they were somehow even more powerful than Merlin. He couldn't stop them. James felt like he was falling dropping into the depths of the lake beneath him. Coldness seeped into him from all around. Sister Fate, he said to himself, thinking back to that horrible night. That's what she called them, the Lady of the Lake, Judith. She called Petra and Izzy her Sister Fates. You mean, Rose asked tentatively, maybe they're all one and the same? 
that doesn't make any sense at all, Ralph said, shaking his head. But James wasn't so sure. Suddenly he felt less sure than he ever had in his life. None of this changes anything, Zane said firmly. Our first task is still to contact your parents somehow, get their help sorting all of this out. Don't you have another cousin here? Nastasha piped up. Maybe you could use him as a mule somehow, piggyback a secret message when he writes home? He wouldn't arouse any suspicion, right? Louis certainly is a mule, Rose muttered, and he's about as suspicious as a flubberworm, but there's still the chance a secret note would be spotted when they inspect his letter. We need something we can be sure we'll get through. James suddenly sat up as an idea struck him. Something we can be sure we'll get through, he repeated, squinting thoughtfully. Something that can't be intercepted. You having a brainstorm over here, James? Zane asked. I might be, James nodded. But it'll be risky, especially with Filch on the loose, and we'll need help. Scorpius cocked his head sceptically. Help from who? James glanced back at him, his thoughts racing. The whole Night Quidditch League. Oh. Scorpius shrugged sarcastically. Just that? I'll get right on it. You do know that Longbottom shut us down entirely, right? Rose, Ralph and I will talk to Professor Longbottom, James replied. He can't be on board with Grudge and his new rules. Rose narrowed her eyes. Are you going to tell us this idea of yours? James shook his head. Let me work out the details. Scorpius, just see if you can get all the teams out to the pitch tonight at midnight. Tell them it'll undermine Filch and Grudge. That should get him there. I'll explain everything then. Rose and Ralph, we need to corner Professor Longbottom tonight after dinner. What about me? Lily asked shrilly, hooking up next to him. I want in on this. Not this time, little sister, James said firmly, and don't argue with me. If Filch punishes you one more time for something I do, I swear I'll curse him back to the Stone Age. And me alongside you, Ralph agreed fervently. I don't know what you got in mind, Zane said, giving James the first real smile he'd seen in weeks, but I love it already. I wouldn't miss it for all the mustard in New Amsterdam. For now, though, we'd better head back to the Aleron. XCOM starts early today. With the meeting nominally adjourned, the group began to make its way back to the castle. As they walked, a fine, cold rain began to spritz in the wind, stinging their faces like sand. James dropped to the rear of the group, falling in alongside Nastasha. You and me, he said under his breath, staring at the ground as he walked. Tonight, after everything's over, you promised you'd tell me everything. I remember, she murmured tersely. I've kept my part of the bargain, he went on. I haven't told anyone. You keep yours. She glanced aside at him sharply, her eyes dark, nearly sparking with anger. Then, with eerie suddenness, her face changed. She leaned close to him in the stiffening rain, pressing her shoulder against his. She sighed deeply, shuddering as she let it out. Almost without thinking, James put an arm around her. She leaned into it, letting him support her. Zane, walking ahead of them, his shoulders hunched in the rain, fortunately did not notice. He's completely mad! James shook his head as he, Ralph, and Rose climbed the stairs towards Professor Longbottom's quarters some hours later. Experimental communications wasn't meeting early at all. Zane just wanted to show us how he could gimmick the cabinets into taking us into the basements beneath Administration Hall. Did he? Rose exclaimed in a hushed voice, obviously impressed. How is that even possible? That's got to take some serious technomancy. Ha! James scoffed. You don't understand how zombies think. Why use messy quantum stuff like technomancy when you can just play a cheap trick? Ralph explained. Zane just planted a protean charm on the Alma Aleron cabinet, connecting it to a silver coin he carries in his pocket. So when he vanishes the coin to a new location, James added, smiling despite himself, the protean charm sends the Alma Aleron cabinet to the same place. Rose squinted in concentration. That's... that's... She shook her head in wonder. That's bloody brilliant! Seriously! So if he sends the silver coin to the basements beneath Admin Hall, their cabinet goes there, too. We step into this side and pop out beneath the guarded areas at ground level. But doesn't anyone notice when their cabinet goes missing? Nastasha came up with the fix for that one, Ralph replied. They hid an old crate behind the cabinet and put a visum ineptio charm on it. 
When the cabinet disappears, everyone sees the crate as the missing cabinet, but with a sign nailed to the door. James held up his hands as if framing a placard. Caution! Rabid nargle inside. Rose clucked her tongue. They could have done better than that. Nargles don't get rabies. Still, that's dead brilliant. You didn't explore the basements yet, did you? No, James said firmly. No time. Besides, none of us were prepared. And double besides, Ralph interjected. Those weren't like any basements I've ever seen. More like catacombs, twenty feet high. And triple besides, Rose said, stopping them outside Professor Longbottom's door. When you do head down to find this crone louser witch and learn what we can about the Morrigan web, I'm totally coming along. Ralph boggled at her. You have a bit of an unhealthy thing for danger, don't you, Rose? I've never seen dwarf subterranean architecture before, she sniffed. I'm a curious sort, that's all. James stepped past her and rapped loudly on the door. No one is going anywhere, he whispered, until we get word to our parents about what's going on here at Hogwarts. Let's hope we can get Professor Longbottom on board with us. There was a shuffle from beyond the door, then the rattle of a lock. A moment later the door swung open, revealing the professor in his evening clothes, a pair of loose flannel slacks and vest over a white shirt, buttoned to the collar. He smiled down at the students, but James thought there was something else on the professor's face. Was it worry? Nervousness? James, he said jovially. Ralph, Rose, what can I do for you three? Good evening, Professor, James greeted him. We were hoping to talk to you, uh, in private. It's about, well, you know. The Professor laughed lightly, and again there was an uncharacteristic brittleness in it. I'm afraid I don't know, in fact, but, uh, certainly, yes, do come in. I was just, well... He glanced back into his rooms as if expecting something to jump out at him. After a moment, he stepped stiffly aside and gestured for them to enter. The professor's sitting room was comfortably furnished and rather pleasantly cluttered. A huge painting of a sunlit greenhouse tended by a skinny monk dominated the wall over the fireplace. The monk dug enthusiastically in a bathtub-sized pot, occasionally spotting away the leafy tentacles of its inhabitant. Tea, perhaps, Longbottom suggested, indicating a platter steaming happily with teapot and cups. I was just about to have myself a nice after-dinner spot. Happy to brew some more. No thanks, Professor, Rose said, seating herself on the sagging sofa. We can't stay long. We just wanted to talk about everything that's going on, and ask for your help with something. James opened his mouth to explain further, but the Professor overrode him. I can assure you, Miss Weasley, he said rather unnecessarily loudly. As I have told you before, your owl studies are well in hand. You have years to memorize the notes I have provided in class. Just remember, herbology is a lifetime study. I won't expect you to know everything after only a few short terms. That's, James said slowly, not really what we came here to discuss, Professor. Scorpius told us everything, but don't worry. Your secret is safe with us. Besides, Rose here says the somnambulus isn't really illegal as much as it's just highly regulated. No fear there, Longbottom smiled pouring hot water into his cup. I've abandoned that particular pursuit. It was a hobby, but it ran its course. Interesting stuff, Somnambulus. It won't be on the test, however. He laughed lightly, unconvincingly. Yes, James nodded, frowning. Well, what we really wanted to talk to you about is night— A loud clatter interrupted James, drowning his words as the tea platter crashed to the floor, shattering its freight of cups. Oh, dear me! Longbottom said loudly, looking down at the broken cups, the teapot still steaming in his hand. How clumsy of me! He glanced up at James, met his eyes, and then slowly shook his head, his eyes intense and full of warning. Here, Ralph said, getting out his chair and producing his oversized wand. Let me help you with that, Professor. With a few quick repero charms, the tea set was reassembled and settled back onto the table. By the time the task was finished, Everyone was standing, wands in hand, looking around rather uncomfortably. Well then, Longbottom nodded heartily. Thank you very much for your assistance. How very clumsy of me indeed. I do hope I have addressed all of your, uh, concerns. Do feel free to come by my quarters any time. Any time at all, yes? James, Ralph and Rose found themselves pressed towards the door. 
A moment later, they stood in the corridor outside, looking back at the professor in confusion. Thank you again for stopping by, Longbottom said, the smile fading from his face. I will speak to you again tomorrow, I expect, at herbology class. Perhaps you would be kind enough to stay afterward and help me repot some mandrakes. I know we aren't supposed to do it until later this term, but Professor Heretofore has asked me to expedite a few. They can be quite loud, you know, quite noisy indeed. He nodded meaningfully, the smile entirely gone from his face. Then, rather abruptly, he closed the door. It locked sharply. What? Rose said in a low voice. Was that all about? Ralph scratched his head, staring at the closed door. None of us have herbology tomorrow, do we? Come on, James sighed. This whole place has gone nuts. Looks like we're on our own tonight, after all. Disgruntled and worried, the three made their way back towards the main stairs. By midnight, the sky had finally cleared, revealing a bright sickle moon and a dusting of fine silvery stars. Early winter chill frosted the grass so that it crunched softly beneath James's feet as he trotted across the pitch, meeting the crowd already milling on the centre line. "'What's the trunk doing here?' he asked in a harsh whisper, gesturing at the Quidditch trunk where it bucked in the moonlight. "'You asked for the entire night Quidditch League,' Scorpius answered tersely. "'What are we going to do, play Winkles and Augers? The trunk goes wherever the league goes.' James ran a hand over his face. We're not here to play Quidditch, he exclaimed. We're here to send a message to my dad. A babble of hushed voices arose on the night air. James held up his hands, calling for attention. Look, you're all as unhappy about the way things are going as I am, right? Filch running around like a one-man inquisition, and Grudge shutting down all posts in and out of the school? He isn't shutting it down, Nolan Beetlebrick commented. He's just keeping a tight rein on it. Yeah, Herman Potsdam shot back. By bloody reading it all. Another rush of babbling voices arose in response to this. Quiet down, all of you, Zane called hoarsely, stepping alongside James. Seriously, this is dictator stuff. Grudge would probably call this whole meeting a subversive plot and throw us all in the dungeon if he caught us. Fira Hutchins stabbed her hand into the air. I don't know about the rest of you, she said. But I thought this league was about Quidditch. I'm not looking to get rounded up by Filch. He's gone completely mad. Come on, James, Albus called, cupping his hands to his mouth. What's the deal? The rest of the teachers won't let Filch get away with this forever. Grudge may be the headmaster, but McGonagall and Longbottom have faced worse. They can handle this better than we can. At this, a tall figure stepped between James and Zane, making the gathered night Quidditch players shrink back in alarm. James glanced up and was shocked to see Professor Longbottom, his face shadowed beneath a heavy cowl. "'You should all be back in your beds,' he said firmly. "'Night Quidditch has been disbanded. You've no idea what you've risked coming out here again.' "'This is what we wanted to talk to you about earlier, Professor,' James hissed. "'I didn't want to do this behind your back. We wanted your help.' Longbottom glanced down at him, his face grave beneath his cowl. James, you more than anyone should understand the gravity of this sort of thing. If Filch discovers this, I need to contact my dad, James interrupted. I need to tell him what's happening here, and there's more. I can't tell it all to you now, but when we were in New Amsterdam, we ran into this... Longbottom hushed him suddenly. He glanced aside at the others gathered on the pitch. Most of them were dissolving into knots of nervous conversation. Only Albus watched from a distance, his eyes narrowed. Boys? Longbottom whispered, leading James and Zane a few paces away from the others. Things are much more serious than you know. Many teachers are even more worried than you. Why, Professor? James asked quietly. Why doesn't anyone stop Grudge and Filch? Because Filch has the backing of Grudge, and Grudge has the backing of the Ministry, Longbottom explained quickly. Anyone who defies them doesn't last long. You'll notice that Professor Ravalvier is no longer teaching at Hogwarts. I thought she was just on holiday, James frowned. That's why that new substitute Wislet teacher is filling in. Revalvier is not on holiday. She's under questioning by the Wizengamot for subversive behaviour. She was the first to challenge Grudge on his new policies, and she did so loudly. Within a week she was relieved of her post and taken to London for questioning. But, Zane sputtered, for what? Does it matter? Longbottom answered helplessly. She got herself into trouble with the Ministry once before for those books she published in the Muggle world. 
it wouldn't be difficult for Grudge to drum up new suspicions about her. And with her out of the way, he was free to fill her post with someone especially loyal to both him and the Ministry. Herbertina Blovius is no literature professor. She's an undersecretary to the Minister of Magic himself, albeit one with an unfortunate affection for, well, certain kinds of magical literature. James nodded dually. I looked over the new class reading list. She's got a starting on Persephone Remora's stupid vampire series next term. Longbottom shook his head dismissively. The point is that Grudge gets rid of people who challenge him, and he has ways of knowing who is against him. Few places seem to be safe from his ears, not even my quarters. That's why I asked you to meet me in the greenhouses tomorrow, he added, exasperated. The mandrakes would drown out our voices if anyone or anything was listening. I was going to tell you all of this then, when it was safer. I don't understand, Zane whispered. Why don't you just contact James's dad yourself? Obviously he wouldn't approve of what's happening here. Maybe he can get the auras involved or something, raise a stink about it until someone at the top listens. Longbottom shook his head slowly. As I said, Mr. Walker, things are much more serious than you know. Even teacher correspondence is subject to grudges inspection. He claims it is the edict of the ministry, but we know better. Every teacher's flu is monitored, travel is restricted, any hint of subversion is dealt with swiftly and permanently. There is plenty of secret resistance, of course. Myself, Professors McGonagall, DeBellows, Trelawney, Flitwick, a few others. But we must keep very quiet and use the utmost care. If we are discovered, we will be removed from the school completely, and therefore be of help to no one. You seriously believe your own quarters are being spied on? James rasped. Is that why you were acting so daft tonight? It is a very real possibility, Longbottom sighed. There is no question that Grudge has ears in the most unexpected places, although none of us yet knows how. I couldn't let you talk about night quidditch in my quarters lest you incriminate all of us. James, you and all these students must go back to your dormitories immediately. This is far too dangerous for any game. We're not here to play quidditch, Professor, Zane said. James has an idea. James nodded fervently. I think we can contact my dad he explained quickly. If we all work together, that is. We can send him a short message, get him to talk to us later by flu. Are the dormitory hearths monitored? Longbottom shook his head slowly. No, no, I don't think so. But how, James? How in the world can you get a message to your father? We write it, James answered. In the sky, with all of us forming the letters. My dad has the Marauder's map. It shows the whole castle and the locations of everyone in it, and he says he's keeping an eye on it. I think he knew something dodgy was going to be happening this year. He already caught me sneaking around once before. If he's checking in on me tonight, he's sure to see all of us gathered out here on the pitch. If we hop on our brooms, we can make a formation of letters and words that he's sure to be able to read on the Marauder's map. Wow, Zane said appreciatively. That's zombie caliber thinking. Nice one. You really think it'll work? If Dad's watching, James shrugged. He couldn't possibly miss it. Longbottom studied James's face for a long moment. Finally, he nodded curtly. We have to be quick. Get everyone together. Before I explain, I'll allow anyone who doesn't want to be involved the freedom to leave. If just one person tells, though, James, it's all over. Not just for you but for me as well. We must both be willing to take that risk. James blew out a harsh breath. It's our best chance, I think. Besides, you're the unofficial founder of Night Quidditch. I think the League will go along if you lead the way. That's what I'm afraid of, Longbottom muttered darkly. Very well, then. Let's get on with this. It took rather longer than expected. Fortunately, not a single one of the Night Quidditch players elected to leave, despite the dangers. With so many people on brooms, however, it was especially difficult to arrange into the necessary formations. James and Professor Longbottom oversaw the process, taking turns viewing the arrangement from high above, calling down instructions as necessary. The G is drifting, James called down, cupping his hands to his mouth against the cold wind. Fira, just stay next to the far ring. That's your anchor. Everyone else, keep a tight formation. No more than arm's length from each other. This is harder than it looks, Albus called up. You try hovering between two people in a bloody hurricane without crashing into each other. Turn your broom into the wind, 
Willow instructed. First rule of advanced flight. There's no spell to combat wind shear. I'll combat whatever I want, Albus muttered loudly. Are we almost done? What are we spelling, anyway? Nearly there, Professor Longbottom announced. He broke away from the formation and swooped up alongside James. Together they peered down at the undulating moonlit formation of broom riders. Griff flew 12 a.m., James read aloud. Do you think Dad will understand? Longbottom nodded. If he's seeing it, he'll get it. Gryffindor flew tomorrow midnight. If you don't mind, James, I'd like to be there myself, and perhaps a few others. I'll spread the word. There will certainly be a few more people interested in speaking to your father, however briefly. James glanced at the professor, realizing again the gravity of their situation. Uh, yeah, whatever you say, professor. From below, Herman Potsdam called. How long do we need to hold this up? It's a lot less fun up here when I can't wallop bludgers at Albus's head. It's been nearly five minutes since the message was readable, James nodded. If Dad didn't see us getting into position, then waiting around probably won't make any difference. Here's hoping, Longbottom sighed harshly, and then called down. Well done, everyone! Carefully break formation, spread out, and make your way back down to the pitch. Like dandelion seeds, the formation broke apart and drifted into meaninglessness. One by one, the night Quidditch players dipped towards the frosty grass. James followed, landing on the centre line next to Professor Longbottom. What do you say, Professor? Albus grinned, his cheeks red and his eyes sparkling in the moonlight. Since we're all out here anyway, how about a quick match? Yeah, a scattering of voices chimed in. Longbottom shook his head. Don't be ridiculous, he said with obvious reluctance. There's no time, and besides... There's no more somnambulist potion. You all need to get back to your beds. His instructions were drowned out by increasingly enthusiastic appeals as more players gathered round. Beetlebrick was wide-eyed with inspiration. We can set a target score. One hundred points. First team to get their wins. No snitch. We'd be done in less than an hour. No snitch, Albus interrupted stridently. That's not Quidditch, you heretic. Zane piped up. We could feel full teams with this many people. Forget houses for the night. Just random squads for the fun of it. After all, the league's been shut down. Think of it as an exposition match. Enough, Longbottom announced firmly, raising his hands. Quiet down now, all of you. He stopped, waiting, as the gathering reluctantly fell silent. He looked around at them all, his eyes hard beneath his cowl. Finally, he drew a deep breath and shook his head. Seventy-five points, he allowed. Snitch wins the whole match, because Albus is right, there's no Quidditch without the Golden Snitch. A rough, barely restrained cheer arose from the players, who immediately began to break up into swiftly arranged teams. This is totally daft, Longbottom muttered under his breath, but James heard the smile in his voice. The professor produced his wand from the depths of his robe and pointed it at the Quidditch trunk. A bolt of yellow unlocked the trunk and it sprang open, revealing the restlessly glowing balls inside. Listen close now, Longbottom announced, turning back to the players. Seriously, this is it. After tonight... Behind him, the Quidditch trunk slammed closed with a loud clunk. James jumped and turned towards the trunk. An old boot was planted in the centre of the lid, holding it closed. With a swish and a flourish of fabric, the boot suddenly became the bony figure of Argus Filch, his foot pressed firmly on the Quidditch trunk, the invisibility cloak fluttering in his outstretched hand. He raised his cane slowly, menacingly in the other. Indeed, Professor, he growled triumphantly. This is very much it. For one long, awkward moment, Professor Longbottom merely stared at Filch, his face unreadable. Finally, he pushed the cowl back from his head and stepped forward. Thank you, Mr. Filch, he said brightly. As you can see, I have arranged this little midnight outing. Herbology club, you see. Midnight blossoms and the like. Your vigilance is appreciated, but unnecessary. I will escort the students back to the castle now that we are finished. Oh, I don't think so, Professor. Filch breathed slowly, his grin growing even more toothy the cane unwavering in his upraised hand. If you'll just hand me your wand, we can avoid any unpleasantness. 
James felt a chill shake him to his heels. Filch had never once in his experience defied a teacher. Argus, Longbottom said calmly, I would hate for you to do anything you'd regret later. Sure wand, Mr. Longbottom, Filch demanded in a louder voice, taking a step towards the professor. And it is you who might be regretting things right about now, if you please. He held out a horny hand, palm up. I would do as he says, a thin voice instructed from the darkness. James's heart lurched into his throat as he turned, straining to see past the gloom of the grandstands. A tall figure stood there, watching. Rector Grudge, his face hidden in impenetrable shadow. I have some very serious questions for you, Mr. Longbottom. Come along to my office. Perhaps we can sort this out swiftly. Perhaps it is an easily explained misunderstanding. Longbottom glanced around at the stunned students clustered behind him, his face resigned. I'll take full responsibility, he stated. Go with Mr. Filch, back to your dormitories. There will be no detentions tonight. That's right, Filch agreed viciously, taking the professor's wand from him. Teachers don't get detentions after all. Oh no, not by a long sight. Wind moaned through the grandstands, creaking in their dark heights. The sound mingled eerily with Filch's monotonous, wheezy laugh. Chapter 9 The Midnight Assembly It was the very pit of night when James woke up. All around, the castle was as still as a tomb. The dormitory stove had burned low, leaving the air so cold that James could see his breath rising above his bed. If he stayed awake much longer, he could watch one of the Hogwarts house-elves appear to stoke the stove back to life before dawn, silent and secretive, employing its own unique magic. James didn't know why he was suddenly awake, but he wished he wasn't. Stormy thoughts circled his head, swooping in to land as he rose to full consciousness. Professor Longbottom, captured by Filch and Grudge, the uncertain message to his father, the eerily familiar Avior Dorchaskathan, the malevolent Lady of the Lake and Petra's dream story, the Collector, the Morrigan Web. A low scraping sound came from the stairs. James's ears perked up, and he turned his head to look. The sound had been tiny, subtle, and yet— Against the dead silence of the castle, it had been as clear as a knocking footstep. He squinted into the darkness of the spiral staircase and strained his ears. James? a voice whispered in his ear. He jumped, flailed in bed, and fell to the floor with a thump, taking the blankets with him. He scrambled to his knees and peered over the bed, eyes bulging. Nastasha knelt on the other side. She looked at him with glassy, serious eyes. You! James breathed, trying to calm his pounding heart. How did you— Can we go down to your common room? She whispered earnestly. James nodded weakly. Fine. I'm awake anyway. Wait here for a minute, she said, her eyes still locked on his. Then come down and meet me. Don't watch, okay? James frowned in tired annoyance. You sneak into my dormitory and tell me not to watch? I already know you can change into a snake. That's it, isn't it? Just, she said in a small voice, just don't watch. Promise me. I know you can keep your promises, so do it. He shook his head impatiently. Fine, I promise. Slither away. He closed his eyes and leaned on his bed. Across from him a shuffle sounded, and then a dry scrape like fine chainmail dragged on stone. In her snaky form, Nastasha was, in fact, remarkably quiet. The next time he heard her, she was on the stairs, descending in faint, sweeping slithers. James counted to thirty, tired to the bone, but almost preternaturally awake. Then, with a sigh, he stood, scooped his robe from the hook on his bedpost, and shrugged into it as he crept down the stairs. Nastasha was seated in the darkness by a window, barely a girl-shaped silhouette against the gloom. James joined her, plopping onto the chair across from her. He waited for her to begin. "'You kept your promise,' she said. "'That's what promises are for,' he commented curtly. 
otherwise they're just lies. Nastasha laughed darkly, weakly. Sometimes it isn't that simple. James was in no mood for riddles. So you can turn into a snake, he stated bluntly. A thought struck him, and he slapped himself on the thigh. I guessed that, he rasped suddenly, back on the first night when you snuck in. I knew there was something you weren't telling us. The cabinets were closed for human use, but somehow you got through. I told Scorpius and Rose and Ralph that you had to be an animagus or something. It was the only way. Wait until I tell them that. He stopped himself, frowned again, and then flopped back into his chair. Right, I can't. I'm not exactly an animagus, Nastasha muttered, turning her chin towards the dark window. I may only be a fourth-year wizard, James replied, but I know what it's called when a witch can turn herself into a snake. It's called animagus. Get it? Animal and magic? Is your pal Ted Lupin an animagus? she asked suddenly, glancing back at him. James narrowed his eyes. What do you know about Ted? I know what Zane told me. He said that Ted Lupin attacked Ralph once in the form of a wolf. But Ted's not a werewolf, so is he an animagus? Zane talks a lot, doesn't he? James sighed. But no, I don't think so. Petra said that Ted changes sometimes because of a weird combination of his werewolf dad and his metamorph magus mum. It's complicated. So are you telling me you've got a dad who's a... what? A weir snake? Nastasha looked away again and drew a long, deep breath, shaking as she let it out. Don't be stupid. James waited, but Nastasha didn't go on. So tell, he prodded, trying not to sound impatient, which he was. You promised to tell me everything if I kept your secret. It's not that easy, she whispered harshly, angrily. I've only ever told one person before. It's hard to break the seal on a secret like that. Give me a minute. Fine. James crossed his arms and slumped into his seat. So were you there tonight, by the way? I didn't see you. I was there, she replied sullenly. James nodded. Must make it easy to sneak around that way, slithering through the grass unseen, slithering up through the enchanted dormitory stairs without tripping the alarm hex, sliding around through pipes and drains. Nastasha was quiet. James tried a different approach. So... How long have you been able to turn into a snake? I don't turn into a snake, she hissed suddenly, turning back to him. I... James shrugged. You what? She sighed again, briskly, as if frustrated. It's not... She began, gesturing vaguely with both hands. I'm not what most people would think of as normal. She dropped her hands under her lap and glared at James, her face tense, as if she wanted to make a joke of it and was struggling desperately not to. Her hands scrabbled over each other restlessly, like wrestling spiders. Finally, she dropped her eyes. Right, James said slowly. I think I probably could have told you that. Mother Newt helps me, Nastasha went on quietly, staring down at her hands. She's the only person who knows about it, and she explained it all to me. The Muggles have something sort of like it. They call it Dissociative Identity Disorder. I memorized that. I like the sound of it. The witch version is really rare. It has a name I can barely pronounce. James shook its head slowly. I'm a bit lost here, Nastasha. She looked up at him again. I have a fractured personality. She smiled weakly. Two of them, actually. Two versions of me, both totally different both living in the same mind. There's Nasty, the mean one, and there's Asha, the nice one. That's simplifying things quite a bit, actually, but you get the point. I can't control which one appears at any time. That's pretty crazy, I suppose, isn't it? Actually, James replied seriously, that sort of explains quite a lot. Don't make fun of me, she said, dropping her eyes again. I'm not, really. I just... He shrugged. It sort of doesn't come as a great surprise. It sort of helps. Nastasha sighed again, shuddering. In the muggle world, they have medicines for people with more than one personality. In the magical world, they have other methods. Mother Newt, she taught me that what I have, it doesn't have to be a curse. She said that it's lots different for witches than it is for muggles. I can train both halves of my personality to work together, like partners, if... 
they have the same ends in mind. The trick, she said, is to have very clearly defined goals, to, to make sure both of my versions work towards the same things. James was morbidly fascinated. How do you do that? Ah, Nastasha said with a smile, glancing up at him. That's between me and Mother Newt. There was a flicker in Nastasha's gaze, a mischievous glint, and James wondered if he was seeing a glimmer of her other personality. Nasty. It chilled him slightly. So, the snake thing? The glint in Nastasha's eyes became a hard glare, burning in the darkness. Then, with a seeming force of will, she blinked it away. Mother Newt says there are words for that, too. If you ask the healers of the medical college, they call it a transmorphic event. Mother Newt calls it something else. She calls it a magical release valve. James cocked his head. A way to relieve pressure. She nodded. It started when I was three or four years old. Normally it takes years to learn the art of the Animagus, but under certain conditions, when a witch or wizard's brain experiences extreme stress from within, it can happen spontaneously, as a sort of escape. When both sides of my personality, Nasty and Asha, went to war against each other, my mind couldn't handle the strain, so it just changed me. I see, James said slowly. As a snake, things are much simpler, I suppose. A bit more, uh, single-minded, right? Nastasha shrugged and looked away. Something like that. So when the Lady of the Lake attacked Lily, James said, narrowing his eyes, you saw what was happening, and you were at war with yourself? Nastasha still did not meet James's eyes. I've learned to control it, she answered duly. As the years went by, I began to understand the mental muscles that made the change happen— now I can do it whenever I want to. It's a pretty useful skill. Sometimes, like you say, it's handy to be able to turn into something else. So you fought the Lady of the Lake and saved Lily's life, James nodded. I haven't thanked you for that. She laughed darkly. I'm not sure it was this Lady of the Lake you're always talking about. It doesn't matter. But don't thank me. Don't ever thank me. Why not? She looked at him sharply, piercingly. Suddenly, she slid off her chair and knelt in front of James, leaning close over the arm of his chair. You can't trust me, James, she said in a hard whisper. Don't you see? The parts of me, they don't always agree. I try to make Nasty and Asher work together. I really do. But I can't always make both sides of me want the same things. I don't always know what it is that I'm up to, and I don't. I can't trust that it's always good. She stopped suddenly, her face pinched into a frown of concentration. Did I... did I tell you I would come along with you to talk to Professor Avior at Durmstrang? James studied her face incredulously. Well, yes, of course you did. You don't remember? Her eyes drifted away slowly, lost in thought. Yes, she said vaguely. Yes, I guess I do. There was a long pause. Finally, Nastasha shook her head wearily. Just be careful when you're with me, James. I'll try to control it. I have ways. The snake, James nodded. Yes, she said, almost dismissively, her eyes growing glassy again. Distant. But not just that. There's something else, something I have to concentrate on, something that keeps all of me working towards the same thing. James suddenly felt very sad for Nastasha. For the first time, he saw her not as a capricious, manipulative pixie, but as a tortured girl with a weighty secret, struggling to keep herself and everyone around her safe from her own nightmares. In some ways, she was very similar to Petra. He touched her lightly on the shoulder. It can't be that bad, he said. What is it you concentrate on? Nastasha looked into his eyes again, gravely and intently. The thing both parts of me have agreed on since the beginning of this school year, she answered softly. And then she kissed him. It was quick, darting, and over before he even realized it was happening. His heart crammed up into his throat, and his face heated, reddening his cheeks. Good night, James, Nastasha said, her lips still only inches from his. Close your eyes again, all right? 
You're mental, he whispered faintly. A smile twitched at the corners of Nastasha's mouth. That's what I've been trying to tell you. James shook his head, his heart still pounding in his throat, his cheeks still burning. He closed his eyes. Nastasha shrank away with a dull, complicated thump. He heard the soft rasp of her slithering as she moved away across the rugs of the common room floor, beneath the sofas and chairs. Seconds later, there was only silence. He opened his eyes. His head was spinning, as were his emotions. He barely knew how he felt. He only knew one thing with certainty. Nastasha's visit certainly had not made things any simpler. Run, students! It's called tag rugby! Not tag standing around wheezing like old women! The iron voice of Tabitha Corsica in her York teacher guise rang out over the muddy field with the assistance of an electric bullhorn. She's enjoying this way too much, Ralph panted, hands on his knees, mud staining his St. Brutus's t-shirt all the way to the chest. Graham nodded weakly. It's state-sanctioned torture, I tell you. James looked up to see a herd of students galloping towards them in pursuit of a terrified-looking Kevin Murdoch who held the ball in front of him like a bomb. The mob bowled over James, Graham, and Ralph, capturing them in a melee of bashing shoulders, muddy knees, and sharp elbows. James fell, tripped a particularly beefy York student, and felt two more stampede across his back, their large, gratefully mud-caked cleats driving him into the mushy grass. A second later, the entire scrum collapsed onto Murdoch, burying him in a massive grunting tackle. Remember, students, Corsica called, the bullhorn turning her voice into an electric squawk. This is tag rugby, but I do commend your enthusiasm. Carry on. We've twenty-five minutes before cool-down calisthenics. You won't believe what I just heard, Graham moaned, limping back towards James and Ralph as the rugby scrum boiled away towards the far goal. Don't tell me this is a double period, and she's going to make us run laps after this, Ralph begged, wide-eyed. Worse, Graham spat. Corsica's gonna be doing double teacher duty, filling in part-time at another school with an unexpected vacancy. Just heard the captain of the York squad talking about it. Corsica told him about it this morning, and they're all broken up about it. They totally love her. That's impossible, James shook his head. Who cares, Ralph interjected, digging a dollop of mud out of his ear. They were laughing about the name of the teacher she's filling in for. Graham added pointedly. A real gutbuster, they said. The teacher she's replacing is some barmy duffer named Longbottom. James startled so hard that he slipped on the mud and nearly toppled back onto the wet grass. Longbottom, are you sure? Graham rolled his eyes. Pretty hard to get that name wrong, isn't it? Corsica told him he taught at some yokel private school up north. Can you believe it? James shook his head slowly in wonder. Grudge replaced Professor Longbottom already. He got the ministry to reassign Corsica to his post. He probably asked for her specifically, Ralph said dourly. She'd be just his sort. No wonder she's in such a good mood, Graham sighed. Ralph shook his head, flinging muddy water from his hair. I wonder where Professor Longbottom is now. James frowned worriedly, probably cooling his heels in some ministry detention centre along with Professor Revalvier. Maybe Dad knows about it. If we have a chance, we'll ask him tonight. A rumbling of the ground announced the return of the rugby scrum. James braced himself as the mob swept over him again, sweeping the three boys along like a sweaty, mud-spattered snowball. From the sideline, Corsica grinned from her false, middle-aged face, her oversized glasses glinting white with the reflection of the cloudy sky. James spent the rest of the day distracted by thoughts of the previous night, as well as hopes for the night to come. He hoped that his dad had got their message and would be able to get through via the Gryffindor common room flu. Further, he was worried that Filch would announce some draconian late-night detention for all members of the Night Quidditch League, possibly interfering with the arranged midnight meeting with his father. As evening descended, however, no word came down about any punishment at all. Perhaps Grudge is just content to have nailed Longbottom, Rose whispered at dinner. More likely Longbottom took responsibility for the whole thing, James muttered. The worst part is, it's all my fault. It was my idea and I talked him into it. 
Scorpius nodded loftily. That's true. Quiet, Scorpius, Rhodes chided. The professor never would have gone along with it if he hadn't agreed it was a good idea. There's no point blaming yourself, James. As they spoke in hushed whispers, Albus approached from the direction of the Slytherin table, walking with almost absurd, forced casualness, hands clasped behind his back, whistling loudly. He slid an eye towards James and ducked towards him, cramming between Lily and Ralph. So how are we going to get in tonight, eh? he asked quietly. You gonna meet us outside the portrait hall, or do you trust me, your own brother, enough to just give me the password? Tonight? James blinked at his brother. You don't mean... Indeed I do, Albus nodded vigorously. Beetlebrick, Fira, and the rest of Slytherin Night Quidditch. We all risked our necks to help send that message last night. We deserve to be there when Dad calls just as much as you do. That's rich, Scorpius muttered. If you think we're going to let you winkle your way into the Gryffindor common room, you're even more daft than I thought. Albus's face darkened. You watch yourself, Malfoy. I still haven't forgotten our first train ride together, or what happened on the day of Grandad's funeral. Somebody owes you a good thrashing. You're still jealous that the sorting hat sent me to dear old Dad's house, and you got tossed to the snakes, Scorpius grinned humorlessly. Isn't that right, Asp? Stuff a sock in it, both of you. Lily exclaimed, pushing the boys apart. Watcher, Kendra Corner whispered suddenly, sticking her head between James and Ralph. What time tonight? Midnight on the dot. Me and the other Hufflepuffs were thinking we'd skive out of Astronomy Club early and be there at half past eleven. What do you see? James boggled at her in horror. I say this is getting silly, Rose said with a brisk sigh. Look, Kendra, we can't have two dozen people sneaking into the Gryffindor common room at midnight tonight. Albus leaned over the table intently. You can't just freeze all the rest of us out. We totally helped. You Gryffindors are always trying to take all the credit. Kendra nodded. It's not a bit fair, James. You have to let at least me and Albus in. Budge up, Malfoy, Herman Potsdam suddenly announced, forcing his considerable frame between Scorpius and Lily. He glanced seriously around the table. This is about tonight, right? What time are we meeting? James threw up his hands in exasperation. All of you are going to ruin everything. You know that, right? Ralph shrugged. They did help, James, he said. It's only fair that you let them be in on the conversation. I don't even know that Dad got the message, James hissed. This could all be for nothing. We should probably tell a teacher or two, Albus suggested, ignoring James. I heard Professor Longbottom say last night that McGonagall and Flitwick are in on the anti-grudge rebellion. Shh, James hushed suddenly. He glanced quickly towards the head table, expecting to see Grudge watching. Instead, fortunately, the headmaster seemed to be virtually asleep, his fingers steepled, his eyes closed serenely. James heaved a brief sigh of relief. We can't just go around talking to teachers about this, he went on in a lower voice. Professor Longbottom said that Grudge has ears everywhere, possibly even in teachers' rooms. If word gets out, we'll get shut down for sure. Rose frowned. How would Grudge be able to hear what people are saying in their rooms? Ralph screwed up his face in thought. Extendable ears, perhaps, he suggested. Remember those ones that Ted Lupin had last year? The ones that didn't even have to be connected to the source? Scorpius shook his head. Many competent wizard knows how to find stuff like that. If there was some magical receiver in their quarters, a simple Revelio spell would show it. Either way... James interjected, trying to keep the conversation on point. We can't tell any other teachers, even if we know they're on our side. Not unless we know there's no way Grudge is listening. Fine, Albus agreed, but you need to at least allow us three to be there. It's only fair. He glanced from Kendra to Herman Potsdam, both of whom nodded firmly. James deflated. All right, all right. Be outside the common room door at five before midnight. Someone will let you in, assuming... He added, bolting upright again, there are no Gryffindors still in the common room who don't know what's going on, and that you don't get rounded up by filch on the way. Remember, he's got the invisibility cloak now. If you get caught, don't say a word about this. Oh, Albus blinked in mock confusion. I assumed you'd want us to invite Filcher along, perhaps draw him in a custom invitation checkbox for whether Mrs. Norris will be attending as well. Scorpius smiled wryly at this turning partly away so Albus wouldn't see. Joke all you want, Rose said. Just don't get caught. And bring Ralph, too. He was there in New Amsterdam with us. His input will probably come in handy. 
Ralph perked up to protest, then sank back, apparently realising it would be useless. Score for Slytherin, Albus chirped happily, clapping Ralph on the shoulder. Scorpius flapped a hand at the newcomers. All of you clear off to your tables. Grudge will smell conspiracy if you hang about here. That's true, Herman nodded. Last time a Hufflepuff sat with you at Gryffindor's was— He frowned in deep thought. Actually, I don't think there was a last time. Albus saluted briskly. See you tonight, James. Don't keep us waiting. Come on, Ralph. One by one, the non-Gryffindors retreated to their own tables. Well then, Scorpius proclaimed cheerily, grabbing a cupcake from the dessert platter. Looks like we're going to be having quite a little party. James buried his face in his crossed arms. At five minutes past midnight that night, James found himself on the sofa before the Gryffindor fireplace, crammed between Rose and Albus in the centre of a bubble of uncomfortable silence. You forgot, apparently, Rose hissed at him, that tonight was a Friday. No school tomorrow means loads of people are staying up for no particular reason. James didn't reply. There was no point. Behind them, the common room was indeed a hive of late-night activity, crowded with knots of babbling students, a wizard wireless tuned in to a distant Weird Sisters reunion concert, and at least one raucous Winkles and Augers game. In the midst of this, as conspicuous as a third thumb, sat the gathering of Albus, Ralph, Kendra Corner, and Herman Potsdam, all hunched around the hearth with James, Rose, Lily, and Scorpius. Do you mind? Albus perked up suddenly, scolding Cameron Creevy as he crept curiously around the arm of the sofa. We're having a study group. No interruptions. Albus, Rose muttered out of the corner of her mouth, you're drawing more attention than you're sending away. It's bad enough having people from every house here for no apparent reason. Albus went on, undeterred, as Cameron rejoined his friends at a nearby table. We're practicing advanced telepathy. Dangerous stuff if you don't know how to do it. If you get within ten feet, it'll permanently scramble your brain. Seriously, you've been warned. Herman stirred uncomfortably. It's nearly ten past. Where is he? We don't even know he got the message, Ralph commented. This could all be for nothing. James crossed his arms stubbornly. Give it a few more minutes. Dad just had to have been watching the map. He couldn't have missed us all out there on the pitch. Maybe he was working last night, Albus shrugged, growing bored. Sometimes he has to, you know. Aura stuff. Happens around the clock. Not lately, Lily commented. Titus Hardcastle has been handing a lot of the late-night raids and stuff. After all, he doesn't have a family or anything. Titus is ten kinds of cool, Albus nodded enthusiastically, turning to Herman and Kendra. Tough as dragon claws and serious as a curse. He once faced a horde of Inferi with nothing but a broken wand and a tea kettle. That's ridiculous, Herman shook his head. How'd he beat them? Albus gave a sideways grin. Let's just say nobody ever brewed tea in that tea kettle again. He tapped his nose wisely, then added, On account it was so dented and bloody from all those bashed Inferi heads, knocked a few of them clean off. Ugh! Kendra rolled her eyes. Lily poked Albus in the ribs with her elbow. That's totally made up. Not at all, Albus protested. Titus told me himself. He even kept one of the Inferi heads, stores it in a little trunk in his bedroom, and makes it sing Scottish lullabies to him on nights he can't get to sleep. If it's not true, Scorpius mused, it sure should be. Look, Ralph pointed suddenly at the hearth. Somebody's coming through. Sure enough, the coals of the fireplace were shifting and rearranging. Sparks crackled as a shape began to emerge. As one, the students scrambled from the couch and chairs, gathering around the fire in a nervous huddle. A face emerged from the coals and grinned up at them. Well, this is quite the little party, isn't it? That's what I said, Scorpius agreed, glancing aside at James. Uncle Ron? James said. Dad? Rose cried, delighted. We weren't expecting to see you. I wasn't expecting to be seen, Ron shrugged. Got a last-minute message from Harry that you lot were keen to talk. Said something about a message you sent through the Marauders map. I didn't even know that was possible. Uncle Ron, James asked seriously, shouldering his way forward. Where's my dad? Why didn't he contact us himself? What? Your old Uncle Ron not good enough for you? Ron asked, feigning offence. Dad, Rose chided. This is serious. We have loads of important stuff to tell you. Ron nodded. Okay. Seriously, then. To James, he said, 
Your dad's been sent off on some international diplomatic hoo-ha, standing guard and looking official, while a group of ambassadors sign this and shake hands about that. He's been assigned to loads of those sort of jobs lately, leaving Titus to manage the day-to-day -day operations. What? Albus exclaimed. Still? But Dad's head aura. He's the one that should be sending others off onto those sorts of busy jobs. Believe me, Ron concurred. It's no fun for any of us. Titus isn't exactly a bundle of tickles, even when he's not in charge of the office. The minister himself has been requesting Harry personally, though. Not every nation has a Harry Potter to trot out, scar and all. Dad, Rose interrupted, leaning close to the fire. Filch has gone off the deep end. The new headmaster has given him all sorts of authority and the magical powers to back it up. And they shut down the post, Lily added. We can't send anything anywhere without it being read by Grudge first. And Uncle Ron, James said earnestly, lowering his voice to a near whisper. We went to New Amsterdam. It was by accident. But when we were there, we ran into this really creepy wizard who calls himself the Collector. He enslaved a bunch of muggles and forced them to help make some horrible magical weapon. And he's not alone. We think he's working with that escaped prisoner, Warlick, and maybe even... Uh... He stopped himself, remembering that his uncle, like most people, didn't exactly believe in the Lady of the Lake. We saw Victor Crumb, Ralph chimed in. He can back up what we say. He and the Arias battled the monsters that that collector bloke sent after us. Wendigos, Rose clarified enthusiastically. Vicious old Native American monsters. They were awful. Whoa, 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 Ron said, shaking his head and squeezing his eyes shut. This is a load of stuff, and I'm just trying to keep up. You say Filch is using magic? James took a deep breath, glancing around at the others. More slowly this time, they took turns explaining everything that had been happening at the school, including Lily's and Scorpius's punishment and Professor Longbottom's dismissal. Ron listened intently, his expression growing increasingly grave. When they were finished, he said, Security has been clamped down everywhere, but this is taking things quite a bit too far. No one has any excuse to be screening the post, and your dad will be extremely unhappy that his cloak ended up in the hands of Filch. I'd be expecting a strongly worded communique about that if I was Mr. Grudge. But, Dad, Rose pressed, what about what we saw in New Amsterdam? Like Ralph said, Victor Crumb can back us up on this. He interviewed one of the muggles that the Collector had enslaved. She's the one that told us about the Morrigan Web. Ron shook his head dourly. We'll check in with Victor, believe me, but the Morrigan Web... That's just a myth, a scary tale to frighten children. It's not a real thing. I've done research, Dad, Rose interjected pointedly. You and your mum, Ron exclaimed in exasperation, although James felt sure there was a note of pride in his uncle's voice. All right, so what did you find out? Rose explained her discovery of the historical Alma Alaron professor, Principia Lausa, and her discovery of the mythical Morrigan Webb. Apparently there's a witch that lies in the bowels of Alma Alaron's administration hall named Crone Lauser. She might be related to the original Professor Lauser and have some information about what the Morrigan Web does and how it might work. Ron was already shaking his head. You lot are totally incorrigible, you know that. He sighed to himself. Now I know how Mum must have felt when Harry, Hermione and I were kids. Blimey, it's hard work being the responsible one. But Uncle Ron, James insisted. Zane's already figured a way for us to get down into the basements of Alma Alaron to find Crone Lauser, if she really exists. If this Collector Wizard really is planning to set off some magical superweapon, then your dad and Titus Hardcastle and the rest of us will stop him, Ron interrupted. Really? What do you lot think you're going to do that loads of grown and trained auras and harriers can't? So, Ralph said slowly, does that mean you believe us? Ron turned to look at Ralph from the coals of the fireplace. Is that what this is about? You think us grown-up types don't trust you because you're just a lot of kids? Ralph shrugged and glanced around at the others. Well, it crossed our minds, I guess. Look, Ron said, lowering his voice and looking at each face in turn. Remember just who you're talking to here, eh? I ain't so old that I've forgotten what it's like to be on that side of the flu. We know there are some serious sketchy things going on at Hogwarts, as well as in the Ministry proper. Frankly, there are some bloody good reasons why security has been cranked up as high as it has. Ever since that whole mess in New Amsterdam, the vow of secrecy has started falling apart all over the place. 
Why do you think there have been all these annoying diplomatic missions all over the world for your dad to attend? He asked, looking at James, Albus and Lily. Muggle governments are catching wind of our existence. Difficult questions are being asked. Slipshod temporary treaties are being signed. Worse, Ron paused, looking earnestly around at the gathered students, as if unsure whether to go on. He lowered his voice again so that it was barely above a whisper. Worse? There are reports that muggle governments are already being infiltrated by dark witches and wizards looking to gain the upper hand wherever they can. The ones that use imperious curses and polyjuice potions, they're the easiest to find. Potions leave a trail of evidence, and curses can be sensed by competent auras like us. But some of these wizards are really cunning, leaving no trail whatsoever. If they get a foothold in a major muggle government, well, there's no telling the disasters they could wreak. James looked askance at Rose and Scorpius, his face pale. That's why we need to find out everything we can about the Morrigan Web, he whispered, turning back to his uncle. It might be part of just that sort of plan. We'll look into it, James, Ron nodded. Trust me, you lot have already done your part. If there's anything to be concerned about, we'll uncover it. It's our jobs, after all. But, Rose said, no buts, her father exclaimed, overriding her. Your job? is to lay low, keep a watch on the goings-on there at school, and report back to us when you can. We'll discuss it soon, over the holidays. For now, maintain a low profile, stick to your studies, and stay out of Filch's way. Albus nodded. I'll definitely put that one on my to-do list. Don't be glib, Albus, Ron said seriously. And who the bloody hell are all these other people? Herman Potsdam, sir, Herman announced. Ravenclaw, a pleasure to meet you. I've read all about you. Kendra turned towards him. You've read those stories? I don't believe it. They helped us send the message to Dad, James explained with a sigh. They're safe. Ron considered this and seemed to accept it. All right, then. To bed with all of you. And remember what I said. I'm not brushing you off, and you have an important role to play. But let us do our part, and we can all work together. Understood? James nodded tiredly. The others joined in. Good, then. Ron smiled. Everyone else sends their greetings. And Rose, Hugo wanted you to know that he's taken over your room completely for his pet garden gnomes, and there's nothing you can do about it. His words, not mine. Rose looked mortified. Dad? We'll see most of you come Christmas, which will be here before you know it. Remember what I said? We will, the students agreed unenthusiastically. A moment later, the calls of the hearth crackled into senselessness. Ron had gone. Well, Albus said with a shrug, that was fun, I guess. Come on, Ralph, let's get back to the dungeons. Fira, Beetlebrick and the rest will want an update, for whatever it's worth. As they all clambered to their feet, Kendra caught James's eye. So that story about you lot going to New Amsterdam and running into some vicious wizard, that wasn't just a ruse to cover up for you missing Quidditch tryouts? It wasn't just that, Scorpius answered, but it did provide James with a convenient excuse. Herman tilted his head sceptically. The Morrigan Web, hey? This collector person is probably as loony as a lobelag. Your uncle's right, it's probably nothing. Those Wendigos weren't nothing, Rose said with a shudder. Albus shrugged. If you ask me, this whole thing was a bust. I don't see why we had to go to so much trouble just to have a chinwag with Uncle Ron. It was supposed to be Dad, James insisted. Lily sighed. He would have said the same stuff, most likely. He and Uncle Ron are in the same boat, you know, working at the Department of Auras. But Dad's head aura, James sulked. Uncle Ron is a coordinator. Rose perked up at that. What's that supposed to mean? Are you calling my dad a desk donkey? No, no, Rose, Lily replied quickly. His job's super important, too. My dad couldn't do anything without your dad following all those potion trails, coordinating interviews with shady witches and wizards, tracing Grinkett's transactions, all that sort of thing. Rose sighed weakly. He is a bit of a desk donkey, isn't he? Albus threw an arm around his cousin's shoulders. But he's the best bloody desk donkey there is, and Lily's right. Dad says he couldn't do anything without him. If anything, your dad knows more about what's going on behind the scenes than even my dad does. Well, Kendra commented, if this is a peek into the exciting world of Potter family adventures, I think I'll happily give it a pass from now on. She angled towards the door, shaking her head. Next time, just come and chat with me, Herman agreed. I can tell you the same stuff your uncle said and save us all a cauldron of trouble. 
James plopped back onto the sofa as Herman followed Kendra, Albus, and Ralph out the portrait hole. It clapped shut behind them. What was that all about? an eager voice begged. James glanced aside as Cameron bounced on the sofa next to him. That was Ron Weasley in the hearth, wasn't it? I heard Willow Wisteria talking about the message you sent last night on the Quidditch pitch. That was dead brilliant. So much for nobody talks about night Quidditch, James sighed. Leave it be, Cameron, Scorpius announced warningly. You didn't see anything. Oh, I know, Cameron enthused. You can totally trust me. My lips are sealed. So what did he say? What's going on? Rose shook her head. He said to stick to our studies, let the grown-ups do their jobs and stay out of Filch's way. Oh, Cameron blinked. Well, that's pretty good advice, I guess. A few minutes later, James bid the others good night and climbed wearily to the fourth year's dormitory. It occurred to him that they had not quite mentioned everything to Uncle Ron. He hadn't mentioned the fact that the words, the Morrigan Web, had appeared on Petra's magical parchment, her former dream story, along with a name he did not recognize, Marshal Paris. In fact, he hadn't told anyone about that, since he had promised Petra to keep the dream story a secret. But they had also failed to mention the mysterious Durmstrang Professor Avior and his uncanny resemblance to the deceased Albus Dumbledore. Considering everything else, it was probably the least of their concerns, and yet, as James changed into his pyjamas and settled onto his four-poster, his mind warring sluggishly against the exhaustion of his body, he couldn't help wondering if Professor Avior was not, somehow, the greatest and most important mystery of all. Snatches of remembered voices followed James uneasily into sleep. It would be best, Mr. Potter, Professor Avior's voice instructed calmly, almost kindly, if you did not tell your father about this, Harry might be a bit conflicted. You can't trust me, Nastasha pled in a sort of desperate whisper. Don't you see? The parts of me, they don't always agree. But the voice that chased him into sleep was his own father's from several weeks earlier. It was Petra's son, Petra Morganston. She flickered on and off, and then she was just gone. The final weeks before Christmas holidays unwound like a Weasley's wizard wheezes trick clock, whose hands moved slower with each passing minute. The last week of class at Durmstrang was cancelled due to inclement mountain weather, nine feet of snow and sixteen-inch icicles that grow sideways because of the wind. Kendra regaled them breathlessly, having overheard a conversation between Hagrid and Professor de Bellows. Sideways icicles? Can you imagine? Classes at Beaubaton, on the other hand, had ended a week earlier due to differences in holiday schedules. They take almost a month for Christmas, Graham announced wistfully at dinner one evening. A whole month? And they spend half that time fairy skiing and quaffing spiced dark chocolate in the Alps. That's it. I'm going to see about transferring there full time. James did not at all mind missing his Beaubaton class. He still did not grasp the slightest thing about theoretical arithmetics, with its monstrous abacai and its inexplicable goals, despite the constant smug explanations offered by York's Morton Comstock, who enjoyed an eerie and annoying affinity for it. He was, however, disappointed to be shut off from Durmstrang for the final week. He had finally made up his mind to visit Professor Avior in his offices, as per the professor's suggestion, and was rather nervous about it. Now that he had decided to go through with it, he wanted it to be over as soon as possible, and did not relish worrying about it all through the holiday. To that end, he had once attempted to make the trip through the Durmstrang cabinet on his own, class or no class, despite the warning sign nailed across its top. Waiting until the lazy hours between lunch and dinner, he had stolen up to the baroque Durmstrang cabinet door and unlatched it, only to have it blown wide open in front of him, blasting him with gale-force arctic winds and stinging snow. By the time he wrestled the door closed again, he was caked with nearly an inch of ice crystals, a fan of which covered the floor behind him, spreading up and over the end of the Slytherin table. Nearby, the ghost of the bloody baron shook his head in cruel amusement. Classes became drudging affairs as the windows filled with blinding white snow and crisp frost, begging for snowmen to be made and snowballs to be thrown. The ceiling of the great hall became infused with rolling grey clouds, heavy with yet more snow to come. 
fires were stoked to the maximum, so that the castle was simultaneously bitter cold, whenever one was not within twenty feet of a stove or hearth, and unbearably hot whenever one was. As per tradition, Hagrid felled and erected a monstrous pine tree in the corner of the Great Hall, where it was busily decorated by Professor Flitwick and his first-year charms class. The wild scent of fresh pine needles mingled with the aroma of the warm gingerbread and peppermint cookies that filled most evenings' dessert platters. On the last Wednesday before Christmas, James, Rose, and Ralph were wending their way disconsolately towards the astronomy tower when Albus ran breathlessly up to them, his cheeks burning red in the chilly daylight. "'You'll never guess!' he panted, grinning. "'We're all spending the whole holiday at the burrow. Grandma Weasley and Uncle George and Aunt Angelina and everyone will be there, even Luna Lovegood and that walking stick she married. No Dominique. She's spending the holiday skiing with a load of her Beaubaton friends, but that's no great loss, is it?' Really? Rose chimed excitedly. That's excellent. How did you find out? It's from Mum and Dad, he answered, fumbling a wrinkled letter from his knapsack. Just got it this morning. Told me to spread the word to all of you. Lily and Victoire nearly split in two when I told them. I still need to find Louis, though. If we don't tell him, does that mean he won't be there? Rose asked, narrowing her eyes. Rose! James exclaimed, stifling a laugh. I'm joking, she admitted reluctantly. But if he tries to practice any more of his artist assert on me, I swear I'll fill his presence with slugs. You're invited too, Ralph, Albus added, stuffing the letter back in his knapsack. Your dad will be there. He signed the letter himself, along with my parents and Uncle Ron and Aunt Hermione. I guess they were just trying to get us all in one swoop, what with the hang-ups with the post. Does that mean Grudge read the letter before us? James asked pointedly. Him or Professor Votary, Albus shrugged. I got the letter via Interhouse Post. Beetlebrick delivered it from Grudge's office since he's a prefect, but here's the kicker. We won't be going home on the Hogwarts Express. What? Ralph frowned. Why not? Albus glanced excitedly from face to face. We're travelling by port key. No, Rose breathed. But why? Your mum pulled some strings at the Department of Magical Transportation, Albus said. Figured it would save loads of time trying to coordinate travel for everybody. I guess it's good to have parents that work in high places, eh? So, where's the port key? James asked, a surge of excitement welling in him. Did they send it already? Albus grinned. They totally did. It came with the letter. It's just some ratty old Christmas sweater. I think Grandma Weasley made it for Uncle Ron back when he was still a student here. It won't work until the right time, and it won't work at all here on Hogwarts grounds. We'll have to hitch a ride out to Hogsmeade Station with everyone else and use it there. So, no packing, then, Rose said thoughtfully. We can't carry luggage via port key. I guess our families will bring along whatever we might need, James suggested. They'll be travelling by normal means, probably. Either way, Albus concluded happily, this is going to be bloody brilliant. James overslept the following Saturday morning. He was awakened by a rattling bash at the window next to his bed. Blearily, he blinked into the blinding, snowy glare, and then startled as a shape banged clumsily against it. It was Nobby, unsuccessfully scrabbling for a perch on the icy ledge outside the window. James threw off the covers, already realising what had happened, and cursing himself. "'Sorry, Nobby,' he said, opening the window and letting in the snow-dusted bird and a gust of wintry air. "'I was up too late trying to raise Zane on the shard. I wanted to see if he was going to be at the burrow with us. Sorry you can't come along. Owls can't go by port key.' Nobby fluttered to the bedside table and shook snowflakes from his feathers. Impatiently, he stretched out his foot, revealing the note tied there. James retrieved it hurriedly. Where are you? Hagrid leaves in five minutes. It wasn't signed, but James recognized Rose's handwriting, of course. He tossed the note aside, jammed his legs into a pair of jeans, and squirreled into a sweater as he ran down the spiral staircase. On the last step, however, he remembered Petra's dream story. He was in the habit of carrying it with him everywhere he went, for reasons he did not fully understand, but which felt important nonetheless. He turned on the stairs and bolted back up to the dormitory. Oh, he said, spying Nobby still standing on his bedside table. The bird cocked her head at him sardonically. James shook his head and ran to the window. Off you go. Have a good Christmas. Eat tons of mice and all that. Nobby clucked his beak and almost seemed to roll his great golden eyes. With a clap of his wings, he launched from the table and lofted out the window. 
Jane slammed it shut and shot the bolt. A moment later, he fell to his knees in front of his trunk and began rooting messily through it. His right hand found the lump of Petra's parchment at the same moment that his left hand brushed against an unexpected scratchy shape. He yanked both hands out and examined his left. A faint abrasion formed a white line across the back of his thumb. James frowned at it, then peered into his trunk, looking for the object that had scratched him. A small, dense shape was embedded in the hem of his school robes. James drew them out and pulled the folds apart, revealing the snared object. The yucks of a slackma, he said to himself. He remembered being snagged by the burrs from the magical prophecy plant in Professor Avia's classroom, remembered the professor confiscating them, claiming that Zane had stolen them. One of the burrs, however, had remained embedded in James's robes all this time, just waiting to be found. James thought back to that day tried to remember which prophecy plant the birds had come from. "'The question which most vexes you,' he whispered, his eyes widening as he stared down at the spiny brown burr. Carefully, he extracted the burr from his robes. Glancing into the depths of his trunk again, he found a very old piece of Drubal's best blowing gum. He unwrapped it, popped the rock-hard hunk of gum into his mouth, and then folded the burr into the wrapper. Pocketing both Petra's dream story and the wrapped burr in his jeans, James scrambled to his feet and pelted down the spiral stairs. Hagrid delivered the seven of them to Hogsmeade Station along with the last of the departing Hogwarts students. James jumped down from the huge carriage, joining Albus, Lily, Rose, Ralph, Louis and Victoire on the icy platform. Have a good Christmas now, Hagrid bellowed from the high driver's seat and then leaned aside and winked theatrically at James. James blinked up at him. Er, uh, you as well, Hagrid? Hagrid nodded, his cheeks apple red, and his wild hair matted with flecks of ice. His beetle-black eyes twinkled. I'll see you lot when you get back, then, eh? He winked again twice. Sure thing, Hagrid, Lily replied, furrowing her brow. She glanced aside at James and Rose. Behind them, Louis hugged himself against the cold. Come on, let's go, he said. It's cold as a banshee's bum out here. Such language, Victoire huffed, her words forming white puffs in the air. She adjusted her little fur hat and stuffed her hands into a matching muff. But Louis is right. This cold is no good for our complexions. That's not what I said, Louis protested. Let's get under the awning where there's less snow, Albus said briskly, brandishing a soft package wrapped tightly in paper and twine. The port key will be active at exactly ten o'clock. The troop made their way along the snowy platform as the Hogwarts Express began to chug noisily, belting masses of black smoke into the sky. Its huge crimson wheels spun on their tracks, screeching metal on metal, and then slowed to a laborious crawl, inching the great train out of the station and steadily picking up speed. James watched the windows go by, saw the glimpsed faces of its passengers, his classmates, laughing as they settled into their seats, stuffing their coats and hats onto the overhead racks. Soon enough, the guard's van swept past, dragging a pall of snowflecked air and smoke, and the train was gone, its shrill whistle already echoing from the valley below. "'I hope you've been keeping a close eye on that thing,' Louis commented as Albus laid his parcel out on a bench and untied the twine. No, I lent it out for winkles and augers, Albus replied. I let the rest of the Slytherins use it for target practice in the casting range. What do you think, genius? Well, Louis huffed, it is our only means of getting home now. If the porter's spell has been altered or tampered with in any way, there's no knowing where we'll end up. Victoire shook her head in annoyance. I'm sure Albus has been careful with it. He is not in the habit of allowing important magical tools to fall in the wrong hands. You mean like James here? Louis said pointedly, turning to his sister. We've all heard about how Filch ended up with the invisibility cloak. Real smooth, that one. Belt up, Louis, Lily said mildly, or Rose here will belt it for you. Louis glanced at Rose, who glared at him. He looked back at Victoire for help, but she merely shrugged imperiously. What was up with Hagrid? Ralph asked. He sure was acting weird, wasn't he? He's Hagrid, Victoire sniffed. What is unusual about him acting weird? 
Just then, the bell in the Hogsmeade clock tower began to toll, its echo peeling across the bare trees and snow-encrusted rooftops. That's it! Albus said excitedly, pulling open the wrapping and revealing a neatly folded, if somewhat threadbare, old sweater. It was burgundy, with a large golden letter R knitted in the centre. Albus looked from it to the others gathered around. You've all travelled by Portkeep before, he said as the Hogsmeade bell continued to toll. This is it, then. Everyone grab on and hold tight. He reached forward, as did six other hands. Each grabbed a fistful of the old sweater. An instant later, James felt the familiar, albeit rather unpleasant, sensation of a hook grabbing his middle and tugging him sharply forward. His last thought, as Hogsbeed Station whipped past him and vanished into a speck, was that he had forgotten his glasses and his mum would probably kill him for it. A cold blur blasted over him as he held on tight to the sweater. An instant later, a hard floor materialised beneath him and he stumbled, barely keeping his footing. He let go of the sweater and banged into Victoire, knocking her hat off. Ouch! she scolded shrilly. Watch your gigantic feet! You stamped on my toes! Sorry, Ralph said, still flailing for balance. I'll never get used to that. Albus was still holding on to the sweater in the darkness. James could barely see his brother's face in the gloom as he peered around, his eyes tense. Where are we? Albus asked. This isn't the burrow, is it? I told you, Louis exclaimed, the port key got damaged somehow. Who knows where we ended up? Quiet, Louis, Lily scolded worriedly. It looks like an attic, Rose commented, moving slowly forward. She pushed a mass of draping cloth aside. It fell heavily, throwing up a cloud of dust and revealing a round window, opaque with grime and pale with daylight. It is an attic, James said, joining Rose near the window. But it's not the burrow, that's for sure. He reached towards the window, meaning to rub the grime off and peek out, when a long, juddering creak came out of the darkness behind them. All seven students jumped and gasped, turning towards the sound. There was nothing to be seen but a steeply canted roof on both sides, leading into impenetrable shadows. Then, creakily, footsteps began to approach out of the dark. Once, Victoire whispered sharply. James heard her, sensed her whisking hers out of her muff. He scrambled for his own, as did the others. Slowly they backed away from the darkness as the footsteps grew closer, thumping slowly on the old wooden floor. James felt the cold glass of the window against his back as he bumped against it. He raised his wand shakily in his outstretched fist. Next to him, Ralph's wand vibrated in his hand, its lime-green tip bobbing against the dark. A pair of large, naked feet began to emerge from the shadows, followed by surprisingly short, knobbly legs and a filthy old loincloth. As the figure emerged fully into the light, it peered up at the students, its squinty eyes showing nothing but weary patience. It was holding a platter in its right hand, laden with seven steaming mugs. Mold cider for the young masters and mistresses, it said in a deep, croaking voice. As a sort of reluctant afterthought, it added, And may I be the first to wish them all a happy Christmas. Creature? Lily burst out in relief. Is it really you? James shook his head, caught between barking anger and laughing out loud. But where are we then? Yes, Victoire demanded, jamming her fists onto her hips. This is not the burrow. Humblest apologies, masters and mistresses, Creature grumbled, dipping his head perfunctorily. It was your parents' idea. There will be no Christmas at the burrow this holiday, despite what you and many others have been led to believe. I am afraid you will instead be spending it here, at number twelve Grimald Place. Chapter 10 A Clandestine Christmas I can't believe you forgot your glasses. Ginny Potter shook her head stridently, unpacking her suitcase and separating a pile of clothes for James and Albus. If only you wore them when you're supposed to, you wouldn't go leaving them behind when you travel on holiday. 
I knew you'd blow a cauldron about that, James sighed, standing back as his mother moved about the room, socking folded clothes into dresser drawers and levitating the suitcases onto a high shelf. I woke up late, Mum. I barely had time to get dressed. You're lucky I'm wearing trousers. And yet you somehow managed to remember your wand, his mother commented sharply. She shoved a pile of folded clothes into his arms and turned to Rose, who was watching from the hall with a smug smile on her face. "'Rose, does James wear his glasses to class?' "'It's never happened once,' Rose answered immediately. Ginny turned back and glared at her son. "'She's not even in most of my classes,' James insisted. "'How would she even know?' Albus stepped past Rose and scooped a pile of his own clothes off the bed. "'I don't think he's worn them once since school started,' he commented airily. "'I keep telling him he's supposed to. "'I keep telling him there's no magical cure for poor vision. "'You do not!' James exclaimed furiously. Enough! Ginny shook her head. To James, she said, you wear those glasses when you're supposed to, or I'll tell your father, and he'll permanently hex them to your face. And you, she turned to Albus, don't be a rabble-rouser. The day you give helpful advice is the day I win the Quidditch World Cup. With that, she strode out of the room, James, Rose, and Albus on her heels. So why are we here at Grimmauld Place instead of the burrow, Mum? Albus asked, unperturbed. She sighed. Oh, ask your father, or any of your uncles. This was all their plan. Not that I disagree, she added. It's just that they can explain it better if they choose to explain it at all. Rose glanced at James and Albus, and then turned towards the stairs, taking them two at a time. Albus and James gave chase, pounding down the steps in her wake. Ralph was on the second floor landing with Lily, both peering at the portrait of old Mrs. Black in her curtained alcove. She's restless lately, Lily was saying, not as hateful and filthy as she used to be when she would just scream and curse about half-bloods in her house, but still, ever since the night of the unveiling. James paused on the landing and glanced at Mrs. Black in her frame. Years before, the family had accidentally discovered that the hateful portrait could be mollified with muggle television and had hurried to have one painted right into her canvas. Normally, the chat shows and courtroom dramas kept her in a sort of trance-like fugue. Now, however, she muttered to herself in agitation, occasionally awakening enough to glance out of her frame, recoiling in horror at the sight of those on the landing. Desecration! she hissed her eyes darting from the painted, flickering television to Ralph and Lily. Impure! House of my father's! James looked closer at the television in her painting. On it, a news program warbled away, showing a scene of world leaders gathering at a long table. It was entirely possible, James thought, that his own father had appeared on the news, standing in the background as agreements were signed, shoring up the vow of secrecy with suspicious muggle governments. Perhaps this was what was agitating old Mrs. Black. The wizard and muggle worlds are closer together than they have been in centuries, a man's voice commented from nearby. James turned, as did the others, to see his uncle Percy, his eyes grave as he studied the painted television. While well, Burger Black is not the only person who senses this, we are living in interesting times, children. Hi, Uncle Percy, Lily said, approaching the man and putting her arms around him. Percy hugged her, and then looked around at the others. James thought, and not for the first time, that his uncle had changed quite a lot since the death of his adopted daughter Lucy. His pompousness had been replaced with a sort of dull gravity, a haunted look that was never fully absent from his gaze. "'Molly and your Aunt Audrey and I just arrived. They're still down in the kitchen,' he offered a wan smile. Looks like it will be rather cramped quarters this holiday, doesn't it? It's a good thing we all like each other. Albus shrugged. I wouldn't mind if James had stayed back at Hoggy's. He snores. I do not. James shoved his brother. Your feet stink so bad it's like that time those flobber worms died under your bed. Stop, Lily said soothingly, stepping between her brothers as Percy proceeded up the steps. There's no point in arguing. You're both right. Behind them, Rose trampled down the remaining stairs. I'm going to see what this is all about. Rosie, a man's voice called as she passed the sitting room. Rose grinned and angled through the archway, followed by James and Ralph. Inside, the hearth burned with goblin fire, crackling almost inaudibly and making no smoke whatsoever. Seated around it on a scattering of old, mismatched furniture were three of the Weasley brothers, Ron, Bill and Charlie. 
Luna Lovegood was also there, draped languidly across the lap of her new husband, Rolf Scamander, who sat bolt upright in a tall wing-back chair, his thick glasses magnifying his eyes into an expression of perpetual surprise. Dad! Rose cried, throwing herself onto her father's lap. Uncle Bill! Uncle Charlie! Albus grinned, striding towards the sofa and squeezing between his uncles. You little rogue! Bill smiled, tousling his hair roughly. How are things in the dungeons? You keeping those Slytherin snakes in line? Charlie elbowed Albus affectionately. Heaven knows they need a potter there to remind them of what's what. I'm afraid times have changed, dear uncles, Albus replied mournfully. It's the Gryffindors who are all sneaky and underhanded these days. Why, just a few weeks ago, James nearly got us all thrown out of school for being out after hours, sending illicit messages and what not. We heard about that, Bill said, gesturing towards Ron. That was some brilliant thinking, James. You do the order proud. James smiled at his uncle and felt a blush rise to his cheeks. The order, he asked, raising an eyebrow. Shush, all of you, Luna said, raising her mug. It's Christmas. Let's not speak of such things. For now, at least, Ron agreed. He smiled at Rose, who snuggled on his lap. How was the port key? Fine, she replied. But Grandma Weasley will probably leather you with a hex for using your old sweater. So why are we meeting here instead of the burrow like we were supposed to? Nothing wrong with old Grimmauld Place, Bill answered heartily. I dare say Creature makes it nearly as festive as a chestnut. Why, when we arrived, he had those old house elves' heads singing Christmas carols. No, Albus exclaimed. He's been trying to do that for years, but Mum never allows it. Luna smiled. She's been a bit busy trying to arrange for us all to be here. Still, I do rather like the singing. It's curiously unconventional. Behind her, Rolf nodded meaningfully. James knew why. Few people appreciated or identified with the curiously unconventional as much as Luna Lovegood's commander. Seriously, James said, plopping onto the arm of the sofa next to his Uncle Bill. Why here? You lot sent Albus a letter saying we'd be travelling by Porky to the burrow, and then you brought us all here instead. And now you mentioned the order. Last minute change of plans, Charlie stated, waving a hand in the air. Your dad suggested it a few days ago, and we all love the idea. Enough said, and here we all are. And goblin fire in the hearth, Rose said, perking up on her father's lap and narrowing her eyes. No smoke for the chimney? Extremely dodgy, Albus agreed, turning to look closely at his Uncle Charlie. You're hiding something. What is it? Poppycock, Ron said firmly. Stop being so bloody suspicious, all of you. There are more bedrooms here than there are at the burrow. It's as simple as that. And we've charmed the attic to function as a dormitory for the lot of you. You saw it when he first arrived. If you charmed the attic, Rose said, cocking her head, you don't have much of an idea of what a dormitory is. Bloody hell, Ron muttered, climbing to his feet and depositing his daughter onto the chair behind him. I thought Hermione was doing it, and she likely thought I was doing it. And now she's out helping Ted Lupin get a tree. Seriously, though, she's much better at furniture transfiguration than me. He started for the archway, and then stopped, glancing back sternly. He pointed at the three students one by one. All of you keep your noses to yourselves. There's nothing suspicious going on. He stopped, seeing the look on Rose's face. And I'm totally wasting my breath, aren't I? You've never been able to lie, Dad. Rose shook her head. Sorry, you're just too honest by nature. Leave it to Uncle Charlie. Damn right, Charlie agreed, hoisting a mug of cider. Let them be, Ron. They'll find out soon enough. We bloody would have when we were their age. Ron fumed silently for a moment, and then seemed to resign himself with a shake of his head. Luna's right, he shrugged. It's Christmas. Let's not speak of such things. He sighed deeply and gave a small smile. <sighs> I've got an attic to transfigure. Who wants to help? I'm in, Albus jumped up eagerly. I want quadruple bunks all the way to the ceiling. James, on the very bottom. James? Rosie? Ron prompted. No thanks, James said, getting to his feet. I want to go and say hi to everyone else. Me too, Rose said quickly, joining him. Ron rolled his eyes. You're both as transparent as ghosts. Fine. Go see what secrets you can dig up. I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. In that, it turned out Uncle Ron was quite right. 
Grandma Weasley, to no one's surprise, was in the kitchen, surrounded by brilliant sunbeams from the high windows and the warm scent of baking. Bowls stirred themselves busily on the butcher block, while a huge wooden spoon swiftly dolloped raw cookie dough onto baking pans. Fleur was with her, looking unnecessarily sprightly in an immaculate white apron, her blonde hair pulled back in festively ribboned pigtails. "'Good morning, James, Rose!' Grandma Weasley sang delightedly, dusting her hands on her apron and drawing them into a mutual crushing embrace. "'So good to have you all here. Where are the others?' "'Mostly upstairs,' Rose smiled, squeezing her grandmother as tightly as she could, turning the attic into a hostel. Fleur commented briskly, "'With all the magic they are pouring into this house, it is a wonder it does not grow legs and dump us all straight out onto the street, adding floors, enlarging this, reducing that. It is more than our old house can take.' "'Who's enlarging things and adding rooms and floors?' James asked as casually as he could but his grandmother merely flapped a hand at him. Never you mind that. If you're going to hang about the kitchen, we can use your help, both of you. It's no small task cooking and baking for a family this size, especially with all these extra visitors and unexpected guests. Who's unexpected? Rose pressed. Are there even more people coming? And where's Dad? James added. Don't tell me he's travelling again. These are questions for your uncles. Fleur shook her head hefting the pan of cookies and opening the oven with a flick of her wand. They'll tell you everything you need to know. James rolled his eyes. We've already asked them. They didn't tell us anything. Well, then I guess you don't need to know, do you? Grandma Weasley replied curtly. Now, off with you, or get to work. Which will it be? The answer was obvious. James and Rose darted through the sunlit kitchen and pulled open the cellar door with a creak. They tromped down the wooden stairs into murky darkness. The cellar had once been a ramshackle dining area. Now the ancient table had been replaced with a collection of old sofas and chairs, forming a comfortably shabby common room, all centred round an enormous, rusty stove. To James, the cramped, low room felt rather a lot like the basement game room of his old Alma Aleron residence, Bigfoot House. Voices echoed from near the glowing stove. Grudge has ultimate say when it comes to the faculty, George Weasley was saying darkly. I doubt even Harry can talk the minister out of it. Harry's persistent, a woman's voice answered. Besides, the law is the law. As James and Rose approached, they saw Angelina, George's wife, seated next to him on the couch. She glanced up at them and smiled. Just in time. Good morning, James, Rose, and Merry Christmas. You too, Aunt Angelina. Rose sighed in frustration. Are you two going to tell us what's going on? Why should anything be going on? Uncle George replied, staring tensely into the glow of the stove. James threw himself onto a nearby chair. Don't you start. You of all people, Uncle George. We won't tell you what your presents are, no matter how many times you ask, Angelina teased. What's going on with Uncle Harry and Headmaster Grudge? Rose sighed, sinking to the couch next to Angelina. And have you heard what a nightmare he is, by the way? He's given Filch some magical cane and set him free on his own little reign of terror. Angelina nodded, her smile growing dark. We've heard all about it, believe me. Here he comes, George suddenly said, jumping forward and grabbing the handle of the stove door. With a screech, he wrenched it open, revealing the glowing coals inside. James peered into the nearly blinding glare, expecting to see a face appear there. Instead, the coals flared brilliant green and flashed with flame. A figure popped incongruously out of the small space, bringing a wreath of green flames with it. When the flames evaporated, Harry Potter was standing there, dressed in his winter cloak, a natty suit peeking from beneath it. Dad! James proclaimed, jumping up. He moved to his father's side, only now realising how much he had missed him. James, his father greeted him warmly, throwing an arm firmly around his shoulders and squeezing. A moment later the stove glowed bright green again, and Harry drew his son aside, making room. Another figure popped out of the flames, this one decidedly more bedraggled looking, his hair lank and dark, hanging in his face. As he straightened and swept his bangs aside, James recognized the figure and gasped. Rose jumped up. Professor Longbottom! she cried. The professor smiled wearily and shook ash from his shoulders. Do I smell cookies? he asked faintly. I'm 
perfectly starved. It isn't that it's secret, Harry Potter explained later, walking from room to room on the third floor with James, Rose and Ralph on his heels. It just isn't anything you'd be interested in. It's just business. But your head aura, Uncle Harry, Rose countered, following Harry into a corner bedroom. Your business is totally exciting. Seriously. Harry smiled at her and then waved his wand slowly around the room, scanning it with pale purple light. James recognized it as a Revelio spell, meant to uncover hidden objects or secrecy charms. Harry spoke as he swept the room. You'd be amazed how dull an aura's job can be, Rose. Just ask your father. Tomorrow night's meeting really will be dead boring. I would skip out on it myself if I could. Come and join you in the attic and play Winkles and Augers or Exploding Snap. Count yourselves lucky. I don't believe that for a second, James pressed firmly. What's with all the secrecy, then? Leading everyone else to believe we'll be at the burrow, smokeless goblin fire in the hearth, security sweeping every room? This is more than regular old ministry business. I didn't say it wasn't serious, Harry replied mildly. I just said it would be boring. It isn't like the old days when there was a single evil bent on world domination. In some ways, that was easier. I'd sooner put out one giant inferno than a thousand little brush fires. What about the collector? Ralph asked, watching as Harry inspected a suspiciously glowing drawer revealed by the purple light. He sure seemed bent on some pretty evil world domination. Harry pulled open the drawer, revealing a tiny poltergeist in the shape of a fat, horse-faced woman with bat wings. It glared up at Harry, grabbed a pair of tarnished spoons larger than itself, and began to bash them together noisily. Victor Crumb told me about that, Harry said, raising his voice over the clanging spoons. He and the Harriers are still in New Amsterdam, keeping an eye on Merlinus's staff, which is still stuck fast in the footpath. It's boring work guarding an old stick. If this collector person shows up again, believe me, they'll know it. He tapped the poltergeist with his wand, surprisingly gently, and the tiny spectre dropped the spoons with a clatter. Its eyes crossed, and it keeled backwards into the drawer, seemingly asleep. Harry shook his head at it. Daft things are popping up in the strangest places lately. Harmless enough, if a bit of a nuisance. Dad? James said earnestly. The man calls himself the Collector. He enslaved a bunch of poor muggles and made them help him build something, possibly a super weapon of some kind called the Morrigan Web. He said he had a warlock helping him. That's what warlocks do, Harry commented, passing James as he headed back into the hall. Magical warfare is their job description. But seriously, James, there are almost none of them left. Most were imprisoned years and years ago, back when the Death Eaters all started turning each other in to save their own skins. I'd sooner believe this collector bloke has a pink unicorn than a warlock partner. But what if it's that vicious spot that escaped Azkaban? James persisted, following his father down the hall. Warlick! The whole reason you captured him was that he was brewing up all sorts of evil dark spells and potions, right? And then the Lady of the Lake breaks him out of prison? What if he's one of the last warlocks around, and they needed him to help make the worst magical weapon of all, the Morrigan Web? Harry stopped in the hall and looked back at his son. Who's they? James paused. Well, the Lady of the Lake and the Collector. We think, well, I think they may be working together. Harry studied his son for a long moment and then looked around at Rose and Ralph. When I was a boy, he said, giving them his full attention. I didn't tell the adults in my world everything I knew. I didn't talk about the basilisk I heard hissing in the walls. I didn't ask for help deciphering Tom Riddle's diary. I kept Dobby's attempts to help me mostly to myself. And do you know why? He raised his eyebrows. Because I feared no one would believe me. Growing up in the family that I did, well, let's just say that it didn't lead to a particularly high opinion of the trustworthiness of adults. Harry turned and dropped to one knee, drawing his son, Rose, and Ralph closer. You lot are better than I was then, though. You've brought your concerns to us, and the last thing I ever want to be is the adult I always feared when I was your age. So hear me now. I believe what you saw in New Amsterdam. In fact, I believe it so firmly that I have been seriously hard-pressed to know whether to punish you for going there in the first place, or to commend you for your perfect dumb luck in escaping those rogue beasts. If Crumb and the Harriers had not been there... He shook his head and glared at them. 
Well, suffice it to say I've told your mother's a rather edited version of the story, saving all of you the indignity of having lanyard charms tethering you to Hogwarts. To Ralph, he added, your father knows the whole thing, of course. He was with me when Victor gave his briefing. If I had to guess, he was both angry and proud at the same time. I can rather appreciate his response. The Collector isn't just some deluded wizard making trouble in New Amsterdam, Dad, James insisted in a low voice. He was powerful. And smart, Rose added gravely. He knew who James was. That caught Harry's attention. He blinked at her. Finally, he nodded and sighed. I wish I could devote all of my resources to digging into it, he admitted, but we are spread terribly thin already. Still, we will look into it, I promise, along with everything else. He shook his head. Ralph accepted this stoically. I guess that's good enough for us, then, right? Rose and James shrugged. So, can we come to the meeting tomorrow night, Uncle Harry? Rose asked, smiling sweetly. Please? No. Harry smiled, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll post Creature outside the attic door to make sure you're all safe from any attempts to sneak down an eavesdrop. How's that? James rolled his eyes. You really are a bit of a killjoy, Dad. That's what dads are for, son. Harry stood and brushed off his knee. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I hear your aunt and Teddy Lupin returning with the Christmas tree. Come, that tree won't decorate itself. Actually, Ralph said thoughtfully, as Harry led them down the stairs, with Creature around, it very well might. Christmas morning turned out to be a singularly raucous and crowded occasion, what with so many people crammed into the narrow house, and so many sweets being eaten, so many presents being unwrapped, and so many new sweaters, toys and games being tried on, tried out, and played with. Voices rang from the walls in a cacophony of genial argument, as Rose, Albus, and Louis played a new wizarding board game called Hex the Hag, wherein a tiny clockwork hag ran around the game board stealing cauldrons. This got rather out of hand when the tiny hag escaped the board, darted under a nearby sofa, and was promptly pounced upon by Aunt Hermione's old ginger cat, Crookshanks, who ran off with a screaming clockwork imp. Nearby, James saw his aunt Fleur trying on a pair of elbow-length red gloves, happily modelling them on her slender hands, while Victoire sulked jealously, already bored with her own new boots and magical dancing locket. James received a new sweater from his grandmother, as had virtually every other member of the household, each one different and unique to the wearer, and each one, of course, hand-knitted and marvellously warm, even if they were not what Victoire called fashion-forward. Most members of the family donned theirs and wore them throughout the day, even as they crowded into the dining room for Christmas dinner. "'Help me out with this, would you, Ron?' Harry announced, as James, Ralph, Albus, and Rose elbowed towards the heavy table, which was already laden with steaming bowls, platters, and tureens. "'I can never keep the corners plumb with a room this size. Too much raw space!' "'No problem, mate,' Ron nodded, raising his wand towards the far corner of the room, aiming over the enormous, roaring hearth. On three, then? Harry nodded and then glanced down at the children, nodding for them to step back. James retreated half a step, pushing Ralph and Rose behind him. Everyone watched as the two men firmed their grip on their wands and counted off. One, Ron began. Two, Harry added. Three, both said in unison. The upraised wands fired simultaneously, producing beams of soft, nearly invisible orange light. The floor shuddered beneath James's feet as the far wall began to move, taking the burning fireplace and gaily decorated mantle with it. The walls creaked on either side as they elongated, slowly turning the high dining room into a long hall. The single frosted window stretched, its glass rippling like water, and then, with a gentle pop, divided into two windows. There was a long creak as the room nearly doubled in length. Along with it, the table stretched, sprouting matching new chairs like mahogany popcorn. The house groaned deeply, wearily, and then there came the unmistakable sound of a muffled scream. Ron and Harry extinguished their wands immediately. Who was that? Ron asked quickly, wide-eyed. It came from behind the wall, Rose volunteered, pointing towards the end of the room. You incompetent clods! A woman's voice cried furiously, muffled behind the fireplace. James glanced at his father. It was Aunt Hermione. There was a thump, a clatter, 
and a series of rather unladylike curses. You engorged the dining room right into the downstairs bathroom. A look of pure mortification fell over Uncle Ron's face. He lowered his wand instantly and bobbed up on his tiptoes. Trying to keep the panic out of his voice, he called, Are you all right, love? I'm stuck, she shouted back furiously. In the bathtub! Under the circumstances, Harry nodded firmly, I think you'd better be the one to go and charm her a new door, Ron. The back hallway should do nicely. Ron's face was pale as he nodded. Coming, love, he called tremulously. And Ron, Harry added, stopping Ron as he reached the door, you should probably take a robe. Ron's eyes widened again. He nodded vigorously and left, muttering nervously. Fifteen minutes later, the newly engorged dining room was surrounded by a happy throng of eating and drinking people, many of whom James was rather surprised to see. Seated on either side of Neville Longbottom were Professors Flitwick and McGonagall, both dressed in far more casual clothing than any of the students were accustomed to seeing them in, although McGonagall's green and red tartan vest and huge puffed sleeves were by far the most disconcerting of the lot. Further down, speaking loudly and intently across the table, with his huge forearms crossed over his plate, was Professor Kendrick de Bellows, his crew cut bristling in the firelight and his voice booming from the walls. And dominating the end of the table with his enormous bearded bulk was Hagrid, his holiday tankard of butterbeer nearly as large as a barrel and decorated with a massive scrolled pewter handle. When did all these people get here? Rose asked James as she peered around the table. Trickled in one by one over the course of the afternoon, Louis answered knowledgeably, reaching for another roll. Most came via the cellar flu, but a few, like Flitwick and that aura bloke, apparated just before dinner. Had their own family holidays to attend first, I heard Uncle George say. James shook his head, wondering, Why are they all here, then? It's obvious, isn't it? Louis replied, shooting up his eyebrows. It's the old order, all coming together again. Albus scoffed. That's ridiculous. Grimald Place isn't even all that secure any more. Not like it used to be back when Dad was a kid. Besides, the Order of the Phoenix was about defeating Voldemort. Unless I've been missing some major news, I'm pretty sure he's still dead. The Order was about the safety of the magical world, Rose countered softly, looking over the length of the table. And as much as I hate to say it, Louis is right. A lot of these people are original members. We joked about that before, but perhaps it's true. The Order of the Phoenix might be reconvened. Albus shook his head. Why? Because some nutter headmaster gave Filch a magical cane? James felt a rising sense of apprehension, despite the raucously festive atmosphere. There's way more going on in the world than we know at Hogwarts. Grudge may be part of it, but he's not all of it. Then why isn't Titus Hardcastle here? Albus asked, rising in his seat and craning around the table. There's a few other blokes from the Aura Department, but no Titus. Seems like an odd one to leave out, doesn't it? James shrugged. Maybe he's coming later. Maybe, Ralph nodded. I heard my dad say to Ron Weasley that he spoke to somebody at Alma Aleron on the Shard, and they'll be showing up later tonight. Alma Aleron, Rose whispered shrilly. You mean they'll just be popping up as apparitions or something? Using some of Chancellor Franklin's experimental communications techniques, right? Ralph shook his head doubtfully. I don't think so. I think they're going to be here in person. Whatever it's about, I don't think they want any chance of being overheard or spied on. Who's coming? Louis asked, leaning over the table. You can tell us. Ralph shrugged. I don't know. I didn't hear any names. Well, that settles it, Albus said firmly. We need to get into that meeting somehow. Louis threw up his hands. Not a chance. You know we've been banished to the attic once the sun goes down tonight. Creature will be standing guard, too. He's as stubborn as a wart on a hag's nose. Nobody can get past him. Well, you couldn't, that's for sure, Albus admitted. Shut up, all of you, Rose hissed. If they catch wind that we're even talking about this, they'll do worse than have Creature stand guard. James nodded agreement. At that moment, Grandma Weasley and Aunt Fleur appeared with double armloads of fresh puddings, some half as tall as the women, and bedecked with red and green gumdrops. Suddenly, however, the last thing James wanted was a plateful of sweets. For the first time in his life, in fact, he was impatient for Christmas dinner to be over. Ralph and Louis half-heartedly played Hex the Hag on the attic floor, taking turns hexing the tiny clockwork figure so that it ran back and forth across the game board, knocking tiny cauldrons aside. 
From beneath a nearby bunk, Crookshanks's huge green eyes glowed like lamps, watching the figure greedily. Beyond the stacks of bunks, Creature's voice could be heard muttering incessantly just outside the locked attic door. We could levitate one of us out the window, James suggested with a shrug. Don't be an idiot, Rose grumped, her chin resting on her hands and her feet kicking idly over the side of a top bunk. Behind her, in the darkness of the attic's depths, Albus clambered noisily, moving crates and ferreting through trunks. What's he doing back there? Lily asked, peering through the shadows. And why is he in such a good mood? Us all being stuck in the attic while big exciting things are being discussed downstairs? I heard Professor Jackson is here from Alma Aleron, Louis spoke up suddenly. I would love to meet him. He wrote the book on technomancy. Literally, Ralph nodded. Maybe one of us could apparate, James proposed, brightening for a moment. That's possible here these days, isn't it? We could just pop down one floor. Creature would be none the wiser. Have you ever seen someone get splinched? Rose asked archly. James glowered at her. No? I saw a fifth year end up halfway through a desk upside down. James firmed his jaw. Well, that doesn't, uh, sound so. His head was in the bottom drawer, she added. Look, I don't hear you coming up with any amazing ideas, James proclaimed, waving a hand at his cousin. Across the room, Victoire, lounging languidly on a middle bunk, lowered her book. All of you give it up. It's none of our business anyway. Why you waste so much energy on such pointless things is truly beyond me. Rose rolled her eyes. Says the girl who subscribes to Fashion Enchantment Weekly. Look at me, a voice laughed suddenly. I'm old Mrs. Black. James wheeled around on his bunk to see Albus standing near the attic window, resplendent in a monstrous purple dress, his head nearly buried under a hat the size of a lorry tire. A ghastly stuffed owl leaned precariously from the hat, its topaz eyes flashing. There's a whole wardrobe of this stuff back here. Jewelry too, look. He thrust out his wrist, showing a collection of silver bracelets, charms and jeweled bands that would have made Professor Trelawney green with envy. Albus, you Burke, Rose said sternly, but James heard a laugh stifled beneath her words. My name is Wellberger Black, Albus proclaimed in a high falsetto, framing his face with his hands. How dare you desecrate the house of my fathers, you horrible muggle-rubbing cauldron tossers! Sod off with the lot of you, or I'll hex you as ugly as myself. Albus, Lily giggled helplessly, put those things back. Seriously, you'll get us all into trouble. No, oh, you don't know what trouble is, dearie, Albus shrilled, grabbing a fringed jewel-handled umbrella and brandishing it like a sword. You watered-down half-blood huggers will feel the stick of my curse. How dare you set foot in my father's house? I'll wear even more hideous clothes at you. See if I don't. He spun on the spot and jammed his feet into a pair of high-heeled green leather boots. Now come over here so I don't have to walk in these. A rush of cold air swept through the room as the attic door suddenly wrenched open. Everyone turned to see Creature looming in the doorway, his knobby shoulders hunched, his face cooled down in a frown so pronounced that it seemed nearly to reach the floor. Found my mistress's things, they did, he growled emphatically, his deep bullfrog voice vibrating through the floorboards. Making a mockery of my dearly departed mistress and no mistake, so no respect they don't. And then, with no fanfare whatsoever, Creature vanished. Ah! Albus screamed. What the? Get off me! James wheeled around again. Creature had reappeared directly behind Albus, his face etched with such refined rage that it appeared to be carved in granite. Swiftly, he pointed his bony fingers at Albus, stinging him with hexes so that Albus began to involuntarily disrobe, jerkily and spasmodically. Ah! Albus gasped. All right! Stop it! Ah! Ow! Sod off, you miserable little... Ouch! Creature paused as Albus kicked off the boots desperately, falling to his bum on the dusty wooden floor. The house-elf caught the boots deftly, still glaring unblinkingly at Albus, his mouth pressed into a tight line of fury. They should not touch mistress's things, he growled in his gravelly voice. 
Moi, it's a mistress, always a mistress. A mistress strictly instructed that no one was ever to meddle with her boudoir. Not even any new masters. I wasn't meddling, Albus protested, rubbing his arms where Creature had stung him. I was rooting about, just having some fun. What do you expect, us all being locked up here in the attic all night? Chose no respect, Creature muttered again, making a summoning gesture into the shadows. In response, the open trunks snapped shut and lurched forward, rocking back and forth noisily on their corners. Must find a new home for my mistress's things, so long as a new master is about, him never having learned any manners. A shameful thing it is. Oh, how my mistress could have taught him. Oh, no such insolence did she. Knew how to train children. Knew when a wand was more effective than a word. As he muttered, Creature crossed between the bunks, leading a clunky procession of trunks, hat racks, and one very narrow gilded wardrobe, its ancient mirrors clouded nearly black and smeared with dust. One by one, the items marched through the doorway and into the hall as Creature watched. Finally, with a malevolent, beady glance back at Albus, he followed. The door slammed shut behind him, shaking the walls and raining grit from the rafters. Dimly, the clunking procession faded towards the other end of the house. And that, Albus announced, jumping up and swatting dust from his behind, is how you get rid of Creature. So, who's coming? Lily blinked owlishly at her brother. You mean to tell us that you planned that? While you lot were wasting your breath trying to figure out how to out-magic the old imp, Albus nodded, I remembered what Professor DeBellos taught us. Here he lowered his voice and threw out his chest. Don't exploit your enemy's weakness, for he may have none. Exploit his passion, and the battle is yours. Wow, James said approvingly, jumping down from his bunk. You really took one for the team. I was sure that Creature was going to straight up murder you there for a second. I admit I may have overdone it a bit, Albus acknowledged, rubbing his arms again. But when duty calls... I'm not going anywhere, Louis piped up, and you lot are daft if you do, after that affair. If Creature does catch you out, he totally will kill you. Nonsense, Lily said. Creature's our house elf. He wouldn't hurt any of us. Creature came with Grimald Place, Victoire corrected, sitting up on her bunk. He's the house's house elf. He just obeys you lot because obedience is an odd thing for house elves to shake. Louis is right. You're not us to sneak out. If you do, we'll both turn you in. You do, Rose said firmly, approaching the door, and I'll tell Teddy Lupin how you really spent that month when you and he broke up for the good of the relationship. Victoire's face darkened dangerously. You little munter, you wouldn't. Rose put on an elaborate French accent and clasped both hands next to her cheek. Oh, Nolan, little prick, how big and strong you are, and so good at Quidditch. I know it is wrong, but there is something about Slytherin men that he's just so naughty. I don't talk like that, Victoire seethed loudly, and it was just a weekend, not all month. Come on, Rose said, pointing a wand at the door. Creature will be back any moment. Hello, Mora. There was a golden flash and the lock snicked. Albus grabbed the handle and wrenched the door open. The hall beyond was dark and empty, leading to a narrow stairwell. James stopped in the doorway and glanced back. Lil, you stay here. I don't want to hear a word. If we get caught sneaking out, we'll just get into trouble. If we get caught letting you out, Mum will destroy us. You aren't letting me out, Lily protested. I'm not a pet gerbil. I can go if I wish. James is right, Lily, Rose admonished gently. We'll tell you everything we hear when we get back. Promise. I never get to do anything fun, Lily groused, folding her arms dramatically. James turned to Ralph. You coming, Ralphinator? Ralph shook his head, his cheeks pale. Not this time. That elf of yours scares the air off me. I think I'll just sit this one out. Suit yourself, Albus agreed cheerily, sweeping past James into the hall. Let's get gone. We're missing all the good stuff downstairs. James followed his brother out into the dark hall, closing the door behind him. It locked automatically, and James stopped as a thought occurred to him. Hold on a mo. If Creature comes back while we're gone, how are we going to get back inside? He turned towards Rose and Albus, both of whom were standing on the top step of the staircase. They glanced at each other. 
Albus shrugged. Finally worked out how to sneak out, he admitted. Getting back in never even crossed my mind. You stupid git, James hissed. It's no good at all if we get caught coming back. Rose, get back here with your wand and unlock this thing. I forgot mine. He stepped away from the door and pointed at it. Rose frowned dourly, but seemed to recognize the sense in James's objection. She took one step back towards the locked door, wand in hand, when a small pop sounded in the darkness of the hall. Creature reappeared, his back to them, staring hard at the door as if he knew something was afoot. Slowly he turned and looked back over his shoulder, his huge eyes sparkling in the gloom. Without thinking, James bolted. He ran towards the stairs and was joined there by Rose and Albus. Banging shoulders and bouncing off the walls, the three scrambled to the third floor, nearly toppling into a heap on the rug below. There! Albus gasped, pointing. Split up! One a room! You're insane! Rose objected shrilly, even as Albus lunged forward, throwing himself through an open bedroom door and ramming it shut. I'll take my mum and dad's room! She panted, darting forward. You take the bathroom! But the lock's broken! James objected. Rose, however, did not glance back. She pelted into the second bedroom and closed the door as quickly and quietly as she could. A moment later, the deadbolt clacked into place. James shook his head in frustration and dived towards the dark bathroom. His feet echoed on the old tile floor as he spun around and pushed the door closed. It refused to latch, much less lock. James grabbed the rickety chair next to the sink and rammed it under the door handle, wedging it in place. He leaned against the door then slid down to the floor and pressed an eye to the crack at the bottom. From this vantage, he could see the length of the hall rug stretching away towards the stairs. Slowly, silently, a pair of naked grey feet padded down into view and then stopped. James could hear Creature's voice muttering quietly but clearly in the confines of the hall. Think they can outsmart old Creature, they do, he seethed to himself. But creature as ways they know nothing of. Creature as means beyond any young witch or wizard. James couldn't see above creature's bony ankles, but he watched the house elf's shadow where it fell along a nearby wall. The shadow snapped its fingers, and a small square object appeared in mid-air, dropping into the shadow's open hand. The other hand unfurled its long fingers and pinched the small object, opening it like a jewelry box. Creature's shadow tipped the box over. Two dark objects fell silently to the hall floor in front of Creature's feet. From James's perspective, the objects appeared to be black marbles, glossy as raven's eyes in the darkness. Then the objects began to flatten and spread, like beads of oil soaking into the carpet. The drops grew, expanding and sending out long, glistening tendrils. Then shapes began to bulge up out of the black goo. The shapes became hard, angular, transforming into jointed appendages, struggling swiftly out of the sticky black. Finally, both shapes leapt fully out of themselves, transforming into two miniature versions of creature, each no more than six inches high, and each as black and liquid as ink. Three escaped charges, Creature croaked with satisfaction. Then free of creature. Only fair, isn't it? With that, the three shapes began to pad along the hallway, making no noise at all on the threadbare carpet. They split up, each approaching one door. Creature stepped towards the bedroom that Rose had hidden inside. One of the ink creatures stalked purposefully towards the bathroom door, beyond which James crouched. Then suddenly it paused. It seemed to spy James's eye peering from beneath the door. It bent over slightly, almost playfully, as if to get a better look. Then it straightened, raised one hand into a fist, and extended its index finger towards the ceiling. The finger wagged back and forth in a shaming gesture. The ink creature could, James realized, slither right beneath the bathroom door if it wanted. He clambered upright as the thought finally struck him. He cast around the dark room desperately. Suddenly, being caught by the horrible ink creature seemed the very last thing on earth he wanted. The bathroom provided no hiding place, however. The ancient clawfoot tub was huge and rust-stained, its curtain rod long barren of any curtain. The pedestal sink glowed ivory in the dimness. A shadow moved in the bar of light beneath the door. 
A subtle, liquid, squelching sound reached James's ears as the creature began to slither through. James backed away and bumped against the tile wall between the sink and the bathtub. His hand knocked against a wooden object, producing a hollow clunk. He glanced aside. A small door was set into the wall, latched with a tiny doorknob. Beyond that door, James knew, was the laundry chute, a dark shaft that led down between the walls, through three floors, and into the cellar. Was it possible? Was it, in fact, any safer? The ink creature squelched into the darkness of the bathroom, one arm waving blackly as the rest of its body squeezed through. Horribly, James heard a high, muttering voice emanating from it. The words were indecipherable, but the tone was the same monotonous ramble creature always seemed to employ under his breath. It squeaked and prattled to itself as it poured into the room like black syrup. James yanked the laundry chute door open, gave the darkness beyond a cursory examination, and then climbed up onto the edge of the tub. He had just rammed his right foot into the chute when the ink creature finally popped fully from beneath the door. It stood erect and regarded him with its ebony eyes. It was like being stared down by a particularly hideous bipedal spider. James slid his other foot into the darkness of the chute, gripped its upper ledge with both hands, and began to shimmy swiftly through the narrow opening. The ink creature leapt after him, but the door swung shut behind James, causing the tiny imp to bounce off it with a wet splat. James fell into seamless, whooshing dark, only now fully realizing that he had just thrown himself off a very narrow, forty-foot ledge. He jammed out his knees and elbows, desperately trying to arrest his fall. With a juddering screech, he caught himself after a few dozen feet. A narrow ledge snagged his heels, which popped through into some unknown space. His entire body followed, jouncing painfully through the opening into the very cold, very hard embrace of some cocoon-like shape. He banged his head against it and heard the slam of another small wooden door behind him. Ow! He wrathed to himself, rubbing his head with both hands. He glanced around and at first saw only blank whiteness. Finally he realized that he had kicked his way inadvertently through the lower laundry chute door, ending up in the first-floor bathroom. The tub had caught him, which was fortunate because the rest of the room was a cramped shambles, almost unrecognizable in its current state. Of course it was. This was the bathroom that had given up most of its space to the engorged dining room immediately next to it. As a result, the sink was crammed right up next to the tub, leaning over it like a vulture. The toilet was hunched in the narrow closet, whose door jutted open like a broken wing. There was no longer any exit, the main door being buried behind the accordioned walls, thus explaining Aunt Hermione's earlier discomfiture. For now, James was glad there was no door. It meant there was no easy way for Creature, or even his horrible ink doppelgangers, to get in and catch him. And then, beyond the wall on James's left, he heard the dim echo of voices. I'm sure it was nothing, a man's voice announced. Was it his father? We had to enlarge the dining room rather a lot to accommodate us all. The house is likely settling a bit. Do carry on, Draco. As I was saying, Another man's voice said with a note of impatience. Ms. Morganston may indeed be a formidable witch, but her sense of stealth is surprisingly lacking. James frowned where he lay in the bathtub, concentrating on the muffled voice. Was that Draco Malfoy, his dad's old school nemesis and the father of Scorpius? He recognized the man's lazy, indifferent drawl from two years ago at Grandad's funeral, when Draco and his wife had come to pay their rather cool respects. Stealth stems from a sense of danger, a woman's voice, Professor McGonagall, spoke up. It may be that Miss Morganston feels no such apprehension. She may not conceal her movements simply because she does not fear capture. Her power, whatever its source, may give her an illusion of invulnerability. After what happened last summer, Uncle George's voice commented darkly, I'm not sure it's an illusion. Kendrick de Bellows harumphed. Hmm, she's powerful, no question, but everyone is vulnerable. She was captured once, after all, and by those layabouts in the American Wizarding Administration. She can be captured again. 
Those layabouts, as you call them, are among the finest professional lawkeepers in the world. The speaker was Alma Aleron's Professor Jackson, who James recognized by his steely tone and his American accent. And it took seven of them simultaneously to subdue her, not to mention that they had the advantage of surprise. Miss Morganston will not be surprised again, I would wager. Before last summer, she was merely a mysteriously gifted young witch. Now she is the world's most wanted magical fugitive, single-handedly responsible not only for the revelation of the magical world, but for the theft of a priceless and powerful artifact, the crimson thread from the Vault of Destinies. Its continued absence is untold and, frankly, unknowable effects on our world, increasing every moment of every day. James sat up in the bathtub and stared unseeingly into the darkness, straining his ears. This was the last thing he'd expected his father and the rest of the adults to be discussing. Was Petra really undesirable number one, the most wanted criminal in the entire magical world? And was the missing crimson thread, lost in the world between the worlds, truly altering the destiny of the world every day? He recalled the words of Headmaster Merlin from last year, as they had all stood gazing at the stopped magical loom, its enigmatic weaving of destiny halted by the missing thread. This changes everything. It was more than James could begin to comprehend. A sense of deepening dismay and worry fanned out in his veins as the conversation continued. Coming to the point, James heard his father say calmly, Does this mean, Draco, that you have been able to trace some of Petra's movements? Marginally, Draco admitted. The difficulty is not in following her via her transactions. It is doing so without getting caught by my superiors. Gringotts' goblins are notoriously neutral in the legal affairs of the wizarding world, but their sense of professional propriety is a law of its own. If they discovered I was using bank records to track a fugitive, getting sacked would be the least of my worries. We all appreciate the risk you're taking, Professor Flitwick assured in his tiny voice. But your information is the best we have. It's a pity that the Ministry rejects it. They don't just reject it, Harry lamented. They deem it patently illegal, and perhaps they are right to. Gringotts' coin-tracking enhancements are powerful goblin magic capable of dangerous exploitation in the wrong hands. Fortunately, goblins are above ill-gotten gain, as they are civic conscience. Well, I think that may be a bit harsh. Harry sighed. You're probably right. Apologies for your co-workers, Draco. No apologies necessary, Draco said lightly. They would agree with you. They believe such things as civic duty, morality, and social conscience are plain hindrances to proper banking. They go out of their way to avoid such sentiments. Professor Longbottom asked tiredly, What have you discovered, Draco? Not a lot, but what I do know is quite curious, Draco said, clearly enjoying being the centre of attention. She is travelling extensively, visiting all manner of establishments. She does not stay long, and she buys very little. What money does change hands does so almost exclusively under the guise of tips. Tips for what? Angelina asked. If she isn't buying anything. Tips for information, Harry answered, almost to himself. She is looking for something. Or someone. Any ideas what? Aunt Hermione asked, her voice serious. What would she be seeking that was so important she had to travel the world to find it? There was a murmur of conjecture, but no one seemed to have any meaningful answer. Draco raised his voice and went on. Even more important, perhaps, is this. Miss Morganston is not alone. Hermione gasped. You mean she's travelling with her half-sister Isabella? Well, yes, much of the time, as evidenced by the few things she does purchase, including occasional meals and, strangely, dolls. Her young sister apparently has rather a thing for China dolls, but it seems she has a male travelling companion as well. His own transactions have occurred regularly enough, at the exact same time and places, to firmly establish that they are together virtually constantly. Who? Angelina asked a bit breathlessly. His name is Marshall Paris, Draco replied, accompanied by the shuffling of turning pages, as he apparently consulted his notes. 
formerly of New Amsterdam, a muggle, but one with a history of interactions with the magical world. He performs services as a hired investigator, and his list of former clients includes a surprising number of American wizards and witches, some of them quite prominent. I've heard of him, Professor Jackson said disdainfully. Calls himself an expert in the transmundane. Pure nonsense. Causes more trouble than good with the Magical Integration Bureau. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, they have attempted to shut him down on more than one occasion. Why in the world, McGonagall queried skeptically, would any witch or wizard hire a muggle for investigative purposes? Jackson scoffed. No one knows, and no one asks. And yet, somehow, he seems to get results. He has made enemies of some of the darkest and most notorious wizarding families in New Amsterdam. One would think he should be cursed dead a hundred times over. And yet he persists, just one more of New Amsterdam's countless, apparently immortal cockroaches. Whatever enchantment or talisman he uses to protect himself, it must be singularly powerful and unique. Neither that, or he is simply the luckiest damn man to ever walk the earth. In the cramped dimness of the bathroom, James frowned to himself. Marshal Paris. He'd seen that name before. It took him a moment to remember, and then it struck him. It had been scribbled in Petra's handwriting on the parchment of her dream story. It was probably still there, hidden away in its sealed packet in his trunk on the top floor. He reminded himself to check it again later that night, if, that was, he ever got out of the doorless bathroom. So, whatever Miss Morganston is seeking, Professor Longbottom mused, she feels she cannot find it on her own. She's enlisted the help of a muggle who is especially gifted somehow with finding magical things. And making enemies in the wizarding world, Uncle Ron added gruffly. With this he sure has outdone himself. If he's helping Petra Morganston, he's making enemies of every witch and wizard on the planet. Harry didn't respond to this. Instead he asked Draco, Any ideas where she and this Marshal Paris bloke may be going next? James could almost hear Draco shake his head as he sighed. There is literally no rhyme or reason to their movements. They travel hundreds of miles in a matter of minutes, and then seem to fall off the map for days and weeks on end. One may as well throw a dart at a map and come up with as good a guess as mine. There was a long pause, then Harry asked, Any sightings of them in New Amsterdam since the night of the unveiling? Well, that is the question, isn't it? Draco replied. As far as Gringotts is concerned, New Amsterdam has gone completely dark. All business is closed. If money is changing hands there, it is doing so completely anonymously. It won't show up again until it re-enters the market outside of the quarantine zone, and at that point the trail would be too cold to matter. There was another murmur of agitated conversation. After half a minute, Draco spoke up once again, and this time his voice reminded James of Draco's dead father, the venomous Lucius Malfoy. I do have a question for you as well, Harry, he drawled, and I hope you won't mind my asking. I suspect you can understand the nature of my concern. Go on, Harry said. You've been very helpful. Ask away. Well, then, Draco said, lowering his voice. I cannot help wondering. If the Ministry of Magic has deemed evidence gained from Gringotts' transaction tracking illegal and inadmissible, what do you, as a representative of the Department of Auras, a ministry entity, hope to accomplish with this information? Hagrid answered this, speaking for the first time. That's not exactly any row business now, is it? He said brusquely, his voice rumbling through the bathroom wall. Harry here's more no aura. We all know that. It's not our place to go questioning his methods. It's all right, Hagrid, Harry smoothed. Draco is right to ask. After all, he's placed himself at great risk. He deserves to know his efforts haven't been for nothing. The fact of the matter is, as some of you know, I am not in charge of the search for Petra. Officially speaking, I've been placed on strictly administrative and diplomatic duties. Titus Hardcastle is in charge of the street operations and raids. What? Hagrid proclaimed in disbelief. 
Whatever for, then? You're the best orator as ever been. Everyone knows that. To James's surprise, it was Uncle Ron that spoke up. The Ministry, and by that I mean loquacious Knapp and his new best mate, Rector Grudge, have decided that Harry's loyalties in this matter are compromised. Harry and his family housed Petra, after all, on two occasions, both times after she had been accused, and in one instance, later convicted of serious crimes. Well, no, Hagrid objected, raising his voice. I don't believe I like the tone of that. If Harry put someone up in his house, it'd be for a damn good reason. You can't blame him for having a heart. He's still a professional. We all understand that and agree with you, Hagrid, Hermione interjected. But the minister can't be budged on the matter. He feels that Harry and many of the rest of us cannot be relied on to do our jobs objectively without letting our personal feelings get in the way. And what do you say to that, Harry? Draco asked, all aloof courtesy gone completely from his voice. Can you do your duty objectively? Can you do what it takes, officially or otherwise? For I assume that is why we are all here, meeting in secret, to apprehend Petra Morganston and stop her from causing any more irreparable damage to both the wizarding and muggle worlds. Can you, in fact, perform this duty without letting your feelings get in the way? There was a long, heavy pause, one that not even Hagrid, who was surely seething with barely restrained anger at Draco's temerity, interrupted. And then, as if in answer, a heavy concussion shook the entire house. The noise and juddering vibration of it surprised James so much that he nearly leapt out of the dark bathtub. The mirror over the sink popped loose and shattered in the basin, raining James with silvery shards. What in heaven? Professor McGonagall's voice shrilled suddenly from beyond the wall. A chair clattered against the wall as several people in the next room seemed to leap to their feet. That, I dare say, Kendrick de Bellows growled, was not the house settling. James's first thought was that Creature was using some especially powerful elvish magic to capture him, Rose, and Albus. Almost immediately, however, he knew that was ridiculous. Elf magic was exceedingly powerful, but being born of servitude, it was always subtle. Whatever had shaken the house, it had most certainly not been subtle. The Rapello Inimicum charm, Ron Weasley proclaimed in a hushed voice. Something hit it, and hard. Voices echoed gruffly, this time from behind James. There was the familiar whooshing crack of apparition, followed by thumping footsteps. James patted his pockets for his wand, and then remembered that he had foolishly left it in the attic dormitory. If he was going to get out of the truncated bathroom and see what was happening, it was going to happen only when someone else let him out. He wasn't sure if he was more disappointed or relieved by that fact. Two sets of running footsteps converged in the hall behind James. Through the wall, he heard a hoarse voice growl. There's a large congregation in the room five paces beyond that wall. The dining room, if I recall. Guard the perimeter and don't let any pass, either by magic or hidden passage. But this house is lousy with secrets. We'll flank from the main entrance on the other side. The speaker thumped away quickly, apparently leaving his companion. James barely had a moment to register the words when the wall behind him produced a frightful shudder, showering the bathtub with plaster dust. When he looked up, a huge oak door had appeared in the wall, its brass knob glinting over the ledge of the tub. The knob turned, and the door swept silently open, revealing a dark figure, its wand extended in one gloved hand. What the— the dark figure exclaimed huskily, taking a step backwards from the bathtub which blocked the door and the fifteen-year-old boy lying inside it. James was surprised to realize the figure was a woman. She recovered from her surprise almost instantly and leveled her wand at him. James reacted purely by instinct. He grabbed the witch's wand hand by the wrist and used it to heave himself out of the tub towards her. She cursed angrily, still keeping her voice professionally hushed and pivoted, hurling James through the door and against the wall behind her, dislodging a large portrait of a grim-faced black patriarch. The portrait fell atop James, which was fortunate, for it deflected the red bolt that leapt from the witch's wand. The bolt burst into sparks, awakening the portrait with a start. "'What's all this, then?' it demanded stridently. James clambered to his feet and shoved the portrait upwards with him, using it like a shield against the intruder. She cursed again, losing her composure, and stumbled backwards through the door she had conjured. 
The tub connected with the back of her knees, and she collapsed noisily into the dark of the bathroom, wrapping her head sharply on the edge of the tub as it caught her. This time her exclamation of anger was neither hushed nor professional. She clambered wildly, her legs flailing as she began to thrash her way out of the bathtub. James threw the portrait at her. It knocked against her knees and fell atop her, covering the tub like a gilded lid. This is an outrage, the portrait cried in a muffled voice. Shut up, the woman hissed. Suddenly James realized that her voice was vaguely familiar. He took no time to consider this, however, instead darting along the narrow hall towards the main staircase. Another dark figure appeared there, apparating directly onto the stairs with a swoosh and a crack. Like the woman, the figure was dressed head to toe in black, its face hidden beneath a heavy cowl. Its wand was already out. In an instant, the wand pointed towards James. Stop him! the woman cried from behind, clattering out from beneath the portrait. James ducked under a narrow table just as a bolt of red lit the air. The stunning spell struck the small table, knocking it aside. James ran, his feet pounding wildly and slipping on the hallway rug. More bolts sizzled over his head. He scrambled around a corner and ran into something so large and firm that he bounced off it, rebounding to the hall floor on his bum. Something leaned over him and extended a monstrous slab of a hand. James slapped at the hand before he realized who it belonged to. Behind me! Hagrid boomed. No! James felt himself lifted from the floor and swept behind the half-giant, whose hulking form seemed to fill the entire corridor. Amazingly, red bursts exploded against Hagrid's shoulder and chest, forcing him to stumble backwards, but not, as one would expect, knocking him to the floor like a felled tree. Who are you? a voice nearby demanded. James dimly realized that it was his father. Cease fire and identify yourselves! Amazingly, the spell stopped. The smell of spent magic, faint but acrid, hung in the air. James glanced up and saw his father... Neville Longbottom, Uncle George, Professor Jackson, and Kendrick de Bellows, all with their wands extended, crowded around the enormous slab of Hagrid's shielding body. Hagrid swayed precipitously, but kept his feet. James hunkered down and peered around the hem of Hagrid's coat. The figure on the stairs had been joined by three others, one of whom was the woman James had encountered outside the bathroom. All he could see of her face was a somewhat pointed chin and angrily pursed red lips. Wands projected from the intruder's fists, held as firm as stone. Finally, the figure on the stairs, easily the tallest of the group, clumped down the stairs, lowering his wand. The others followed suit, if reluctantly. As the tall figure reached the main floor, he raised an arm and swept back his cowl, revealing a tangled bush of a beard, matted ginger hair, and eyes as beady and black as onyx. Titus? Harry exhaled harshly. What's this all about? We might ask you the same thing, the woman demanded angrily, her wand still clenched in her fist. You were supposed to be at the burrow. That's what you told all of us? Hush, Lucinda, Titus growled. James's eyes grew wide when he heard the name. Lucinda Lyon was one of his dad's best auras. She'd been to their house in Marble Arch on several occasions, both professionally and socially. She'd always seemed very friendly and jocular, which was somewhat unusual for an aura. James could hardly reconcile the affable, joking Lucinda he had known before to the cold, angry woman that stood before him now. We had a change of plans, Harry answered sternly. Last I checked, that wasn't against the law. I wouldn't be so sure of that any more, Titus sighed, tucking his wand into the recesses of his robe. Despite the disarming gesture, James noticed, Titus's eyes never flinched from the congregation gathered before the dining-room archway. These are treacherous times, Harry. Caution is always wise, and large gatherings tend to arouse suspicion, especially in light of this evening's events. You might have informed us. What events? Kendrick de Bellows demanded, lowering his wand towards the floor. Surely a gathering of friends on the night of the Christ Mass is no cause for military alarm? Not usually, Titus answered but I was referring to other, more serious events. We attempted to inform you by flu, Harry, but of course found only an empty burrow and no response. Same at Marble Arch. With that, I assembled a team to seek you in the last place we knew of, not knowing what we would find. Weariness seemed prudent. Weariness? Hagrid boomed shakily, still swaying on his feet. 
You blast into your mate's home with ones a blazing and call that weariness? Hagrid, Neville said quietly, why don't you have a seat? Hagrid nodded and seemed to deflate slightly. As a matter of fact, that suddenly seems like a very good idea. With that, the half-giant's knees unhinged, and he folded to the floor with a thump that shook the entire house. James barely had time to scramble out of the way before Hagrid slumped backwards to the rug, unconscious, his arms and legs akimbo. How many stuns did he absorb? James heard his mum's voice ask from the dining room archway. Can't say, Aunt Hermione replied under her breath, but I imagine all that peppermint dragon meat he downed beforehand didn't help. Harry stepped over the prone figure of Hagrid and approached his fellow Aura. I agree that prudence was called for, Titus, but this seems more like a raid than a delivery of news. When I tell you the news, you may forgive our concern, but you should know that none of us fired before we were attacked. Who attacked you? Professor McGonagall demanded shrilly, emerging from the dining room arch. None of us, I can assure you. Titus ticked his head towards Lucinda, who flinched. He threw a painting at me, she declared, throwing back her cowl and revealing her short blonde hair. She pointed at James, her cheeks reddening. I didn't recognize him in the dark, and the next thing I know, some dodgy old duffer was being rammed into my face. I see, Harry said stonily, glancing back at his son. Well, no harm done, fortunately, but perhaps next time you won't fire until you know exactly who you are firing at. I'm quite sure this was one of the first things I taught you. Lucinda's cheeks burned even brighter, but a look of defiance glinted in her green eyes. Titus lowered his voice, addressing Harry directly. There was an attack today, at the summit in Luxembourg. A rogue wizard somehow broke through the cordon. He was able to get off several killing curses before security caught up to him. Hold on a moment, Professor Flitwick queried, tripping slightly as he clambered over the sleeping form of Hagrid. Today, you say? What summit would be occurring on Christmas Day? Kendrick de Bellows answered darkly. A summit that no one else was to know about, I wager. No one expects governments to do anything on this day. Therefore, whatever they do can be done with no scrutiny whatsoever. Isn't that correct, Harry? Harry nodded. It was a classified meeting between Muggle and Magical authorities about how to manage the secrecy of the magical world, a task that is increasingly difficult and which many resent. Some Muggle leaders are opposed to keeping the secret, in fact, and are actively pushing for complete revelation. The summit included members of World Wizarding Administrations attempting to shore up support and cooperation. Why wasn't I informed of this? Percy demanded stridently, pushing towards the front of the group. I should have been there. You should be glad you were not, Titus answered challengingly, raising his bearded chin. Two members of the Department of Ambassadorial Relations were struck down, one fatally. The other, fortunately, was only grazed by a killing curse. And yet it seems her left side is permanently paralyzed, and she has been rendered blind. Dear me, Professor McGonagall whispered, raising a hand to her throat. Harry sighed in resignation. Who else? Only one other fatality, Titus answered grimly. But one that will result in dreadful repercussions. Whatever agreements have been struck with Mughal governments the world over, they're in jeopardy tonight. This rogue wizard who somehow managed to get past twenty-five magical guards, succeeded in killing the Vice President of the United States, a man named Joseph Matigan. Good God! Harry breathed, placing a hand over his eyes. Without lowering it, he asked, Has the murderer been apprehended? Titus shook his head slowly. No need. Once he had succeeded in cursing the Vice President, he raised his own wand to his head and proclaimed allegiance to the Wizards United Liberation Front. With that, he cursed himself. He was dead before he hit the floor. Insane, Neville Longbottom proclaimed wonderingly. How could an insane person have broken through the security perimeter? Not insane, Harry replied in a low voice. The WULF are not given to suicide attacks. This was something else entirely. You mean he was lying about his allegiance? McGonagall asked in disbelief. Harry did not answer, merely shook his head helplessly. A squad has been sent to the scene for what it's worth, Titus said, along with a squadron of Harriers. The Harriers should have been there from the beginning, De Bellows announced angrily, and damn the Ministry for their lack of foresight. Provocative presence, nothing. If the Harriers served as guards at these sorts of events, we would see a lot less bloodshed. 
Harry ignored DeBello's outburst. To Titus, he asked, What has been the American government's response? There is but one response, a voice answered from behind James. He glanced back to see Professor Jackson standing ramrod straight in the arch, his face pale with fury. The president will name a new vice president of his choosing, as the law allows. A story will be concocted by the Drummond administration to explain the sudden death of Vice President Madigan, leaving out any reference to his attendance at a summit of magical entities. And in secret, any agreement signed between President Drummond and the American Magical Administration will be considered unofficially void. This bodes very poorly for the security of the magical community in the United States. Not to mention the world in general, Harry agreed. For better or worse, where America treads, many others will follow. He turned back to Titus. I'll accompany you back to the Ministry. We have to assemble teams immediately to accompany the rest of the world leaders back to their countries. It may be too little too late, but it will be a show of good faith that the Ministry of Magic has not abandoned them in light of today's tragedy. Already done, Titus announced curtly. There is no need for you to return, thank you. The minister thought it best that we not wait until he could be informed before acting. I see, Harry said cautiously. And you, I assume, are spearheading the response? It's all by the book, Titus answered, looking away. Stay with your family and friends, which does lead me to ask the following, and I hope you will understand that it's just my duty. I don't like it any more than you do. I understand, Harry nodded wearily. We were simply celebrating Christmas, Titus. I would have invited you four as well if you hadn't been on duty. Titus nodded slowly and said nothing. James was sure that everyone in the room knew this was a lie. There seemed to be an invisible wall of coldness between Harry and his partner, something that had never been there before. It was unspeakably dismaying to see. I'm going to assume that the minister has placed you in charge of the crisis response then, Harry commented. Would that be correct? I'm sorry. Titus answered, his eyes unflinching. You understand, I'm sure. Happy Christmas, then, Titus. Same to you, Lucinda, and both of you, Cushing and Peter. The two other dark figures, who still wore their cowls, shifted uncomfortably on their feet. A moment later, Titus raised a calloused hand, palm out towards Harry. James didn't know if it was a gesture of apology or warning. Then, with a swirl of motion and a crack of collapsing air, Titus vanished. The other three followed immediately. Harry released a long sigh. The American Vice President! Uncle George shook his head. Dead by a wizard's hand! This most certainly does not bode well. An understatement, I assure you, Professor Jackson seethed quietly, turning back to the dining room. The others shuffled disconsolately, following him and muttering. Draco Malfoy, James noticed, was nowhere in sight. Likely he had disapparated at the first sign of trouble. I'm tempted to ask what you were doing out of the attic, Harry said, looking down at his son with a tired shake of his head. But I'm sure I already know. Are you alone? No, James answered helplessly. Rose and Albus, too. They're still upstairs, as far as I know, cornered by creature. Creatures, actually. Harry nodded, not requiring any explanation. Come along. I'll explain to creature. We'll discuss your punishment later. James was suddenly too exhausted to protest. The adrenaline that had flooded his body during the battle seemed to have transformed into a sleeping potion. He trudged alongside his father and followed him up the main staircase. What's going on with you and Titus, Dad? he asked, keeping his voice low as they climbed the steps. His father didn't answer right away. Then, without turning around, he said, Titus is just following orders. He's good at that. That's why he's always been my right-hand man. He's determined. He's strong. The problem now, I suppose, is that someone besides me is giving the orders. Is he really hunting down Petra? James asked, coming alongside his father as they reached the landing. Harry stopped and glanced down at his son, his brow furrowed. How do you know? he asked, and then shook his head again. Never mind. How can I blame you? I'd have found a way to eavesdrop as well, I imagine. You'll make a fine aura some day, son. Until then, you're likely to drive your mother and me mad. James opened his mouth to respond, but his father silenced him with a raised hand. Titus is following orders, son, just like I said. Petra is the most wanted person in all the magical world, 
perhaps the entire world in general. Is that any surprise? You saw what she did last summer. She was saving your life, Dad, James insisted in a hushed voice. Those WLF assassins were going to kill you. She had to stop them somehow. She didn't have to, actually, Harry said, his face hardening slightly. Don't misunderstand. I'm glad to still be alive, and I have her to thank for it, I suppose. And yet it's hard to imagine that we would have faced that danger in the first place if not for her. It wasn't her, Dad. You have to believe me. It was the Lady of the Lake, and Morgan, the other version of Petra, from some other reality. But his father's eyes had closed wearily. James knew it was pointless to discuss the Lady of the Lake, even with his own dad. When Harry opened his eyes again, they were grave. Either way, Titus has been charged with finding Petra, and James, when he confronts her, he won't shy away from using whatever force is necessary. He won't let her escape. You mean, James said coldly, that he'll kill her? As I said, son, so far as the Ministry is concerned, Petra is the most dangerous person alive, and listen to me. They may be correct. But you're looking for her too, James said quickly. You and the new Order of the Phoenix, right? Harry rolled his eyes impatiently at the mention of the Order, but James overrode him. You were all looking for Petra too. Why? Why not just let Titus handle it? Harry leaned closer to his son. Because Titus may not succeed, or perhaps even worse, he might. After what we saw last summer, a climactic confrontation with Petra Morganston may be the most dangerous thing imaginable, not just for those who confront her, but everyone else as well. So you mean to capture her too, but in a different way? Harry pressed his lips together firmly, thoughtfully. After a moment, he exhaled. We don't mean to capture her, he answered quietly. Capture may not even be possible. We mean... He paused, seeming to look for the words. We mean to talk to her. James considered this, and a sense of almost inexplicable relief fell over him. He nodded his understanding and allowed his gaze to drift, roaming over the landing, over the portrait of old Mrs. Black and her incessantly flickering, flashing painted television. He froze. What is it, son? Harry asked, seeing James's suddenly widened eyes. James couldn't speak. He stared at the telescreen not hearing the words that squawked from it, not seeing the leering gaze of old Mrs. Black as she stared out of the portrait, grinning with sudden malevolence, as if she knew a dark, vicious secret. James raised his arm and pointed weakly, shakily. It's him, he said, surprised at how calm his own voice sounded. Harry turned, frowning, and regarded the painted telescreen. On it, a news program was reporting the sudden death of the American vice president. Words scrawled across the top of the screen. Joe Mattigan, dead at 56, of natural causes, while vacationing with family. President Drummond names new vice president in emergency meeting. Below the running words, President Drummond himself stood before a blue podium, the American presidential seal emblazoned neatly on its front. The president was speaking his expression serious, his posture carefully composed to express both mourning and determination. And yet, beneath this, even through the painted telescreen, James sensed that the President was nervous, perhaps even terrified. Standing next to the President, his face coldly handsome, dressed in a natty navy suit and red tie, was the man James had last seen in the empty streets of New Amsterdam, the man who had conjured Native American monsters out of thin air all while grinning viciously. Now the handsome face nodded solemnly as the President introduced him. Quincy Quartermain, Harry read as the President identified the man. The man elected to the seat of recently deceased Senator Charles Fillmore. You know him, James. James shuddered as the man on the screen stepped forward, replacing the President at the podium. He spoke, and the camera zoomed close. I want to thank President Drummond for the strength he has shown in this difficult time. I cannot hope to surpass Joe Madigan, but as your new vice president, I hope to serve you, the people of this country, with the same character, perseverance, and uncompromising conviction that he has always stood for. With that, he turned to regard the president with a smile. President Drummond, James saw flinched slightly away from that smile.
I don't care what he's calling himself, James said, unable to tear his eyes away from the man on the screen. But he's no muggle. He's a wizard. He's evil. And the last time I saw him, he called himself the Collector. Chapter 11 Quinn's Story A series of rattling clanks ran the length of the Hogwarts Express as the great red train began to crawl out of King's Cross Station, emerging into a fine, greasy drizzle. James shared a compartment with Rose, Ralph, Albus, Louis, and Lily, who leaned against his shoulder, eyes half-lidded, watching London scroll past the rain-smeared windows as if it was the world's most boring movie. As the narrow streets and buildings began to wicker past, James saw that most of the snow had melted, leaving only grimy slush and dripping gutters. No one spoke. The end of the holiday had been uncomfortably urgent and hushed. James understood it only vaguely. The strangely antagonistic appearance of Titus Hardcastle had apparently solidified a growing rift in the aura department. On one side was James's father, Harry, head of the department, and reluctantly famous symbol of the fight against dark magic. On the other side, rather shockingly, was Titus Hardcastle, long-time loyal partner, but sudden confidant and trusted favourite of the Minister of Magic and his closest adviser, Hogwarts' very own Headmaster Grudge. Of course, nothing official had changed. Harry Potter was still in charge of the Aura Department, and yet there was a definite shift in responsibilities, with Hardcastle being assigned the bulk of the active duties, while Harry was increasingly waylaid for diplomatic and ambassadorial missions. Professor McGonagall, who had remained long into the night after Hardcastle's appearance on Christmas night, had admitted her own suspicions. Hardcastle is an obedient soldier, she had spat under her breath, her eyes flashing like flint. Not a thinking man. That's why they prefer him over you, Harry. He follows orders and does not question them. Men like him are invaluable to tyrants. James's father had not been as confident. Loquacious Knapp is hardly a tyrant, he sighed, helping Ron Weasley to shrink the dining room back to its normal size. It's complicated. Ever since the debacle in the States last year, when I fell under the suspicion of the Magical Integration Bureau, the Ministry has thought it best that mine not be the face of national wizarding enforcement. It's politics, plain and simple. James had a feeling that, in a way, they were both right. This was made all the more disturbing by the appearance of the Collector in the guise of the new American Vice President. It wasn't so much that his father doubted James's word, he had, in fact, shown great seriousness and trust regarding the subject, but that there seemed to be very little he could do about it. The Minister of Magic won't hear a word of it, he admitted reluctantly. The fact is, there are conspiracies and threats everywhere, what with the magical world infringing more and more into Muggle affairs. But I will be watching, and not just me. There are plenty who remain loyal, even some of those who work alongside Titus. Lucinda, for instance. James had spluttered. But she shot at me. She was with him tonight when they fell on this place like a load of thieves. Lucinda is different, Harry insisted, his brow darkening. She follows orders, but she thinks. She's caught between loyalties. Don't think this is easy for her. She'll be true in the end. Trust me. By the time he, Albus, and Rose had been returned to the attic under the malevolent gaze of a very disgruntled creature, it had been nearly midnight. And even then, Ralph, Lily, and the others had insisted on a detailed explanation of everything that had happened. The bulk of this responsibility fell on James, who alone had overheard the discussion in the dining room and observed the arrival of Hardcastle and his auras. Finally, hours later, he had told them the most important bit of all. The Collector, he shook his head wearily. He isn't hiding out in New Amsterdam anymore, enslaving people to help make his Morrigan web superweapon. He somehow wormed his way into becoming the new American vice president, probably sent his own people to kill off the old one just so he could take his place. Saying it out loud, James realized just how truly frightening it was. The others seemed to sense it as well, their glassy, tired eyes shining with shock and disbelief, all except for Victoire and Louis, who were incredulous of the entire affair. You're all bloody deluded, Louis announced grumpily reaching to blow out the lantern over his bunk. Even if you did meet some evil bloke in New Amsterdam, it can't be the same one who's taken over the vice-presidency. 
There's like laws about that sort of thing. The president cannot just name any old Metavis to this vice presidency. No one responded to Louis's objection, partly because they were too tired, but also partly because, as James could see on Rose's and Ralph's faces, they secretly wanted to believe him. Suddenly, the thrill of the mystery had become a very real stab of fear, the sense that things had begun to spin out of control on a truly monumental and terrifying scale. If a dark wizard had murdered and tricked his way into becoming the second most powerful man in the muggle-free world, what would keep him from finishing the job? What would stop the Collector from killing the President and taking over completely? Isn't that, the conquering and subjugation of the Muggle world, what the darkest of dark wizards had always striven for? Voldemort had attempted it via insurrections in the wizarding world, armies of dark comrades and widespread magical terrorism. Now the Collector and his mysterious benefactor seemed poised to finish the task with simple treachery. It would have been impossible but for the all-important erosion of the vow of secrecy set in motion by Petra Morganston months ago. James slept very little that night. He sensed, by the restless noises coming from the bunks around him, that he wasn't alone. Thus, as the Hogwarts Express wound its way into the foggy patchwork of fields and rolling hills, lorded over by a pall of low, slate clouds, it was a worn and weary group that lolled in James's compartment, all except for Louis, who had snoozed until ten in the morning and was as chipper as a wood sprite. All right, he announced finally. Who wants to play winkers and augers? James, you're always worth a laugh. Quiet, Ralph muttered receding further into the collar of his heavy cloak. "'You're all a load of chuckles,' Louis announced in exasperation. "'I should have gone with Scorpius to spy out the Slytherins. Scorpius may be a smarmy little burke, but the Slytherins always have good snacks.' "'Well, you'll just have to pardon us,' Rose stiffened. "'We were up all night discussing the end of the world, that's all.' "'Even if it is the end of the world,' Louis said, rolling his eyes, "'doesn't mean we have to mope around like a load of flobberworm.' He climbed onto his seat, reached for James's bag on the overhead rack, and began to rummage through it. Where's your wand, James? No one's quite as much fun to beat at Winkles and Augers as you. James turned away, flapping a hand irritably. Get out of my things, you obnoxious git! My wand's not even in there! For once you actually have it on your person? Albus said archly. That's about as shocking as you showing up on time for a Quidditch tryout. Ow! Louis suddenly cried. What the bloody— James turned back. Louis was frowning down at something in his hand. You really need to clear out your luggage a little more often, James. You've got a lot of weeds or something growing in the bottom of it. Give me those, James announced, jumping to his feet. Those are mine. Louis jumped down, cocking his head suspiciously. Tell me what they are. The yucks of a slapmer, Ralph said wonderingly, spying the pair of spiny burrs in Louis's hand. I totally forgot about those, but... He glanced back at James. But Professor Avior took them from you, didn't he? James sighed. <sighs> he took the ones Zane found on my robe. There were a few more stuck in the hem. I discovered them before leaving for the holidays. Yuxa Paslatma? Rose repeated. Dream inducers? Let me see. Louis shrugged and dumped the spiny burrs into Rose's upturned hand. Ugly little things, if you ask me. What do they do? Rose peered at the burrs carefully. Well, if they are what Ralph says, they're seriously magical objects, though really unpredictable and pretty dangerous. Where did you say you got them? James and Ralph described their experience in Professor Avior's Durmstrang class, explaining how the Yuxaba Slatma had attached itself to James's robe, leaving a mass of burrs that had been subsequently confiscated by Avior. But he didn't get them all, Rose nodded knowledgeably. Because the Yuxaba Slackma had chosen you. Which plant was it? What's that matter? Albus interjected. Just work the magic, right? It's a divination tool. Maybe it'll tell us how James here will meet his ultimate demise. It'll be dead boring, I'll wager. Rose rolled her eyes impatiently. These aren't like Trelawney's teacups, you dolt. This is powerful magic. There are hardly any real Yuxaba Slackma left in the world. It sounds like Avior has the biggest collection of them anywhere. If these aren't used properly, they can be extremely dangerous, and it's important to know which plant these came from, since they all do slightly different things. 
Ralph nodded, remembering. It was something about the answer to your most important question. James agreed. The question which vexes you most. That was the exact wording, I think. Well, Louis chimed in. That's an easy one. Which one of you is the most totally daft? My money is on James. Lily gave Louis a shove and then stood up, brushing her hair out of her face. What makes it dangerous, Rose? Rose handed the burrs back to James. It's simple, really. They're dream inducers. They do their work only when the subject is asleep. Drop one in some water, drink it down, and go to sleep. Ten or fifteen minutes later, the magic happens as a very powerful, very real dream. But if you aren't asleep when they take effect, they can be, well, pretty harmful. Lily frowned. What's pretty harmful? They drive you completely mad, Ralph admitted. The dream fights against the waking world, overloading the mind and pretty much making it go kablooey. So get to it then, James, Albus urged, plopping onto his seat. Swallow those things down and have a little nap. We'll wait. When you wake up, you can tell us the answer to our most vexing question. It's not that simple, Rose insisted irritably. We should know what the question is. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Lily suggested. How do we stop this collector person? Albus shook his head. That's not the biggest question at all. It's how to find Petra Morganston. She's the key to the whole thing, isn't she? Even if we knew where Petra was, Rose objected. It doesn't mean anyone can catch her. I think the most vexing question is who Avior Dutraskathan is. That's probably why he tried to confiscate the dream inducers from you, James. He's trying to protect his secrets, what he knows about the Morrigan Web, and what his connection to Albus Dumbledore is. What if the question is supposed to be about Edmaster Grudge? Louis interjected. Why is so scary and vicious, giving filch powers and shutting down the post and all? Ralph spoke up. You're all forgetting the most important thing of all. The big question is what the Morrigan Web is. What does it do, and how do we stop it? James shook his head slowly. This is the problem, isn't it? They are all really serious questions. All of them are important. How do I know which one really is the one the dream inducer wants to answer? I have a novel idea, Alba shrugged. Why don't you just try it and find out? Ralph nodded thoughtfully. It's worth a try. What's the worst that could happen? Rose stared hard at the burrs in James's hand. I guess most of the danger, really, is just in getting to sleep. I suppose the answer will explain the question once you wake up. Perhaps Albus is right. I don't know, James said, suddenly hesitant. The burrs prickled in his palm, tickling it slightly. Maybe one of you should do it instead. Rose, you try it. You're the smartest one of all of us. Ha! Albus scoffed. I can't, Rose replied, putting her fists on her hips. The Yuxaba Slatma chose you. It will only work for you. For me or any of the rest of us, it would just be a really strange, wild dream full of nonsense. Like all of my dreams, Ralph nodded. James gulped. Suddenly I'm not all that tired. Oh, we can totally help with that, Louis said cheerfully, jumping to his feet. We can make you a nice little bed out of all of our cloaks and then shoot them full of sleep charms. Rose knows those backwards and forwards, right, Rose? Rose nodded. Sure, yeah. They're super simple, really, and work a treat. What do you say, James? James looked from Rose to Albus to Louis to Ralph. All of them looked back at him with hopeful expectancy. Finally, he looked aside at Lily. You don't have to, James, she said worriedly. It doesn't seem all that safe. Perhaps it isn't worth it. Strangely, his sister's warning helped make up James's mind. I don't think we can afford not to try, he said, mustering his determination. And I guess I'd rather try it with all your help than by myself in the dormitory. Excellent, Albus declared, producing his wand. This is better than Winkles and Augers any day. Everyone toss your cloaks and stuff here on the bench. Rose, warm up those sleeping charms. A few minutes later, James clambered awkwardly onto the pile of cloaks, stretching out full length on his back. You don't look like you're ready for a nap, Rose criticized. You look more like a dead body that's misplaced its casket. I'm not used to napping with a load of people gathering around staring at me, James complained nervously. All of you just cram in on the other bench and quit ogling. How are those sleep charms working then? Ralph asked, wedging himself into a seat next to Rose. Feeling tired yet? 
I feel less tired than I have in my whole life, James groused. This was not exactly true, however. Even as he lay on the cushion of cloaks, his fists crossed over his chest, he could feel the subtle magic of the charms seeping into his body, loosening his tight shoulders and relaxing his tense jaw. Lily was the only one still standing. Here, James, she said, handing him a small bottle. It's what's left of Louis's licorice soda. It'll have to do. James sat up with some effort considering the effects of the sleep charms and accepted the bottle. He opened his other fist, revealing the somewhat mashed pair of burrs. You think I should do the whole thing? he asked, turning to Rose. All or nothing, Albus nodded. Down the hatch. Rose merely shrugged. Too much might be dangerous. Perhaps you want to save one for another question. If they even work that way. James took a deep breath. Finally, he tipped his hand over the mouth of the bottle, allowing both burrs to roll into it. They caught there and he poked them with his finger until they plopped inside. He shook the bottle slightly, nervously, and then held it up to the light of the window. They've dissolved already, he said. Louis rolled his eyes. They're magic. Drink up. James didn't like taking orders from Louis, but there didn't seem to be any point in putting it off. He sniffed the bottle, which smelled strongly of black licorice, with only a hint of something wild and musty. Then, squeezing his eyes shut and holding his breath, he tipped the bottle against his lips. He gulped until the bottle was empty. How was it? Lily asked a bit breathlessly. James shrugged, stifling a belch, and handed the bottle to her. Like licorice soda. I don't like it at any old time, but it didn't taste any different than ever. I wouldn't have even known the dream inducers were in it. Get napping, then, Albus insisted, leaning forward in his seat. You've only got ten minutes before the magical brain scramble time. No pressure, though, Lily squeaked. James flopped backwards onto the bed of cloaks. He knew that, on some level, he was nervous, but the feeling was distant, almost academic. Mostly what he felt was a pervasive sense of extreme comfort, as if every muscle in his body, including his brain, had happily turned into pudding. The others continued to talk as he closed his eyes, but their voices were suddenly unimportant and far away. The subtle, shimmy rattle of the train became a lullaby, escorting him down down through descending layers of consciousness until all that remained was a fog of expectancy. The answer to my most vexing question, he thought dimly, concentrating on the words, trying to cling to them. The train lumbered on beneath him, and suddenly the journey seemed much longer than usual. It was no longer a journey of mere hours and miles. It was a journey of years and leagues, across oceans, over decades, spiraling below normal sleep and into something as bottomless as space and endless as time. And slowly, on the other side of that great divide, James began to wake up. For Frederica, a girl's voice said faintly. James looked to the side. A young woman, barely older than James himself, stood nearby. In her outstretched hand, smoking lazily, was a small pistol. For Frederica she repeated faintly, from her fiancé, William, and from me, her sister, Helen. James followed the aim of the pistol and saw a man lying face down, obviously dead. There was nothing else to see, only the girl, Helen, and the dead man, Magnuson, surrounded by infinite black void. But then, slowly, shapes began to resolve out of the dark. James looked around as buildings unsheathed from the empty fog all around. Wet cobbles spread away from Magnuson's body. Barrels and crates shimmered into view, cramming a narrow, dank alley. I've been here before, James said, but his voice was silent, merely a thought in the void. He looked down and saw that he had no shape or form whatsoever. It was as if he was a ghost, invisible and unimportant a mere observer in a world that was not his own. A shock of panic overwhelmed him, and he turned on the spot, seeking some help or even a friendly face. The first face he saw, however, was his own. His cheeks were pallid in the darkness, lit only by a guttering gas lamp near the mouth of the alley. His eyes were wide with shock, his wand was lowering in his hand. We're sorry for what happened to Frederica, a voice. Ralph's said solemnly. This may have been a part of our world, 
but we aren't like him. James suddenly saw it all. This was the night that he, Ralph, and Zane had gone in search of the dimensional key, a magical silver horseshoe held by the powerful and sadistic Alma Alaron professor Ignatius Magnuson. Having followed the professor into mid-nineteenth century Philadelphia, they had witnessed the rather shocking truth of his demise, that rather than escaping into the world between the worlds with the aid of his dimensional key, Magnuson had been cut down by a single muggle bullet fired by a young woman, the sister of one of Magnuson's victims. But why was James here now, watching it happen again? Was he meant to stop it somehow, or was he meant to see something that he had missed the first time? James watched as Helen met a young muggle man, William, near Magnuson's corpse. The man limped slightly. He had nearly been killed by Magnuson and his vicious magical cane before Helen had appeared at the mouth of the alley, the pistol in her hand and vengeance in her heart. The man knelt, pried the cane out of the dead man's slab-like hand, and then, with a determined grimace, snapped the cane over his knee. James knew what happened next. He'd already lived it once. William, the one-time fiancé of the murdered Frederica, took the velvet bag containing the dimensional key from Magnuson's other hand. He gave it to James, Ralph, and Zane, who quickly made their exit, splashing through puddles as they dashed back to Alma Alaron and the fabled time lock. But dreaming James did not follow them. Surprisingly, he remained with Helen and William as they began to walk in the other direction, much more slowly leaving Magnuson's body hidden under a pile of rubbish. And slowly, almost imperceptibly, the surroundings began to fade away again, receding into darkness like actors slipping behind a curtain, until all that remained was Helen and William walking slowly away, huddled together and strangely silent. And somehow James knew there was something secretly important about them. They were the main story now not he, Ralph, and Zane. He watched the young man and woman as they dwindled into distance. In Helen's apron pocket, still warm and smelling of spent gunpowder, was the small six-shot revolver. In William's hand, clutched loosely, was the broken head of Magnuson's cane, its eyes dark and diminished, but not dead. Never dead. A cold wind buffeted over James, taking away the vision of William and Helen, the revolver, and the cane. James sensed their story happening beyond the reach of that wind, as if the wind was time itself, stripping away days and weeks, months and years. Helen and William, strangely but not quite surprisingly, fell in love. They were married, and eventually they moved out of the grimy warren of Philadelphia's wharf district and started a new life in the Pennsylvania countryside. There was a ramshackle but lovingly maintained farmhouse surrounded by carefully planted fields, ribbons of straight narrow roads, and a fresh bubbling spring. And there were children. They were happy in the farmhouse, or at least as happy as siblings can be, with their constant rivalries, dramas, and petty quarrels. There were three daughters and one son, the youngest of the lot. The son's name was Philip and James saw him grow through the years, becoming a fine young man, thin and tall with a sharp, witty, inquisitive mind. When Philip was twenty-five, his mother, Helen, died. The illness had fallen over her quickly in the form of a fierce cold that had blossomed into pneumonia. Philip's sisters lamented how suddenly fate moved, taking their mother in mere days, but Philip was secretly grateful. He was old enough to have seen how lingering illnesses can sometimes diminish their victims, leeching them slowly of joy, dignity, and purpose. Even in his grief, he was glad for his vibrant, joyful mother, glad that she had left the world swiftly, like a young bride eloping with fate, rather than being dragged along by it, slowly and reluctantly. James hovered outside the old farmhouse as the funeral took place. He sensed the grief and sadness within, the celebration of a life well lived. The faint sound of hymn singing leaked into the evening air, led by the bereaved husband, William, his tenor voice not precisely musical, but strong and clear. And then, 
Some time later, as the sun descended into the trees that fringed the fields, turning the sky a cauldron of copper and pink, Philip emerged from the house. He moved quietly, quickly, almost, James recognized this from his own adventures, furtively, dashing along a path between the fields, looking back once or twice to assure he was not followed. James approached him, followed him silently, as the young man turned east towards a thin strand of trees and a rocky gully that bordered it. Something was buried there. James sensed it, pulsing in the earth, felt the pull of its dark magic and undiminished will. Philip was a muggle, and yet he seemed aware of the buried force as well. Of course he did, for he had been there on the day his mother had buried it many years earlier. He had been just a boy then, and when his mother had finished her task and returned to the farmhouse, he had dashed into the gully himself, curious to see what she had hidden away there under the rocks, because Philip understood something that no one else did. His mother, the woman who darned the holes in his socks and sprinkled brown sugar on his oatmeal, who hummed happily to herself from beyond the closed upstairs door of her bedroom every morning, and who tucked him in each night with a kiss on his forehead and both cheeks, his plain, pretty, everyday mother, was magic. James understood. Helen had been no witch, but neither had she been purely muggle. Like Petra's sister Izzy, Helen had occupied a strange middle ground between the polarities of power, instinctively following some deep magical instinct, but not aware of it enough to embrace it. That's how she had known to come to the alley on that fateful night in 1859, the pistol stashed in her apron, arriving at the very moment to save her future husband's life. Her secret magic had compelled her. She herself didn't understand it, but neither did she question it. It was her subtle charms that had made the fields flourish, that conjured the spring to irrigate the farm in the midst of drought, that allowed her poultices and broths to keep her family almost preternaturally healthy and strong over the decades. And it was her unspoken magic that warned her to bury the tin box with its secret dark treasures out in the gully, beneath the stones and spiders and rough yellow weeds. Inside the house, even hidden away in the attic, the gravity of those treasures was just too strong. Helen had sensed it in her bed each night, heard the insistent, silent call. She worried that eventually her children would hear it and respond to it, so she buried her dark treasures. Unfortunately, the very magic that compelled her is what drew her young son to follow her, to watch, and to become curious. And now, almost twenty years later, on the night of Helen's funeral, Philip returned to the gully. He didn't know why he moved so secretly, so nervously. He only knew that the pull of his curiosity and some other less definable force was too strong to deny. James instinctively tried to call out to the young man to warn him back, but of course he had no voice here. He was merely an observer, no more able to alter these events than he could hold back the course of the earth around the sun. Philip pried up the stone and produced a penknife from his coat pocket. With it, he began to dig, tossing aside crumbles of wormy earth until the knife scratched metal. A minute later, he wrenched a rusty tin box from the ground and set it almost reverently on the rocks. He shivered as he stared at it, fearing the box, but apparently unable to deny its attraction. He had seen its contents once before, although that time he had left them buried. His mother knew what was best, after all, and if she had buried them, it had been for good reason. Now, however, Philip was a grown man, and his mother—tears pricked the corners of his eyes as he thought this—was soon to be buried herself. Perhaps the magic was broken now. This was not true, of course, but the rationalization worked. With mud-caked fingernails, Philip pried the lid from the tin box. It came away with a screech— revealing its contents. Both James and Philip peered inside. Cradled in the rusty box were two objects. James recognized them immediately. One was the pistol that had killed the wizard, Ignatius Magnuson. The other was the head of his wickedly magical cane, its gargoyle's face, leering and unblinking, tarnished black 
but glinting in the dying sunset. Philip took both of them, and with that single swift motion, darkness fell over James again, engulfing him utterly. Time blew past again, decades unraveled as Philip aged. He took a wife, had a son of his own, and became an old man. James saw him again in a brief, fleeting moment, laying on his deathbed, his grown son standing by his side. The tin was open between them, revealing the pistol and the iron gargoyle's head. Philip had kept them, treasured them, despite their aura of dark mystery, or perhaps even because of it. These belong to my mother, he said, his voice weak and rasping. And now they are yours. But James could see that the sun was repelled by the strange, enigmatic objects in the ancient tin. He took them, but he did not reverence them. Soon enough, the tin was packed away in the attic of a tidy brick house in Philadelphia, all but forgotten, gathering dust through the cycles of decades, until a woman's hand bumped against the tin, knocking it aside with a clatter. James watched as the darkness receded again, revealing the depths of the attic, much more cluttered and altered by time, lit by the flat brilliance of falling snow outside a single gabled window. The woman was thin, pretty, with a hint of the long-departed Helen in her features, and yet she was sad somehow. Partly it was the task she was engaged in, emptying the house after the death of her oldest grandfather. But that wasn't all of it. This woman— her name is Winifred, James's dreaming mind supplied with strange certainty, but everyone calls her Winnie, was living a life of misfortune and heartbreak. Her five-year-old son, who even now played on the living room carpet two floors below, was weak with some complicated illness, requiring doctors and medicines she could not afford. Winnie's husband was no help, having left almost a year earlier, ostensibly in search of employment back east where he had grown up. Winnie had not heard anything from him since, and doubted she ever would again. He wasn't injured or missing. He was just gone. Winnie pried the tin box open impatiently, and then paused. Puzzled, she held first the pistol, and then the gargoyle's head up to the wintry light. A thoughtful look passed over her face, but it was much different than that which had appeared on the face of her great-grandfather Philip almost a century earlier. The year was 1978, and Winnie's life had not prepared her for a sensitivity to magic. It had, however, made her acutely sensitive to the possibility of quick money. She desperately needed it, after all. It was just possible, she mused somewhat hopelessly, that the iron gargoyle sculpture and antique pistol might be worth something. Winnie pocketed the objects, vowing, albeit guiltily, not to tell her brother about them. He wasn't desperate like her, and perhaps if he had been more willing to help her, everyone knew he could have if he'd wanted to. She wouldn't have had to resort to such petty means. It was weak justification, and Winnie knew it. Deep down she hated herself for it, but self-recrimination wasn't enough to change her mind. She clumped down the attic steps, calling for her son to put on his coat and shoes. Another rush of wind carried James with it, but this one was different. It covered mere space, not time, and James knew that what he now observed was only a short while later, across the city, outside a cramped storefront on a windy street corner. Icy snowflakes scoured the store's windows, blurring the odd collection on display. Musical instruments and small muggle appliances, stacks of cheap books with their page edges dyed yellow or red, antique lamps and cheap glass sculptures. Over the recessed front door were hung three tarnished metal balls, swinging beneath a sign painted with faded red letters. Pawn Shop. Buy. Sell. Trade. Winnie's car, a large, strangely evil-looking machine with rusted edge fenders and the word Toronado emblazoned on the corner of its boot, sat idling a block away. Winnie's son, James knew, was not inside, nor was he with his mother inside the pawn shop. The boy had been left in the care of his uncle, Winnie's brother. None of them had been particularly happy with the arrangement, 
but, as Winnie promised, it would only be for a short while. As James looked at the plume of exhaust puffing into the frigid air from the idling car, then at the storefront a block away, he had a terrible suspicion that Winnie was quite wrong about that. A bell jingled faintly as the pawnshop door opened. Winnie emerged, and the staccato clack of her heels told James all he needed to know. She had only sold one of the mysterious objects, and she had not got anything near as much money as she had hoped. Fuming and worried, she stalked towards her waiting car, and James, almost against his will, moved to follow her. A couple was walking ahead of them on the footpath. James saw that they were man and woman, both wearing black, but they were not man and wife. Sister and brother? He thought, yes. Winnie stalked forward, the cold wind turning her cheeks bright red, and as she approached the couple angling to pass them, the couple stopped in their tracks. A thrill of fear ran down James's spine, for he saw immediately that the couple were magical, American witches and wizards, dressed far more like their muggle counterparts, but the clarity of his dreaming mind was undeniable. The man and woman glanced up at Winnie simultaneously and intently. Of course they did, for they sensed the hidden power of what she was carrying, even if they didn't know what it was. Excuse me? the woman said suddenly, unsmiling. Might we have a word? Winnie paused only for a moment. It's cold and I'm in no mood, she muttered, brushing past. I'm afraid that we must insist, the man said, and his arm snaked out, grasping Winnie's elbow in a vice-like grip. Winnie snapped backwards like a dog on a leash, her feet slipping on the icy footbath so that she nearly fell, would have fallen, in fact, if not for the man's stony fist. Immediately, James glanced about the street in search of help, but the footpath, indeed the entire avenue, was empty, filled only with parked cars, moaning wind, and skirls of snow. "'What are you?' Winnie exclaimed angrily, righting herself and attempting to pry her arm loose of the man's grasp. "'Let go of me, you lunatic!' Instead, the man pushed her forward into the recessed entryway of a closed bookstore. His sister followed, her eyes flashing with bright interest. You're a muggle, she said, smiling tightly. Aren't you? You're not even a witch. A witch? Winnie stammered, fear beginning to replace her anger. What are you, crazy? Get out of my face. I'll call the police. The police? The man scoffed. Feel free. None are within five blocks of here, and even if they were right next to us, they would hear nothing unless we wished them to. Now give over your talisman. Winnie blinked at him in consternation. His words made no sense. Instead, she renewed her struggle against the man's grip. Across the street, a bedraggled man peered out of an alley. James saw him, saw his bleary, red-rimmed eyes and scraggly beard. He was a bum, huddled pathetically against the cold, but curious at the raised voices. For your own sake! the sister declared impatiently. Quit fighting and answer our question. You have no right to whatever it is you're holding. Did you think we would not sense it? It's useless to you anyway. What could you, a muggle, hope to do with it? Hand it over and we'll be on our way. I have no clue what you're blabbing about, Winnie cried furiously, finally wrenching her arm loose and stumbling backwards between the bookstore's dark display windows and towards its closed security gate. It rattled as she fell against it. You're both completely crazy. Get out of my way so I can get home to my son. Your son will grow up without a mother unless you give us what you have, muggle, the man replied with vicious confidence. His hand dipped into his coat and withdrew a long black wand. His sister raised her own, fingering it with relish. Winnie stared at them, at their extended wands, and shook her head in confusion. Look, you've obviously mistaken me for someone else. I don't know what you want. I've got almost nothing on me. Here. She fumbled in her purse, producing a small, thin wallet. Here's the twenty bucks I got for that stupid little sculpture. That's all I have, but you can take it. Take it and let me go. She tossed the wallet towards them, but the brother and sister simply let it fall to the cracked tile floor of the alcove. You think it will protect you, don't you? The sister said suspiciously. Is that it? Surely you cannot be so stupid. You don't even know how to use it. We do. We can smell its power, whatever it is. 
We don't care how you found it or where it came from. Just give it to us. Give it to us and you can go. Refuse us? She shrugged with one shoulder and gestured with her wand. Refuse us and you will die and we will have it anyway. I don't know what you mean, Winnie screamed, pressing back into the security gate, making it rattle again. She did not know what the wands were, but somehow, James gave her credit for this, she sensed they were dangerous. It is very powerful, the brother breathed, stepping forward, his nostrils flaring. His sister nodded. But what is it? We must have it. Their shadows crept over Winnie as they advanced on her, their wands pointing at her heart. Winnie shrank back, cringing, and then, suddenly and desperately, she rammed her hand into the purse again. She grasped something, yanked it out, and flung the purse away. Back off! she screamed, raising a trembling fist. In it, shaking wildly, was the antique pistol, its round barrel glistening blackly in the pale light. Across the street, the observing bum gasped and hunkered behind a trash can. James's sharp and dreaming senses saw it all. The sister and brother stared at the weapon in Winnie's hand. Then, happily, the sister began to laugh. Muggles and their weapons! She shook her head. My dear, that antique pop gun cannot hurt us. You're wasting time, and our patience is running thin. Give us your talisman. Do it now, or we will take it from your corpse. Winnie locked her elbow, holding the pistol full length. She had never held a gun before, was not exactly sure that she could pull the trigger, even if she knew it would fire, which she did not. She pointed it alternately at the woman, then the man. The sister lunged. James saw it, saw the sudden, almost bestial lightness of it, and he once again tried to call out a warning. This time, however, his voice would not have been heard, even if he'd had one, for a loud, flat bang struck the air, momentarily drowning out every other sound. A split second later, silence fell, layered only with the senseless moan of the wind and sand-like scurry of blowing snow. The sister stepped backwards, out from beneath the bookstore's awning. She lowered her wand and looked down at herself in the wintry daylight. Drops of blood pattered the icy pavement between her feet. A moment later, she crumpled to her knees, looked up in shock, and keeled forward onto her face. You— The brother breathed, his eyes wide and shocked as he looked over his shoulder, his wand still raised in his own fist. You killed her! His voice was filled with wonder. He repeated himself as if he could scarcely believe his own words. You killed her! I didn't mean to, Winnie pleaded, lowering the smoking pistol. She stared at it in her hand in horror, as if it were a small, vicious monster. She made me! She was going to— You killed her! The brother screamed so strenuously that his voice cracked and his eyes bulged. He extended his wand, leveled it at Winnie's face, and spoke the phrase James dreaded hearing. Avada Kedav! A figure bowled into the brother at the exact moment that a bolt of green light leapt from his wand. The bum, after a fierce inner struggle, had bolted across the street, stumbled over the dead witch, and tackled the brother at the precise moment that he cast the killing curse. As a result, the curse exploded in all directions, bouncing off the enclosed display windows and hurling both the brother and the bum out into the street. They skidded, leaving a long black scrape on the snow. A horn honked suddenly, accompanied by the juddering grind of breaking tires. A garbage truck slewed to a halt, barely avoiding the pair on the street. The driver cursed loudly behind the windscreen and wrenched open his door. The brother scrambled to his feet, waving his wand wildly, but the moment was lost. More people were descending onto the scene now, emerging from nearby shops and vehicles. The brother threw one last look at his dead sister, and then, his face etched with rage, disapparated, leaving only a crack of collapsing air and a swirl of snowy smoke. What the ever-loving hell? The garbage truck driver bellowed, leaning out of his door. Weren't there just two of you? The bum shook his head slowly. I have no idea what you're talking about, he said emphatically. I'm not crazy. You tell him, understand, I'm not crazy. And neither are you. The garbage truck driver stared at the bum, 
and then at the dead woman lying on a pool of dark red blood. After a moment, he nodded agreement. I'll radio for the PD. In the shadow of the bookstore's deep alcove, Winnie lay dead, strangely unmarked, victim of the killing curse. The pistol was still clenched in her hand. Darkness descended again, and this time James welcomed it. He had a sense that the dream was over, that whatever answer the dream was meant to provide, it was now up to him to divine it. But the dream pulled him onward again, carrying him in another gust of advancing time. In it, he saw disconnected snippets of the story, like headlines in a shredded issue of the Daily Prophet. The dead witch was a mystery to the police, firstly because she bore not a shred of identification, and no one ever came forward to collect her body. Instead, her corpse lay in the Philadelphia morgue for two days before it was mysteriously stolen in the dead of night, never to be seen again. The second mystery was even more perplexing. The anonymous woman had been killed by a bullet wound to the chest, apparently fired by the other dead woman, one Winnie Holm. The problem was that the gun in Ms. Holm's hand was over one hundred years old, a rather quaint antique, and empty of bullets. The men in the police forensic laboratory were quite sure that the weapon had not been fired in many, many decades. Winnie's son went to live with his last remaining relative, his uncle, who provided well for him financially, but did very little to nurture him. The enigmatic pistol was once again packed away, forgotten in the trunks of his dead mother's things. For simplicity's sake, the boy eventually adopted his uncle's last name, and even called him father, although he never once really meant it. And, strangely enough, from the moment the antique pistol was packed away in the basement below his feet, the boy never again suffered any ill effects of his old sickness. These images dissolved into silence as James floated with the wind, carried again into an uncertain future, which was still, strangely, someone else's past. Out of the darkness, Winnie's old car tooled into view, its engine rumbling roughly, a cloud of blue smoke coughing from its tailpipe. Sunlight flashed daggers from the rusty chrome and dusty windscreen as the car slowed, angled towards a curb, and laboriously, reluctantly, died. The driver's door opened with a screech, and a young man stepped out, blinking affably in the brightness of a crowded city street. James sensed that he was still in Philadelphia, although some years had passed. The man was tall, thin, with long, sandy hair hanging in lank curtains around an amiable face. He wore a grungy flannel shirt, untucked over jeans with holes torn in the knees, and yet, watching him, James had the distinct impression that the man was not poor. This, inexplicably, was the fashion of his time. This suspicion was verified as a similarly dressed young woman approached a clutch of books in her arms, and her hair matted in stiff, frizzy ropes, held down by an old kerchief. "'That thing's not exactly earth-friendly, Quinn,' the young woman commented, glancing at the cloud of dissipating blue smoke. "'Where's the bike today?' "'Packed in the back seat, along with the rest of my earthly possessions,' the man Quinn replied easily, leaning against the Toronado's fender. "'I'm on my way east, college-bound.' Seems to me like you're headed nowhere fast, the girl sniffed. That thing smells like roasted cat pee and looks ready to fall apart. The man patted the car's bonnet affectionately. She'll be fine. Just needs a little oil and TLC. Besides, I can't just leave her here in Philly. She'd just get tossed into the nearest junkyard, and I can't let that happen. She belonged to my mom, after all. James understood. This was Winnie's son, all grown up. Everyone called him Quinn, the last name of his stepfather, but the young man secretly disliked it. He meant to move away to New York, where his real father had gone so many years earlier. It wasn't that he meant to find his birth father. Quinn had never known him or heard anything from him, and had surprisingly little interest in changing that fact. It was simply that, as long as he stayed in Philadelphia, he would always remain Quinn, the son of the well-known personal injury attorney whose face appeared on billboards all over town, along with the equally well-known slogan, When it comes to your claim, Quinn wins. But there was more to it even than that. Philadelphia was where his mother had been killed over a decade ago. 
Quinn only barely remembered her as a sadly beautiful face and gentle, loving hands. He had hoarded everything that had once belonged to her, including the old black Toronado, but could no longer bear to stay in the city that had witnessed her death, especially since the man who had killed her might still be living there, uncaught, walking free even to this day. Because Quinn knew more about his mother's death than did anyone else. He was good at figuring things out, and had a much greater interest in the mystery than the police detectives. Only a few summers earlier, Quinn had sought out the only witness to his mother's death, a derelict who haunted the wharf district and occasionally showed up at the several homeless shelters scattered among the warehouses and liquor stores. It was at one of the soup kitchens that Quinn had finally found and interviewed him. At first, the old man had been stubbornly reluctant to talk, adamantly insisting that he had told everything there was to tell. When he realized that Quinn was the dead woman's son, however, he slowly relaxed. He admitted to Quinn that there had been another person present, a man. The man had been the actual murderer, in fact, using a weapon unlike anything the bum had ever seen, and which he could not even describe. And then, the bum whispered conspiratorially, warming to the subject, his watery eyes bright and intense. And then, when it was all over, the guy just up and— What? Sixteen-year-old Quinn asked, trying not to grab the bum by the collar and throttle him in his impatience. What did he do? Tell me! The bum looked evasively around the nearly deserted shelter, his mouth clamped shut. When he looked back at Quinn again, his face was etched with a sort of stubborn defiance. I'll tell you what he did, he said in a cracked whisper. But you won't believe me. The guy up and disappeared, that's what? Quinn simply stared at the bum's stubbly face and red prune-like nose, and his stomach slowly sank. The bum was insane. Obviously nothing he said could be taken seriously. All of Quinn's efforts to find and interview him had been a waste of time, a total joke. Disappointment gave way to rage, and Quinn almost struck the bum. His fist clenched on the cracked tabletop. To stop himself, he climbed brusquely from his seat and began to stalk towards the shelter's front door. He disappeared, the bum called after him, abandoning secrecy, suddenly frantic to make Quinn believe him. I didn't tell nobody, cause they'd think I was crazy just like you do. But it's the truth. He disappeared right out of thin air, like some kind of magic trick. Quinn slammed through the shelter's door, leaving the bum raving behind him, calling after him. The old man was crazy, totally deranged. Quinn berated himself for wasting his time for believing there were answers to be found. And yet, even as he raged aimlessly along the hot, crowded street, he wondered. Was it possible the bum was telling the truth? Maybe he was not deluded, or at least not totally deluded. Maybe there had been another person there that night, a man with some sort of inexplicable weapon, something that could kill without leaving any mark. If so... If so, then Quinn's mother's murderer was still out there somewhere, possibly still in Philadelphia, uncaught and free, living out his days while his mother lay in a cheap grave at the edge of town, dead these many years, dead by his detestable hand. The idea was a poison seed in Quinn's brain, sending out roots of suspicion, blossoming into flowers of hate. For this reason, more than any other, he had decided that he would leave Philadelphia, once and for all, and never look back. We'll miss you, Quinn, the young woman with the dreadlocks said with a sigh. Make sure you come back and visit the old gang sometimes. I will, Quinn smiled. But the smile was thin. Both James and the young woman saw it. She nodded, gave Quinn a little half-hug, and then walked on without looking back. Quinn watched her go, gave a brisk little sigh, and then began to walk himself heading in the opposite direction. Silently, James followed. Quinn cut through a cramped alley, emerging into a much narrower street. There was no traffic here, but the noise of lorries and buses could be heard nearby, droning over the rooftops. Quinn glanced left and right, frowned to himself, and then struck off to the right, following a line of brick and glass storefronts and threadbare awnings. He finally stopped in front of a sort of market, and peered into the dusty window, cupping his hands to his face to cut the glare. 
a row of crates beneath the window displayed an odd inventory of whisk brooms, athletic shoes, umbrellas, and cans of something called Vegemite, stacked in a haphazard pyramid. Quinn shrugged to himself and pushed through the door, jangling a bell hung overhead. Hello? he called, scanning the crowded shop for a counter. Sunbeams cut through the gloom, swimming with brilliant specks of dust and obscuring the shadowy corners. Anyone home? Morning, a voice replied faintly. Not open yet, actually. Not that it matters. Paying customers is always welcome. Quinn turned towards the voice and saw an old man behind a counter, easing himself out of an antique recliner with a groan. The area behind the counter was crammed with an enormous desk, several wooden filing cabinets, a precariously overloaded coat rack, a hot plate and coffee maker, and what appeared to be several decades' worth of newspapers, dirty dishes, and miscellaneous inventory. An electric fan stood atop one of the filing cabinets, ruffling the newspapers and playing in the old man's tufty white hair. Hi, Quinn said, putting a smile on his face. Sorry, I was actually, uh... He glanced around the store again, taking in the amazing assortment of completely unrelated merchandise. I was actually looking for some motor oil. For my car, I... His smile turned sheepish. I doubt it's the sort of thing you stock here. Oh, I don't know, the old man replied, scratching his hunched back and adjusting his glasses. I carry a little bit of anything and everything, whatever I can get my hands on. It's for your car, you say? He leaned over, producing a series of creaking pops from his spine, and began to rummage behind the counter. Yeah, Quinn sighed. It's sort of old. Burns oil like crazy, but gets me there in one piece most of the time. As long as I treat her right. They'll do that, the man's voice wheezed from the depths of the counter. Let's see. Oil. Oil. He reappeared, tilted his head back, and held a small can at arm's length, reading its label through his bifocals. Three in one oil, that's not going to do it now, is it? He smiled and laughed in a cracked voice. No, Quinn agreed, becoming impatient. Maybe you could just tell me where the nearest convenience store is? I can walk. Car needs to cool down anyway. The old man nodded knowledgeably. Nonsense. I'm sure I've got something here. What viscosity you need? Quinn regretted entering the store at all. He rolled his eyes as the old man turned away shuffling noisily around his desk. 10W30. It doesn't really matter. She's an old tornado and isn't exactly choosy. I just need to feed her something black and slippery every few dozen miles to keep her happy. The old man stopped and peered back over his shoulder, frowning slightly. A tornado, you say? Quinn nodded and endured the man's long, thoughtful gaze. Does it matter? Might. The man nodded, turning towards the counter and heaving up a hinged partition. He stepped out into the dusty sunbeams, sighing theatrically. Touchy things, old cars like that. Burning oil is really just a symptom. Why don't you show her to me? Maybe we can fix her up so she don't burn so much. Quinn frowned at the hunched old man, who merely stared back at him expectantly. What? He shrugged and gave another wheezy laugh. You gonna turn down an offer of genuine goodwill? What's this town coming to? Look, I drove a tornado myself thirty years ago. I learned a few tricks about him. At the very least, it'll get me out of the shop for a quarter hour. So lead on, my young friend. Quinn almost said no, but James saw he had been raised to respect his elders. And besides, maybe the old guy did know a few things about cars. It would be nice not to have to pull over every forty miles amid a cloud of oily blue smoke. With a wry smile and a shake of his head, Quinn turned towards the front door. Five minutes later, Quinn hunkered in front of the Toronado and popped the bonnet. It wrenched open with a screech, and he held it up for the old man. Hmm, the man muttered to himself, fiddling with a few wires and plugs. He leaned over the grill and peered into the depths of the engine compartment. To Quinn, he did not appear to be a man on the verge of fixing something. On the contrary. He seemed almost to be idly hunting around, prodding this and poking at that. He sniffed the hot air over the engine, and then stood up again with a shake of his head. Not in there, he said, almost to himself. What? Quinn asked, becoming seriously annoyed. I thought you said you knew how to work on these. Problem's not with the engine, 
the old man said with a brisk nod. Has to be in the back. Open up the trunk. Let me take a look. The trunk, Quinn repeated skeptically, lowering the bonnet. That's what I said. Pop it open. Quinn slammed the bonnet and shook his head. Look, if it's all the same to you, you want to get this thing running again or not, the old man said, straightening for the first time. He was, Quinn saw, rather taller than he had at first appeared. His hunched back seemed suddenly remarkably straight. His voice even sounded firmer, less wheezy, more commanding. Open the trunk and I'll make all your problems go away. Quinn glanced at the man with a mixture of bemusement and trepidation. Sighing, he took out his keys. My stuff's all back there, he said, leading the man towards the rear of the car. You won't be able to see anything. I'll be able to see just fine, the man said in a low, grating voice. Quinn socked the key into the lock and twisted. With a pop, the boot opened. Let me dress, he began, but the old man shouldered past him, bending low over the haphazard jumble of Quinn's luggage and duffel bags. He began to shove them aside, patting and probing them one by one. Quinn watched this with increasing incredulity. Whatever the problem with the oil is, he ventured loudly, it isn't in any of my bags. So sure are you, the man growled, beginning to heave Quinn's things out onto the street. Quinn's temper finally broke. All right, that's enough, he said, grabbing a duffel bag with one hand and the man's shoulder with the other. I don't know what you think you're doing, but you're obviously not fixing my car. Why don't you just— The back of Quinn's head connected with the light pole before he knew what happened. He dropped the duffel bag, grabbed the back of his head, and slid clumsily to the sidewalk, fifteen feet away from the car. The old man, who suddenly didn't appear particularly old at all, still stood near the open boot, but peered back at Quinn with a calmly warning look. You'll not want to touch me again, he said, all the wheeze gone out of his voice, if you know what's best for you. He resumed his ransacking of the trunk, becoming agitated, muttering angrily under his breath. Quinn climbed to his feet woozily. There was a hot, damp spot on the back of his head. He touched it gingerly with his fingers, and they came away grimed with blood. The old man had pushed him. That had to have been it. But fifteen feet? Was anyone capable of such strength? And yet the answer was right in front of him. The wheezy, hunched old man was suddenly straight-spined and square-shouldered, his wispy grey hair now thick and threaded with black. He heaved Quinn's guitar case out onto the street with a clatter, barely pausing. Still feeling woozy, Quinn looked around the sunny street. People were passing, glancing idly at the man ransacking the car, but no one stopped. To the outside observer, the scene probably looked like a disgruntled father searching his son's car for some mildly illegal contraband. Quinn stumbled off the sidewalk and into the street, making a wide angle towards the Toronado's passenger door. He reached it, thumbed the latch, and pulled the door open. A moment later, he fell inside. Where is it? The man's voice seethed from the depths of the trunk behind him. It's here, same as before. I can feel it. Despite the morning heat, a sort of preternatural chill fell over Quinn where he sat. The man was looking for something, something he knew had to be there, something he recognized. But how could he? It was the mention of the Toronado that had done it. Not many people drove them, not any more. That was when the old man had changed, become suddenly interested. Where are you? he growled, shaking the car with his fervor as he tore things out of the boot, heaving them onto the street. Where are you, gods damn it? And then, suddenly, he stopped. Silence fell, punctuated only by the dim thrum of distant traffic and a nearby dog's barking and Quinn realized that he knew what the man was looking for. He lurched in the passenger seat, leaned over, and rammed his hand under the driver's seat, groping frantically. It wasn't there. He twisted his body, shimmying further under the seat, scrabbling in the darkness. His fingers brushed something, a small, heavy object wrapped in oily rags. He fumbled it, and then gripped it. "'Where are you at, then?' a voice exclaimed harshly in his ear and a pair of strong, knuckly hands grabbed him, clamping onto his calf and shoulder, heaving him bodily out of the car. Hey, where is it? Give it over! 
Quinn flailed, scrabbled at the car door to no avail, and fell stumbling into the street. The man loomed over him, a grim shadow against the morning sun. He reached again, but Quinn scrambled backwards, still clutching the object he'd claimed from beneath the seat. The man followed, stalking resolutely, chasing Quinn into the shadows of the opposite sidewalk. A newspaper lorry sat idling against the curb, its exhaust making a plume of rich fumes in the still air. Quinn bumped against the lorry's tire and tried to clamber to his feet. The man kicked at him, knocking him back down. Give it over, he commanded, raising his chin and reaching for his back pocket. Give it over, and perhaps this day may end with you still alive. Quinn shook his head. He groped for something to say, some pithy rebuttal that would end this incomprehensible confrontation. Oh, he stammered, clutching the wrapped object against his chest. Oh, over my dead body! The old man nodded firmly and sighed. In that case! He raised his fist from behind his back, and a long tapered stick was protruding from it. He pointed it at Quinn, sighted down it, and stepped back into the sunlight of the street, drawing his aim. And in Quinn's hand, the wrapped object pulsed, suddenly as cold as a January tombstone. Avada! There was a screech, a blaring horn, a judder of grinding tires, and the man was bashed from view, replaced by a blur of grey-green metal. It was a garbage truck, slewing sideways as it braked. Quinn, and James as well, could hear the frantic cursing of the driver, even over the noise of the squealing tires. A moment later, and twenty feet away, the garbage truck jerked to a stop, producing a rattling crash from its rubbish-choked guts. Weak with disbelief and shock, Quinn finally clambered to his feet. He stumbled around the front of the newspaper lorry to where the garbage truck sat idling, angled crookedly towards the curb. The erstwhile old man lay in its shadow, broken and bleeding, road grime ground into his cheek and forehead. His wand was broken in his clenched fist. What the? A man's voice cried, and then, shrill with disbelief, Him? Again? Quinn looked up, saw the garbage truck driver standing on the running board of his truck, clutching the open door. James was not exactly surprised to see it was the same driver, only a decade older, his chin pouched and his cheeks grey with stubble. Go for help, Quinn said mildly. The cops! Ambulance! Whatever! The driver looked from Quinn to the body in the gutter, and then back again. Whatever you say, kid, he said, shaking his head in wonderment. But I don't think it's going to do anybody any good. He looked back again at the dying man below, and muttered, Sheesh! Talk about what goes around comes around. Quinn approached the bleeding figure in the shadow of the garbage truck. As he did so, he felt the cloth fall off the object in his hand. The dying man saw it, and his eyes sparkled strangely. He let out a harsh, barking laugh. James looked. It was the ancient pistol, the one that had killed Magnuson in an alley in 1859, the one that had somehow travelled through time, passing from one hand to another, to end up here, at this moment. Quinn looked down at it in his hand. This is what you wanted, he said blankly. But why? The man's face contorted with pain and rage. It's more power than a creature like you. <laughs> he coughed violently and spat blood. Than a creature like you knows what to do with. Quinn took another step forward and stood over the man. He lowered the old, unloaded pistol to his side. You murdered my mother, he said, merely confirming what he already knew. The man showed his bloody teeth and struggled for his last, ragged breath. Killing muggles, he rasped, isn't murder. He fell back against the curb, his strength spent. A moment later, his chest fell and didn't rise again. He still stared up at Quinn, but the eyes were as empty as marbles. Quinn stared down at him. It was over, but it wasn't satisfying. James could see it on the young man's face. Quinn didn't have any more answers, just more questions. 
It was as if he was willing the dead man to come back to life again to ask him the questions that now, suddenly, seemed so important. Why was the gun, this ancient, useless old revolver, worth killing for? What had he meant by it having more power than he, Quinn, would know what to do with? What had the stick in the man's hand been? Was that how he had killed Quinn's mother somehow all those years earlier? So many questions and almost no answers. Finally, after what seemed like a lifetime, but was really less than fifteen seconds, Quinn bent, retrieved the hank of oily cloth from the pavement, and wrapped the pistol in it. He returned to his Toronado, pushed the wrapped weapon back under the driver's seat, and then went back to the body of his mother's murderer. Calmly, he sat down on the curb and just stared at the dead man's blank, marble-like eyes. There he waited for the police, whose sirens were even now echoing along the street, as James sank away, leaving Quinn watching the young man's strange, inquiring calm, wishing he could answer the questions for him. The pistol was powerful, because it had ended the life of a great, dark wizard, and that had made it a sort of wand, absorbing the wizard's power, converting it into strange, magical energy. It was inexplicable, but it was also undeniable. Somehow, some way, James thought as darkness drifted over him, engulfing the scene. This was the answer. This strange, long story was the answer to his most pressing question. And as James tumbled into the darkness of the dream's closing oblivion, he realized Quinn wasn't the only one with more questions than answers. Chapter 12 Mystery at the White Tomb James ascended to wakefulness like a diver ascending from the depths of the ocean. It seemed to take an exceedingly long time, with consciousness blooming slowly above like a pale dawn. Eventually, blearily, he opened his eyes. He was not on the Hogwarts Express. A blank grey ceiling hung high over his head, dim with shadows. He turned, moaning and pushed himself into a sitting position. "'Oh, thank goodness!' a woman's voice announced, her tone somewhere between relief and rebuke. "'I was beginning to think you'd spend the rest of the term on that bed. Here, here, drink this. You must be hopelessly dehydrated.' A glass vial was pressed against James's lips, followed by a gush of cold liquid. He gulped the liquid, which tasted a bit like old copper knuts and dirty socks, and coughed. No, let's not be dramatic, Madame Curio chided, setting the glass aside. Anyone willing to swallow five of those horrible, weasley, fainting fancies on a dare should have no problem with a little draught of rejuvenation. Fainting? James coughed, glancing around. He saw that he was back at Hogwarts, in the hospital wing. The light outside the tall windows was grey and watery, giving no indication of the time of day. Fainting fancies? You of all people should know better, Mr. Potter, Madame Curio huffed, taking dares about such silly things, especially on the train with no medical staff to assist if things go awry. Then things do always seem to go awry with you, don't they? Fortunately for you, Rose Weasley, Ralph Deedle, and that Malfoy boy had the sense to bring you straight to me from the train, telling me exactly what happened. James's heart sank in his chest. They carried me here from the train. Like in front of everybody. Well, there was little they could do to hide it, was there? Madame Curia replied, producing a thermometer and thrusting it into James's mouth. He flopped back against the rumpled pillows. How long have we been back, then? He mumbled around the thermometer. Three and a half days, Madame Curia sniffed. I was seriously beginning to wonder if I was going to have to transfer you to St. Mungo's. Three days! James nearly choked again, scrambling upright. Madame Curio pushed him back down. Yes, three days, so you can manage five more minutes. Now lie still and stop talking. When Madame Curio finally released him, James made his way towards the great hall, where he could hear the dull thrum and clatter of dinner conversation. He tried to enter surreptitiously, angling around the side wall towards the Gryffindor table, but nonetheless drew an increasing number of glances and half-whispered comments. As James passed, Lance Vassar smirked and shook his head, joined by his constant entourage of admirers. From the Slytherin table, Albus craned and began to applaud. 
This was joined by a smattering of others throughout the hall, all grinning, some miming fainting hands to their foreheads. Hilarious, James huffed, dropping to a seat between Rose and Scorpius. Fainting fancies! What were we supposed to do? Rose hissed. It was like you were dead. By the time we got to Hogsmeade, I'd tried every reviving charm I know. We couldn't tell anyone about the dream inducers, could we? The fainting fancies were Scorpius's idea, Ralph said, pushing a platter of steak and kidney pie at James. When we told him what happened, he came up with that straight away. He even had a few of them in his pocket to make it all seem legit. Did the job nicely when we got to Madame Curio. James accepted the platter, suddenly realising how ravenous he was. Except that now everyone thinks I'm some prat who'll swallow anything on a dare. Better than having Professor Avior know you nicked some of his wares, Rose said in a low voice. By the way, glad you finally woke up. So, tell, Scorpius said seriously, pushing aside his own plate and leaning close. Apparently the Yaksa Baslatma worked, yes? We've been waiting half a week to hear the mysterious answer to our problems. What did you see? James met Scorpius's eyes then drew a deep breath, unsure where to start. He nodded and then shook his head. It worked, but I don't have any clue what any of it meant. Tell, Rose insisted. Maybe we can help work it out. James shook his head firmly, as if to dislodge something in his brain. Let me eat and think a bit. I still feel like there's a cloud jammed into my head. Then we'll discuss it, in the library. The others agreed to this reluctantly. Eventually, after James's third helping of steak and kidney pie and Ralph's fourth pumpkin muffin, they made their way to the library where James told them everything he could remember. When he finished, there was a moment of thoughtful silence. How is that an answer to our most important question? Ralph finally asked. Rose frowned. It does seem pretty vague. Perhaps it will make sense eventually. Who's Quinn? Scorpius mused, leaning back in his chair. That's really the key to everything. Quincy is one of the names the Collector is using as the new American Vice President, Ralph suggested doubtfully. James sighed and rubbed his forehead. I wish it was that easy. The Quinn in my dream had it as a last name, and he stopped using it as soon as he moved away from Philadelphia. Who knows what name he's going by now? All I know is that all of this started because of what happened when Zane, Ralph and I went through the time lock and followed Magnuson. I told you it was dangerous meddling about in time, Rose rallied, poking James in the chest. I warned you. That's why time-turners have been outlawed. The past is no place to go mucking about in. Cool your cauldron, Weasley, Scorpius drawled in a bored voice. Clumsy as they probably were, James, Deedle and Walker didn't change anything. They just watched it all happen from behind a bunch of crates, like mice. Well, Ralph objected mildly. Not like mice, exactly. More like, like lemurs. Foxes, James amended. Stealthy, like. You can't know you didn't change things, Rose insisted seriously. It's a scientific law. Observing things changes the outcome. Even the muggles know that. Ralph blinked at Rose. Where do you get this stuff? Rose flopped backwards in her chair and crossed her arms huffily. Just because you haven't read it doesn't mean it isn't true. So what did I miss here in the Land of the Living? James asked tiredly. For someone who had slept for almost four days, he felt surprisingly exhausted. Nothing good, Ralph admitted in a low voice. Professor Revalvier isn't the only good teacher who's been replaced by some dodgy ministry act. Tabitha Corsica has taken over for Professor Longbottom in Herbology, just like we heard last time we were at York. Grudge apparently arranged it himself. She's actually not a bad teacher, really, Rose sniffed. I mean, she's a despicable person and everything, sure, but still. James rolled his eyes, dreading the prospect of sitting beneath that cool, pretty, hateful gaze next to Herbology. I don't care how good a teacher she's pretending to be. She's vicious and mad. And besides, nobody knows more about Herbology than Professor Longbottom. Nobody argued with that. That's just the start, though, Rose went on. Filch is running more rampant than ever, haunting the halls at all hours with that cane of his, just looking for people to sock with detention. He's filling up the charms classroom most nights with his victims, making them scrub old trophies, do lines, or worse. What's worse than doing lines with those bloody black quills? James frowned, remembering the cuts on the back of his sister's hand, his temper rising. No, he doesn't use those in public, Ralph answered. 
Those are for special offenders who have to do detention down in his office. Nobody is allowed to talk about it, but we all know that's what happens there. Argus Filch is a sadist, Scorpius said simply. He likes hurting people, but he gets bored with the same things over and over. To keep it enjoyable, he has to get inventive. He makes students levitate their textbooks, Rose whispered. James blinked. Well, that doesn't sound so for hours at a time, Ralph added. Have you ever tried that? It's easy for the first few minutes, sure, but eventually your arm gets tired, so tired it hurts, and your concentration weakens. And if you drop the book, Scorpius said, it falls into a cauldron of acid, destroying it. You're out a textbook, and Filch just laughs, clucking his tongue, and talking about how wasteful it is, and how your mummy and daddy will soon run out of money to replace your books. And then he just makes you start over with another one from your school bag. Who's he doing this to? James asked, his cheeks reddening. Has he done this to Lily? Lily is keeping herself out of trouble, Rose soothed. But Scorpius has had first-hand experience. He spent three hours levitating his books. Only dropped one, Ralph nodded, impressed. Fortunately, my family can afford all the books I need, Scorpius said with a wave of his hand. And my father approves of harsh punishments. He thinks it will put the Slytherin back in me. A shadow passed over the table, and James felt someone standing behind him. He glanced up, and was chilled by the sight of Filch himself suddenly looming over him, a grim, self-satisfied smile creasing his wrinkled face. "'Doing homework, are we?' he asked in a low, grating voice. "'Yes,' Ralph answered loudly, at exactly the same time that Rose said, "'No!' She glared at Ralph, and then glared back at the caretaker. "'We're finished, sir.' We were doing homework. Now we're just, uh, talking. Filch raised his stubbly chin, his eyes sparkling meanly. Strange that I see no books. Difficult to do homework without books, or quills, or parchment. James tried not to wilt in Filch's long shadow. He could smell cold and mustiness on the man's worn leather coat. We're discussing a class project, sir. Something for, uh, muggle studies. This seemed safe enough, as muggle studies did not, this term, require any books. Filch glared down at James for a long moment, his eyes narrowed, his mouth cinched up on one side, consideringly. Talkings for common rooms, he finally said in a low, grating voice. The library is for quiet. Scorpius cleared his throat loudly, drawing attention away from James. <coughs> Right you are, sir. If you will excuse us, then, we'll just be on our way, won't we? He climbed to his feet and straightened his robes. James, Rose, and Ralph followed suit. Filch did not move. Enjoy your nice long nap, Mr. Potter, he asked pointedly. James felt the heat rise to his cheeks again and knew they were burning red. Angry retorts crowded into his mind, clamouring to be spoken. Instead, he glanced away, towards the distant librarian's desk, and merely said, Is sleeping against the rules, sir? Filch's smile widened, showing his yellow teeth. It may well be. You've missed several days' classes, Mr. Potter. Your professors mind such things. I, however, do not. I mind that you are a foolish, stupid boy who seems to attract trouble the way rotten food attracts flies. James felt the anger welling up in him, nearly bursting forth. And then he realised something. Filch was trying to anger him. The caretaker was hoping to provoke a reason to give James detention, and it had almost worked. Realising this, the rage slowly subsided. He glanced up at Filch thoughtfully. Enjoying my father's cloak, Mr. Filch? he asked, looking the old man square in the eye. He knows that you have it, you know. Filch's smile dried up in an instant. That cloak was confiscated, he growled peevishly. Oh, very nice and legal. If your father dislikes it, he can take it up with the headmaster, and I would very much like to see him try. In the meantime, I suggest you keep your cheeky comments to yourself. With that, he took a step backward, allowing James room to move around him. Tentatively, the four students trickled away, heading towards the door, 
expecting Filch to call them back at any moment. He did not, but he watched them beadily, angrily. That was really stupid, James, Rose said quietly as they climbed the stairs. Brave, but stupid. Don't listen to her, Scorpius countered. It was bloody brilliant. Besides, what's the worst he can do? James considered this for a moment, unsure if the answer was particularly comforting. So what did you do to get detention anyway? he asked as they neared the portrait hole. A trifle, Scorpius replied in a bored voice. Then to the portrait of the fat lady, Flitterbloom. The fat lady nodded and swung aside in her frame, revealing the entrance to the common room. Scorpius climbed through. Rose turned to James before following Scorpius. He took the blame for the fainting fancies, dear, she explained. Said he told you you were a flobberworm if you refused. That's why he got detention. James blinked at her and then glanced through the portrait hole, watching Scorpius hurl himself into a saggy chair by the hearth. He didn't know what to say. Let's just hope, Rose sighed, turning to clamber through the hole herself, that that dream of yours ends up being worth it. The following weeks went by in a sort of hectic blur. James quickly learned that both the new Wislet professor Herbertina Blovius and Herbology's Tabitha Corsica had taken to assigning crippling amounts of homework. James, having missed most of his first week back, found himself immediately buried under a seemingly insurmountable pile of essays, worksheets, and literature assignments. Fortunately, Rose was able to assist with the latter, having already read most of the books on Blovius's reading list and providing James with a quick verbal synopsis of each. All except for Persephone Remora's vampire trilogy, she sniffed with obvious distaste. I mean, honestly, how many adjectives can someone pile up before the whole sentence just collapses under its own weight? The general theory among Scorpius, Rose, and Ralph was that the teachers were under strict orders to keep their students as busy as possible as a sort of distraction. This was indirectly confirmed by Professor Votary at the end of one of his accidentally exciting ancient runes lectures. As you are aware, students, I traditionally eschew the assignment of homework, he sighed impatiently, gazing fixedly at an upper corner of the classroom, since I believe it is an archaic and ineffective measure of academic progress, remnant of a time when scholarship was judged by mere repetition of facts, rather than the application of experience. However, in light of new imperatives instituted by current leadership, he adjusted his tiny spectacles and seemed to give the matter a moment's disgruntled consideration. Six inches of parchment on the similarities between Babylonian cuneiform and ancient hexaphonics should suffice. This was, of course, met with a chorus of weary moans, since hexaphonics were among the most notoriously complicated magical runes ever devised. You guys are right, Zane whispered, slinging his backpack over his shoulder as the class shuffled, muttering towards the door. This has got to be Grudge's work. He's keeping everybody too busy to ask any awkward questions. Folks too, Ralph glowered, since not handing in homework is now a punishable offence. Zane gave a low whistle. Lucky for me, he's got no jurisdiction over us Alarans. I feel worse for those poor York students, Rose said, glancing over her shoulder towards Morton Comstock and his muggle companions. They don't even have the resources to study such things, not to mention the fact that most hexaphonics are invisible to muggles. I wish they were invisible to me too, James countered grumpily. Just looking at them gives me a headache. The way they crawl all over the page. It's like trying to read an anthill. Water dripped steadily from the roofs and gutters of the castle as winter receded, revealing dark patches of muddy grass like islands in the slushy snow. Soon enough, the trees of the Forbidden Forest budded with green, and stiff spring winds tore across the grounds, raising leaden waves on the lake and snapping students' cloaks and robes as they made their way in huddled clusters to the greenhouses. Tabitha Corsica, however, never seemed even slightly ruffled, regardless of the weather. She presided over her biology class with her typical infuriating smugness, showing special favour to her former house. Slytherins were always granted the care of the flowering perfunia bushes, while the rest were responsible for the maintenance of mandrakes and thorned pustubers. 
Like Professor Blovius, Corsica prescribed endless essays and reading assignments. It was common knowledge, however, that she provided her Slytherin housemates with extracurricular assistance, up to, and including, or, so the rumours went, dummy essays posted in the Slytherin common room under the guise of study aids that they were allowed to simply copy. And they don't even have to go to the effort of copying them down by hand, Graham Wharton insisted, as he, Ralph, Rose and James squelched back from the greenhouses one particularly blustery day. May I says heard from Ashley Doon that she saw Beetlebrick laughing about it in the library. Corsica's taught them all the duplicitous spell. Ralph frowned into the wind. What's the duplicitous spell? That's ridiculous, Rose shook her head peevishly. That's advanced newt-level transfiguration. Believe me, I've tried it. Ralph glanced from Rose to James, his brow furrowed. It's a copying spell, James shrugged. Transfigures one thing into an exact copy of another, but you have to be touching the thing you want to copy, and it's supposed to be dead difficult. Difficult or not, Graham scoffed, heaving open the castle door and ducking out of the damp wind. Corsica's teaching her Slytherin pets a lot more than herbology, I'll tell you that. As spring finally warmed the air and coaxed the grounds into a lush green patchwork, Quidditch matches progressed from icy tests of endurance to mere frustrating disappointments. Lance Vassar's performance as Gryffindor Seeker was not improved by the warmer weather, and this was even beginning to take its toll on Professor McGonagall, whose love of the game and pride of house were legendary. As firework spells erupted from the new scoreboard in celebration of a Hufflepuff victory, James could hear her angry mutterings even over the noise of the cheering Hufflepuffs. It's one thing to be a good sport, she groused under her breath. It's another thing entirely to serve victory on a ruddy silver platter. What's that, Professor? Deirdre Finnegan asked loudly, craning to look back at McGonagall from the front row of the Gryffindor grandstand. I said good much, McGonagall called tersely, arising from her seat in a swirl of tartan robes. And I'll thank you to keep your ears to yourself. Look at him, Graham shook his head. No new scoreboard is worth that. James sighed as Lance Vassar circled high over the pitch, his right arm raised in a lazy wave. Hovering in front of the goal rings on the far side of the pitch, Devindar Das pressed a hand to his forehead in weary defeat. Heth Thomas and Willow Wisteria, Gryffindor's beaters, both watched Vassar with tight frowns their beta bats dangling at their sides. Rose shook her head. He doesn't love Quidditch. He just loves being seen. I don't think he's even broken a sweat. This is all your fault, James, Deirdre seethed. That should be you out there, not that arrogant little git. True, Scorpius lamented breezily. James would at least lose with proper dejected shame. He's had more practice at it, after all. Rose cuffed Scorpius on the back of the head as they stood. Fortunately for everyone, the international exchange classes provided welcome relief from the burden of homework. Since most of the exchange classes counted simply as credit for muggle studies, students were technically exempted from in-class assignments, although participation was strongly encouraged by Professor Curry, who occasionally sat in on the international classes to judge student performance and involvement. The day she visited James's and Ralph's theoretical arithmetics class at Beaubaton, however, she seemed as baffled as James himself by the enormous abacai and the busy clickety-clack of their coloured beads. Mr. Potter, she said quietly, sidling up to James, who is the teacher of this class? James shook his head. Couldn't say, Professor. We've been at this for months now, and I've never seen anyone that I could say for sure was actually teaching anything. Professor Curry nodded uncertainly. A practical class, then, she said, practising, uh... Quadrant A-8 resolved, Morton Comstock announced proudly, stepping back from his abacus and flexing his fingers. That's a new record. An older Beaubaton girl with long black hair glanced up sharply. Accounting for the temporal distortions from Ursa Major? she asked with the faintest of French accents. Of course, Comstock smiled. Give me a challenge. You shall have it, the dark-haired girl nodded briskly. Join Miss Durand and Mr. Fournier on the Constellations Grid, s'il vous plaît. Moving up to the big time, eh, Potter? Comstock grinned, nudging James with his elbow as he edged past. Professor Curry watched him join two blue-robed students at the front of the gilded and mirrored room. 
"'That boy is from York, is he not?' she asked, trying to keep the incredulity out of her voice. Ralph nodded. "'He's got unique skills.' In the front of the room, Comstock's voice echoed loudly. It's the perimeter mapping level from Cosmic Commando all over again. I defeated that in three hours flat. This should be a piece of cake. Is he... Curry frowned. Is he some sort of space explorer? Do muggles allow their children to do such things? Ralph stifled an uncharacteristic chuckle. He plays games, Professor. Curry nodded, still watching Comstock with her brow furrowed. Fascinating. Is this a prized talent in the muggle community? Ha! Huh? A girl's voice scoffed nearby. James glanced aside and saw Comstock's York classmate, Lucia Gruberova, her dark brown hair done up in her usual sprightly ponytail. She glanced at James and quickly smoothed the derision out of her face before dropping her eyes. Video games are all right, I guess, she said to the floor, but not as good as books, if you ask me. James nodded. He wasn't sure he agreed. He'd never played a muggle video game in his life, but he appreciated that she, like him, seemed to have no love for Morton Comstock. Wednesday's practical prophecy classes at Durmstrang had taken on a distinctly different tone in the absence of Zane, mostly because Nastasha had assumed his place. This provided James a gamut of mixed feelings, ranging from confused annoyance to grudging admiration since, despite her brash Americanness and her day-glow hair, she seemed to have got herself into surprisingly good graces with Professor Avior. James remembered that she had predicted this, as the professor was obviously preoccupied with magical bloodlines, and she herself came from a long line of pure-blood American wizardry. Still, both Ralph and James were consistently surprised to see the hauntingly familiar professor inviting the slight precocious girl to the front of the classroom to assist with mundane class duties or illustrate acts of divination, all of which Nastasha was quite good at. I never would have guessed it, Ralph whispered behind his hand one day as Nastasha used her wand to coax a smoke vision into life over a bright purple candle. But she's, like, totally talented, isn't she? James nodded and then shook his head in wonderment. Nastasha was definitely complicated. In light of their midnight conversation in the Gryffindor common room, at the end of which she had inexplicably kissed him, no one knew better than he just how complicated she was. As he thought this, she met his eyes through the ribbons of enchanted smoke that she had conjured. There was a hard glint in her gaze. She winked at him briefly. Excellent, excellent, Professor Avior complimented, snuffing the candle with a flick of his wand. We have mere minutes before the smoke vision loses its potency. All of you will see something different, but every interpretation should be reliable so long as you apply the eight prophetic principles that we have discussed. Please record your divinations now, and do be quick. Miss Hendricks is, of course, exempt. He patted her lightly on the shoulder as he passed, beginning a slow circuit of the classroom. Quills immediately began to scratch on parchment bobbing furiously over the shoulder of each student. James peered at the ribbons of smoke, attempting to define something from them, but all he could see was Nastasha staring unabashedly back at him through the smoke, her bright eyes watching him, her lips curled in a secret smile. Would she kiss him again with those lips? Did he want her to? He was dismayed that the answers to those questions were far from obvious. His insides seemed to lift at the thought and then dropped precipitously a moment later. It was all so complicated and confusing. He certainly didn't love her. He hardly even liked her. And yet he tore his eyes away from her strangely penetrating stare at her secret little smile. Glancing down, he saw that his quill was pressed to the parchment hard enough to form a tiny bubble of black ink. No visions came to his mind, despite Avior's lecture on the eight prophetic principles. Is your mind a blank, Mr. Potter? Professor Avior asked in a low voice. James glanced up guiltily. The professor stood next to him, his bushy white eyebrows raised inquisitively over his half-moon spectacles, and for a moment James forgot that this was not, in fact, the long-dead Albus Dumbledore. I, he began, and then dropped his gaze again. I can't. Prophetic principle number five, Mr. Potter, the professor said quietly, reassuringly. 
Empty your mind of expectations. You are halfway there. Don't see what you expect to see. See only what is there. James nodded, still staring hard at his blank parchment. He waited. A moment later he sensed the professor drifting away, continuing his circuit about the classroom. James glanced surreptitiously back at him. He didn't just look like Dumbledore. Somehow, some way, he was Dumbledore. Don't see what you expect to see. See only what is there. That, James thought darkly, is much easier said than done. As the traditional spring Hogsmeade weekend approached, a rumour spread among the student populace that Headmaster Grudge intended to cancel it, citing security concerns. James found the possibility of such a ban extremely likely, considering the fact that both incoming and outgoing school post was still being screened by the Headmaster and his trusted inner circle. On the Friday before Hogsmeade weekend, tensions were running very high in the Great Hall, as students awaited some announcement from the head table. It would be just like Headmaster Grudge, James thought, to wait until the final moment to dash everyone's hopes. When the Headmaster did finally stand and approach the podium, there was no need for him to call the dinner assembly to attention. Every eye had already turned towards him, and the tense thrum of conversation died away to expectant silence. Grudge surveyed the room with his expressionless grey eyes, as you know, he began, speaking slowly and with patient emphasis, in light of current international tensions between the wizarding and muggle communities, we have been forced to institute some unfortunate changes to the normal freedoms we have enjoyed within these walls. Here it comes, Scorpius muttered, rolling his eyes. Let me assure you. Grudge went on, raising his voice over a wave of mutinous muttering. No one regrets these changes more than we, your teachers and administrators. Mr. Fitch especially has repeatedly expressed his most heartfelt wish for a return to simpler, bygone days. James glanced towards the rear of the great hall, where Filch stood with Mrs. Norris cradled in the crook of his arm. His cursed cane clutched in his right fist. A tight smile creased his sallow face. The only simpler time he wants to return to, Rose muttered boldly, is the time when he didn't have to hide his tortures under a thin pretense of punishment. This statement was met with a chorus of harsh, disgruntled whispers echoing the noises coming from each of the other tables. However, Grudge continued, and then paused, cocking his narrow head slightly and narrowing his eyes. I do believe it is customary to show the respect of silence when the headmaster is speaking, or am I mistaken, Mr. Filch? This last was addressed to the rear of the hall, where Filch stood watching. Taking mental notes is needed, headmaster, Filch replied in his cracked, wheezing voice. He swept his gaze meaningfully over the house tables, quelling the chorus of whispers and mutterings. In their wake, the entire room rang with a sort of mute, electric anger. However, Grudge said again, lowering his voice to a gravelly monotone, we are not utterly without compassion. Hogsmeade weekends provide a healthy outlet for youthful vigor, one that we, your guardians, would be loath to forbid. As a result, we have determined to allow the tradition to continue as usual. A palpable sense of relief flooded the hall. James glanced at Rose, his eyebrows raised in surprise. Grudge, however, was not finished. We will nonetheless, he said, raising one pale knuckly hand, institute certain reasonable requirements. For instance, only students with no current or scheduled detentions may enjoy the privilege of Hogsmeade weekends. Around the room, a scattering of shoulders slumped and brows furrowed. There were, of course, a large number of students currently scheduled for detention. Furthermore, Grudge went on, we would hate to see any of you fall behind in your studies. Therefore, 
Only students who are current on all homework assignments, including those due the following Monday, will be eligible for the trip to Hogsmeade. Another wave of angry mutterings washed over the room at this, even louder than before. This time, Grudge seemed to allow it. He smiled slowly, indulgently. Professors will be stationed in the courtyard tomorrow morning, ready to accept any outstanding homework assignments and bid you a good trip. Until then, do enjoy your evening, students, he said, spreading his arms in a display of gracious magnanimity. Graham Wharton leaned over the table furiously. He knows Corsica slapped us with a fourteen-inch essay on the uses of Hazel and Elidore. There's no way we can have that done by tomorrow morning. He's setting us up, Deirdre Finnegan agreed hopelessly. Between detentions and homework, there's no way any of us can go to Hogsmeade. That's not entirely true, Scorpius mused, glancing back at the Slytherin table. None of them look particularly unhappy, do they? James followed Scorpius's gaze and saw that it was true. Ralph, Trenton Block, and Albus sat near the head of the table, their heads together in hushed conversation. Along the rest of the Slytherin table, however, students were grinning, talking animatedly, even offering each other congratulatory nods and backslaps. Looks like it's true that Professor Corsica is giving her house a little helping hand with their herbology assignments, Scorpius sighed. I told you! Graham exclaimed. We should tell McGonagall. Rose shook her head derisively. Don't be an idiot. We don't have any proof. Even if she believed us, Tabitha would just deny it, turning that infuriating charm of hers up to full power. Here Rose sat up straight, widened her eyes in a parody of wounded innocence, and adopted a tone of oily sweetness. Why, Professor McGonagall, I would never endanger the academic development of my students by providing them with answers. That would be unethical. Deirdre snorted despite herself. That's totally what Corsica would say. And the thing is, everyone would know she was lying. Just like everyone would know there was no way to prove it, Scorpius added. Maybe we're looking at this all wrong, James said, narrowing his eyes thoughtfully as he gazed across the great hall. I don't see how, Graham groused. No fourteen-inch herbology essay, no made. You have another way of looking at it? Have you ever heard the phrase? James asked, a rueful smile breaking on his face. If you can't beat them, join them. The next morning, James, Scorpius, and Rose shuffled into the rather short queue of students lining up in the courtyard. She's totally going to know what we did, James muttered. Several places ahead of them, Albus glanced back pointedly, his brow lowered. Who cares if she knows? Scorpius shrugged. What can she do about it? If she accepts the essays from Albus and Ralph, she'll have to accept them from us, even if she knows we somehow winkled them. She'll know it was Albus, Rose murmured tensely. Ralph says she refused to teach him the duplicitous spell. My guess is that she still peeved at him from our first year when he turned on her and her stupid progressive element cronies. Deedle probably couldn't work the duplicitous spell even if she did teach him, Scorpius commented. With that hulking wand of his, he'd probably duplicate the entire castle right on top of us all. Rose stamped her foot angrily. Oh, I can't believe I let you talk me into this, she hissed. I've never cheated before in my entire life. I feel so filthy. James nudged her. Let it go already. It's not cheating if Corsica is allowing her own house to do it. We're just, you know, leveling the playing field. Just because cheating is second nature to you, Rose seethed. I should have given my copy to Graham. He was furious we couldn't get him one. Scorpius shushed both of them as Albus stepped forward to meet Tabitha Corsica. She smiled at him from behind a pair of stylish tortoiseshell sunglasses and held out her hand. He placed a roll of parchment into it and glanced back at James again, his face pinched in anger. Corsica nodded at Albus without opening the parchment. He hunched his shoulders and stumped ahead, joining Ralph by the courtyard gate. This is it, Rose whined in a shrill whisper. I can't do this. It's embarrassing. It's not worth it. Miss Weasley, Corsica called lightly. You have something for me? Rose hesitated, glancing back at James with a look of agonized indecision. 
Finally, she stalked forward and stabbed out her fist, handing Corsica a roll of parchment. Very nice, Miss Weasley. You always were a quick study, Corsica admitted, her sunglasses glinting in the sunlight. In a lower voice, she added, How nice you found a way to compensate for the challenges of your heritage. And what exactly is that supposed to mean? Rose demanded. Nothing, James blurted out, anxious to get the affair over and avoid confrontation. I think I'm next, Professor. Corsica turned to him, and her pleasant smile fell away. James Potter, she said suspiciously. What are you? She glanced suddenly back at Rose. This is very unbecoming of you, Miss Weasley, assisting others in this fashion. Oh, does that sort of thing offend you, Professor? Rose asked archly. I wouldn't have guessed. Corsica's expression hardened. I'll have you before Mr. Filch in a heartbeat, my dear, she growled. Rose grinned viciously. Maybe you should take a look at James's essay before you do that, Professor. Corsica paused, her neat eyebrows lowering behind her sunglasses. She turned back to James and held out her hand. James stepped forward nervously and placed his parchment onto her palm. Without looking away from him, she ripped off the wax seal and unrolled it. Only then did she glance down at it and freeze. "'What do you think, Professor?' Rose asked sweetly. "'Should we go and talk to Mr. Filch? Perhaps we should suggest he take a look at all of the essays that have been handed in so far.' Corsica slowly re-rolled the parchment, her face carefully expressionless. She glared at Rose for a long, thoughtful moment. To Rose's credit, she did not flinch from that gaze. In fact, she returned it. Enjoy your day, students, Corsica said, suddenly, brightly, and congratulations on your resourcefulness. Thanks, Professor, Scorpius replied easily, handing her his copy of the essay with a slight bow. Rose didn't seem prepared to let the matter go, however. James grabbed her by the elbow and began to tug her towards the gates. Rose followed reluctantly. Just inside the gate, she stopped and whirled back. By the way, Professor, she called out, in the second paragraph, hellebore is not used for making the elixir of harmony. That would be the draft of peace. I'll assume you'll grade my essay accordingly. Corsica's face paled despite the streaming sunlight. She seemed to gather herself for a retort, drawing up to her full height. Before she could, however, James dragged Rose around the edge of the gate. They joined Albus, Ralph, and Scorpius as they darted onto the path towards Hogsmeade. Corsica's totally gonna kill me, Albus raged as they ran. Now hand it over. James nodded and dug in his jeans pocket, producing a folded envelope addressed to their parents. Albus took it, examined it critically for a moment, and then brandished his wand. With a flourish, he tapped the envelope and made it vanish in a puff of fiery ash. If you ever threaten to tell Mum and Dad how that Grindylo got into their laundry hamper again, I'll swear I'll make ten copies of myself and pound you into next year. Forget that, James panted, glancing aside at Rose as she fumed. After what she said to Corsica back there, she's the only one whose bad side I'm worried about getting on. After the stresses, misadventures, and painfully unanswered questions of the previous few months, that day in Hogsmeade was a blissfully welcome respite. James, Ralph, Albus, Scorpius, and Rose spent the entire morning leisurely browsing the shops lining the high street, including stopovers in Gladrags, where Ralph purchased a new spring cloak with Christmas money he had received from his grandfather on his deceased mother's side, Dervish and Bangs, where they spent many awed minutes examining the new Thunderstreak Limited, which, according to the flashing sign in the window, came equipped with its own anti-inertia charms and slipstream enchantment and Scriven shafts, where James, Scorpius, and Albus finally got bored waiting for Rose and Ralph, abandoning them in front of a display of self-inking quills while they stole across the street to Honeydukes. Half an hour later, pockets bulging with fizzing whisbies, jelly slugs, and pepper imps, the fivesome made their way to the three broomsticks for a late lunch. There they ran into a gaggle of Slytherins clustered raucously around a large table. Several Slytherin girls glared suspiciously at Ralph and Albus. Queen and Clarissa, Ralph moaned, trying rather pathetically to hide behind James. They totally hate me. They don't hate you, Ralph, Albus said reassuringly. 
They just think you're a big dumb oaf and a traitor to your magical heritage, that's all. That's loads better, Ralph sighed, trying to hide his face behind the collar of his new cloak. Albus waved heartily at the table of Slytherins. Hey, everybody, just slumming it with the brother and cousin Weasley. You can pick your friends, but you're stuck with the family you dealt, right? Most of the Slytherins seemed to relax at this, their suspicious glares melting into crooked smiles. Albus ducked towards their table and threw an arm each over the shoulders of Beetlebrick and the tall girl called Clarissa. He whispered something to them. As he did, the Slytherins glanced furtively back at James, Rose, and Scorpius, where they gathered near the bar. What did you tell them? Ralph asked as Albus returned. I told them you were building up confidences, so James and Scorpius here would let slip with the Gryffindor Quidditch playbook for next match. Not that it matters, he added, elbowing James in the ribs. You lot are about as threatening as a sack of dead hawk lumps, what with that git Vassar chasing the snitch. As the sun began to lower and gusty winds pushed a low blanket of clouds overhead, dimming the streets and cooling the air, James, Rose, and Scorpius parted from Albus and Ralph, who prudently decided to rejoin their Slytherin fellows. Reluctant to return to the castle just yet, they made their way to Weasley's Wizard Wheezes for their favourite stop of the trip. Uncle George met them at the counter and called Ted Lupin from the back room to join them. There, in hushed tones, the students described the latest happenings at Hogwarts, up to and including the new restrictions on Hogsmeade weekends, which they had narrowly bypassed. It was bad enough with Umbridge, George scowled, his usually jovial face dark. She was vicious and deluded, but she seemed to truly believe she was operating for the good of the wizarding world. Fred once told me he thought it was better to live with an outright tyrant like Voldy than with a psychotic do-gooder like Umbridge. But giving Filch that kind of authority... He shook his head slowly. He's neither an all-powerful tyrant or a deluded crusader. He's a petty bully who's suddenly been given a license to hurt people. Why would Grudge do such a thing? Maybe for the same reason he's told all the teachers to pile on the schoolwork. James said, narrowing his eyes. It's a distraction. Maybe he's trying to keep us all so busy that we don't have time to ask questions, to look around, to see what's going on right under our noses. Ted shook his head in frustration. But what is going on? Do you lot have any idea? Because the rest of us sure bloody don't. Between the assassination of the American vice president, the collapse of the laws of secrecy all over the world, and your dad getting frozen out of everything going on in his own office at the Ori Department, the old world is just a big, confusing mess. Rose shrugged helplessly. It doesn't get any clearer on our side. There is some demented wizard in New Amsterdam, calls himself the Collector, who apparently is the new American Vice President, although Uncle Harry says there's nothing he can do about it except try to warn the Magical Integration Bureau, and those blokes don't tend to trust him much. Not to mention the fact, Scorpius added in a low voice, that this collector person seems to be working on a magical superweapon called the Morrigan Web, which everyone agrees is pretty awful, even if they have no idea what it does or if it's even possible. James opened his mouth to remind them that the mysterious Durmstrang Professor Avior was, according to Rose's investigations, supposedly one of the world's only experts on the Morrigan Web. For some reason, however, he hesitated and then closed his mouth again. Rose saw this and frowned slightly. The difference between Umbridge's time and now, George exclaimed tensely, is that back then we had the Order of the Phoenix. Rose blinked at him. But just this past Christmas, she said, dropping her voice to a secretive near whisper, at Grimmauld Place, wasn't that the Order reconvened? George barked a harsh, mirthless laugh. Oh, I suppose you could call it that. But look at us. Me, a jokester who never even finished me schooling. A half-giant who was forbidden for half of his adult life from even using magic. Bloody Draco Malfoy. <laughs> Sorry, Scorpius. I mean, your dad's helpful in his own way, but, well, there's a lot of history there. Scorpius shrugged and looked away. The most powerful person there is your dad, James, George went on staring down at his own clenched fist. And he's been stripped of any influence he might have, sent off on pointless busy work, trotted out like some kind of tamed animal. They're embarrassed of him at the ministry. George, 
Ted said. I don't think it's true, though, George insisted stubbornly, meeting Ted's eyes. And the sooner we all realise it, the better. The Order of the Phoenix is a pathetic shadow of what it once was. It's an insult to keep the name. Where's Sirius Black? Forgive me, Ted, but where are Remus Lupin and Nymphadora Tonks? Where is my brother Fred? He looked around suddenly, switching his gaze from face to face, as if literally looking for those long-departed heroes. Gone. Every one of them. Gone. Like Dumbledore, the one we all rallied behind. The one who made it seem like, against all odds, there was always a slim chance, always a shred of hope. Where is Dumbledore? Is he coming back? Uncle George's eyes looked very naked as they probed James's face. Finally, slowly, the ginger-haired man shook his head. No, regardless of the drunken conspiracies that get tossed around at the Og's Head, regardless of what some of us whisper to each other to keep hope alive, Albus Dumbledore isn't coming back. There's a power-mongering crackpot sitting in his chair in their master's office. He sighed deeply and dropped his gaze. Dumbledore died, and the Order of the Phoenix died with him. Rose stared at her uncle, her face set in a mask of stubborn defiance. Hope isn't dead, she said quietly. Hope is never dead. Uncle George didn't look up. Ted met Rose's eyes and nodded at her. Silently, he stepped around the counter and led the three students towards the door. Don't be too hard on your uncle, he said, leading them out onto the footpath as he stood in the doorway. It's a dark time, and it's reminded him of everything he lost. I don't think any of us can understand what it means to him. James looked puzzled. But you lost both your mum and dad at the Battle of Hogwarts. Ted sighed. Believe me, James, I know. But I was just a baby. I didn't know him. I miss him, sure, but it's like missing a place you can't remember ever being. It's just a curiously shaped hole in me heart with nothing in it. But George, he shrugged helplessly. He was a twin. He lost half of himself. He knows what used to be in that hole. He lives with that awareness every day. James considered this as he peered back through the open door of Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. Uncle George still stood behind the counter, not looking up. He seemed not even to have moved. Goodbye, Uncle George, Rose called gently, raising a hand. George did look up then and nodded farewell. James expected to see tears in his uncle's eyes, but there weren't. He almost wished there had been. Somehow tears would have been better than the blank, calm deadness he saw there instead. Something moved in a back corner of the store, flitting behind a display of exploding wands. James only just saw it as the door swung shut. A figure in a dark robe, the hood pulled up to shadow the face. The figure seemed to turn towards him. A moment later, the glass door closed, and Ted stood just inside, waving goodbye and blocking the view. Did you see? James asked, cocking his head and pointing vaguely. What? Rose asked hollowly. James considered it and then shook his head. Nothing, I guess. There were plenty of people in Hogsmeade who preferred to keep their identities hidden beneath cowls and hoods. Granted, most of them lurked in the hog's head or dim corners of the three broomsticks, but it was possible that one of them had need of a bag of dung bombs or a nose-biting teacup. He turned away and began to follow Rose and Scorpius, heading away from the lowering sunset. Silently, the three made their way along the high street, past the two-story newsstand and its rooftop newscaster, who seemed to be closing up for the night, and on to an angled side street leading out of the village. We're being followed, Scorpius said conversationally. What? James asked, glancing back. Don't look back, you clumsy burk, Scorpius chided calmly. Just keep walking and don't let on. Rose hugged herself against the increasingly chilly wind. How do you know we're being followed? One does not grow up a Malfoy without learning something about subterfuge, Scorpius admitted with a note of pride. Long shadows along the high street followed ours for the last few minutes, two of them. When we turned, I saw their reflections in the window of the ironworks back there. They're wearing long robes and hoods. A wave of coldness fell over James as he walked. I saw one of them back at Uncle George's shop, 
They were hiding in a corner. Rose gasped. Listening in on us, do you think? Why didn't you say anything? I started to, James rasped nervously. But it didn't seem like anything much at the time. Hogsmeade is loaded with dodgy-looking characters, isn't it? Scorpius shushed them tersely. In a moment we're going to cross Gudimata Avenue, he said, nodding faintly towards the next intersection. The sun is setting along it. Follow me closely when we get there. James held his breath as the three students walked along, maintaining an infuriatingly casual pace. As they neared the corner, Scorpius gazed idly about, angling into the shadow of a low awning. The moment he stepped out into the blazing copper sunset, however, he dodged to the right, disappearing around the corner onto Gadimata Avenue. James grabbed Rose's arm and pulled her around the corner as well, dashing to follow Scorpius. Immediately, Scorpius pressed himself back against the brick wall and clutched his wand against his chest. James scrambled to brandish his as well. Rose stretched out her arm, her own wand already protruding from her fist. Two robed figures ran out into the narrow junction, casting about and raising their arms to block the rays of the low, blinding sunset. Expelliarmus! Rose and James cried at once. Scorpius, however, called a different spell. No wands flew from the hands of the robed figures, despite the fact that both James and Rose had hit them squarely with the disarming spell. Instead, both figures spiralled up into the air, flipped upside down so that their robes fell down around their heads. James boggled at the dangling figures where they hung in mid-air. Levicorpus, he exclaimed, glancing aside at Scorpius. Not Expelliarmus! They don't have wands, Scorpius sighed, shaking his head. He stepped forward and tugged at the robe around the head of the nearest figure, who was struggling uselessly in the air. James noticed that the clothing beneath their robes was decidedly non-threatening. The stockier one wore jeans and a striped rugby shirt. The other seemed to be a thin girl in green capris and a grey T-shirt. Lucia Gruberova! Rose exclaimed in a shocked voice as Scorpius yanked the robe away from the girl's head. But how? Why? I demand you put me down, a muffled voice commanded. James recognized the nasally haughtiness of Morton Comstock struggling under his inverted robe. Let them down, Scorpius, he said, pocketing his wand. They're obviously harmless. How did you know? Scorpius flicked his wand at Lucia and Comstock, flipping them over and dropping them messily to their feet. I said they were following us, he drawled lazily. I didn't say they were any good at it. Rose moved towards Lucia, helping to straighten her dishevelled robes. But how did you even get here? Hogsmeade is unplottable. No muggle can get inside. I don't know what unplottable means, Comstock said, poking his head angrily back out of his must hood. But all we did was pop through the cabinet this morning and follow the lot of you. It wasn't exactly difficult. It couldn't have been that easy, James insisted. How'd you get past Tabitha Corsica and the rest of the teachers in the courtyard? We didn't go by way of the courtyard, genius, Comstock sneered. We ducked through the halls and went out the back way. The old rotunda entrance, Rose shook her head. Nobody was guarding that, of course. James frowned. So why didn't we just go that way? Because Filch kept a census of everyone who didn't have a pass for Hogsmeade, Rose sighed briskly. If we went missing without reason, he'd pile us with so much detention we'd never be heard from again. Or maybe you were just too thick to think of it, Comstock countered. Leave it to us muggles to be better sneaks than the lot of you. Shut up, Morton, Lucia exclaimed breathlessly. We're only following them back now because you forgot how we came. Rose smiled ruefully. That's unplottability for you. The magic may be weakening along with the laws of secrecy, but you couldn't just walk out of here without having somebody lead you. You'd have ended up going in circles all night. But why come here at all? James asked Lucia, ignoring Comstock. What made it worth the risk? Lucia stared at James in disbelief for a moment, and then shook her head wonderingly. Are you serious? It's Hogsmeade. I've been reading about it since I was a kid, but never dared to dream it was real. And then this school year starts, and we find out that everything we read about really happened, that those places exist, and 
and we're the first muggles ever to be allowed to know about it. How could I resist sneaking in and seeing it all for myself? Can't you even imagine how jealous my friends back home would be? Gretchen Plotz would have a litter of kittens. That would teach her not to invite me to her stupid birthday party. Like I'd want to go anyway, the shallow little minx. Not that I can tell her about any of this, of course. She wasn't chosen for the exchange program. But soon enough, maybe the whole world will know about this, and, and then, well, sorry. She suddenly clamped her mouth shut, apparently deciding she had said too much. Comstock shook his head. I'm just here because I was hoping I might find something in this mad backwards world of yours worth getting excited about. Seriously, you have a world of magic at your disposal, and you send messages around in little notes tied to the legs of owls? That's the best you can do? They have the flu network, you dolt, Lucia exclaimed, unable to stop herself. And port keys and, and disapparation? She glanced back at James. That's a real thing, right? Disapparation? Uh, James stammered. Uh, uh, yeah, but, like, none of us knows how to do it yet. Speak for yourself, Scorpius muttered. Rose shook her head impatiently. Regardless, we really should be getting back. You can follow us out if you like, but don't you dare get caught with us. It'd mean more trouble for us than either of you are worth. Comstock grunted his agreement and sullenly followed as Rose and Scorpius struck off once again, heading out of the village. I didn't mean to overhear your conversation, Lucia said apologetically, sidling next to James as they neared the forest. Morton wanted to wait for you in the alley across the street, but uh, I, I couldn't resist getting a peek inside Weasley's wizard wheezes. James shrugged. Was it everything you'd hoped? Actually, Lucia frowned thoughtfully. I'm not sure it was. She glanced aside at him guiltily and added, I mean, it was great and all. If I had any wizarding money, I definitely would have bought something. But after imagining it for so long, it was, well, sort of... She fluttered her hands vaguely. Normal, uh, I guess. You expected something different. Oh, I, I don't know. Lucia covered her face with both hands for a moment. When she lowered them, she struggled to compose herself. I I'm not like Morton. He's got about as much imagination as a brick. My problem is that I have maybe, maybe uh, just a bit too much imagination. It's nobody's fault that things sometimes don't live up to what I imagine. James nodded. I guess I can understand that. Lucia glanced aside at him gratefully as they angled into the dense shadows of the forest path. Sometimes it's a good thing that things turn out to be more normal than I expect. I, I mean, look at us. Here I am, walking along with, I can barely bring myself to say it, the son of Harry Potter. She said the name with such reverence that James couldn't help grinning aside at her. But you, you're not at all too much or anything, she went on quickly. I, I can talk to you. You're totally normal, just a real, everyday person who, who happens to be the son of... of... James nodded, his grin turning wry. I know, I know. Believe me, it hasn't always been fun, but yeah, we're still just a normal family with normal problems and stuff. Oh, I doubt that, Lucia enthused. But still, it's so cool that you would say that. James blinked at her, still smiling vaguely. I guess so. They walked for a while in silence, following the darkening silhouettes of Morton Comstock, Rose, and Scorpius. The forest spread away in all directions, falling into gloom as the sun dipped beneath the horizon. Overhead, wind threaded through the tree branches, rattling them and pushing a ceiling of low, dense clouds. So, Lucia asked, dropping her voice slightly, is it really true that some people... Think that he's coming back? James glanced aside at Lucia in the dimness. You mean Dumbledore? She nodded, her eyes bright with interest. A, a lot of my friends never believed that he really died. They just couldn't accept it, thought that he faked it somehow, or that the phoenix symbol that flew overhead at his funeral somehow meant he was going to come back to life. 
that's what phoenixes do after all, isn't it? But, of course, we all just thought they were stories. Now that I know Dumbledore was a real person, well, I guess even in the wizarding world, dead is dead, right? James hesitated before answering. Lucia drew a quick breath and went on, warming to the subject. B but even when I thought all of this was just a story, I never believed Dumbledore would come back. Not the way my friends thought he would. J.K. R uh, she caught herself and smiled guiltily at James. Uh, I mean, Professor Revalvier. She would never pull any cheap trick like that, bringing back a character we, we all thought had really died. Even if the readers really wanted it, it would seem cheap somehow. But do you want to know what I always thought? This last she asked in a hushed voice, caught between embarrassment and excitement. Her dark eyes glimmered in the twilight. I always thought Dumbledore would come back as a ghost. A sudden wind whipped past the five students, wickering in the trees and carrying dead leaves into the air like startled birds. James wished they hadn't allowed Rose, Scorpius, and Comstock to get so far ahead. It would make sense, don't you think? Lucia asked, ignoring the quickening wind and dark. He died so suddenly, with so much left to do. That's what makes ghosts, right? Unfinished business? And I'll tell you something else. She leaned close to James and lowered her voice to a secretive whisper. I think he'd come back angry. James nearly stumbled on the path. He turned towards Lucia, strangely dismayed at what she'd said. She blinked at the expression on his face and straightened. A moment later, both of them bumped straight into Scorpius and Rose, who had stopped on the path. Why are we stopping? Comstock asked impatiently from several paces ahead. Shh! Rose hissed, raising a hand. Voices! James recovered himself from his collision with Rose and took a step back, listening hard. All he could hear was the rustle of the wind high in the trees and the wicker of dead leaves skirling along the path. And then, in a lull between gusts, there it was. A low mutter, a voice in the directionless distance. Are the students coming back from Hogsmeade? James asked querulously. Maybe it's even Albus and his Slytherin mates. They could be playing a trick on us. That's an adult, Scorpius said, shaking his head slowly. A man. I can't understand what he's saying, Rose whispered, frowning with concentration. James shivered as the wind threaded through his hair again. Why can't we ever come back from Hogsmeade without having some stupid adventure? Shh! Rose shushed him again. But the voice seemed to have drifted away. Silence filled the lulls between windy gusts. James glanced around for some sign of the speaker. The forest seemed suddenly alive with subtle motion, rattling branches, dancing tall grass, waving bushes and vines. Over there, Lucia suddenly proclaimed in a small, strained voice. She pointed into a dense thicket of trees. What? Rose asked, dropping her own voice to a harsh whisper. Lucia shook her head. Something moved. Something walking along, I think. There was a flutter of robes. It, it's gone now. Scorpius sighed briskly. Come on, let's get back. There's nothing in these woods to be afraid of. Except the giant spiders, Lucia squeaked. There's hardly any of them left, Rose said reassuringly. And the centaurs, Lucia suggested. Rose nodded consideringly. Plenty of those still. Not to mention the trees, James thought, but didn't say. Since Merlin's return, many of the spirits of the trees, the dryads, had awoken, and not all of them, James knew from experience, were especially friendly. He glanced up at the creaking, moaning limbs high overhead. Too bad Merlin was no longer here to ward them away, to keep their age-old wildness in check. And then, out of the corner of his eye, James saw it as well, a flutter of robes, the suggestion of a swift, silent pace cutting through the densest part of the forest. He whipped his head towards it, but it was already gone. Lucia's right, he announced quietly. There's someone over there, on our right. Scorpius paused mid-step. James saw that he had his wand in his hand. He fingered it speculatively. 
A moment later, the blond boy stalked off the path, pushing through the weeds and brush. Where's he going? Comstock demanded. Scorpius, Rose called nervously. A moment later, she squared her shoulders, whipped out her own wand, and trotted after him. This is ridiculous, James grumbled in exasperation. To Lucia, he said, stay on the path, we'll be back in a minute. No chance, Lucia cried, jumping to follow James as he dodged into the trees. I'm not standing there in the open with some thing wandering around out there. I'll stick by the people with the wands, thank you very much. Hurry it up, you lot, Comstock called in an annoyed voice. James ducked through the brush, catching up to Rose and Scorpius, with Lucia following close behind. Fortunately, the increasing wind filled the entire forest with a cacophony of creaking limbs, shushing leaves, and clattering branches, covering the noise of their tromp through the underbrush. And sure enough, after only a hundred feet, they saw the figure. It crested a low hill ahead of them, flitting calmly through the trees, its cloak fluttering behind its peaked hat bent rakishly in the wind. Lucia froze in place at the sight of it. I is it a ghost? she begged, her voice reduced to a terrified rasp. James shook his head, but he couldn't truly be sure. Whoever or whatever it is, Scorpius said, forging ahead brazenly, they're headed towards Hogwarts. Rose nodded. But off the main path, they don't want to be seen. Scorpius? James called as the boy trotted forward. What are you going to do if you catch him? Stop him and demand to know what he's up to? Sneaking around in the Forbidden Forest on a stormy night? Scorpius glanced back for a moment, meeting James's eye consideringly. I suppose that's exactly what I'll do, he nodded. Standing between them, Rose looked from Scorpius to James, her expression tense. After a moment, James nodded. Lucia grabbed James's arm and giggled nervously. I guess this is pretty exciting, isn't it? Together the four broke into a run, threading noisily through the valley and up the crest of the hill. James saw the glittering lights of the castle emerge through the trees as they thrashed forward, dodging low branches and jumping over mossy logs. Scorpius reached the crest of the hill first. James saw him as only a dark shape against the dusky sky, stumbling between the trees where they had last spied the skulking figure. A moment later, Scorpius's silhouette dipped away. Rose followed, dropping over what seemed to be a rocky ledge. James clambered after her, Lucia still gripping his arm tightly, panting next to him. The hill ended in a steep slope, leading James and Lucia down a narrow, crooked path into darkness. At the bottom, they ran into Scorpius and Rose, who had lit their wands against the nearly impenetrable shadows. Where is he? James asked between panting breaths. Scorpius shook his head, raising his wand higher. A squat, pale structure glowed faintly ahead, surrounded by dense trees, but illuminated by the magical light. Silently, the four students crept towards it. James held his breath. The structure was like a tiny cottage, made of perfect slabs of white marble, flat on top, set like a jewel in a neatly trimmed lawn. Beyond the structure, the woods parted, revealing the dark face of the lake and a panorama of drifting clouds. Huddled together, the four circled the structure, moving silently onto its broad, flat lawn. Scorpius's wand light illuminated a copper door, aged to a dull green, set with a single, thick window. Over the door, engraved on a stone slab that stretched across the breadth of the structure, was an inscription. Albus, Percival, Wolfric, Brian, Dumbledore. It's his tomb, Lucia breathed. The white tomb. Scorpius turned away and shone his wand all around the immaculate lawn, the framing trees, the dark waves of the lake. Gone, he proclaimed in an annoyed voice. Whoever it was, they aren't here. Rose moved alongside James and shook her head. This is totally creepy she said in a low, annoyed voice. Lucia nodded her agreement. Hey! a voice suddenly called, echoing over the hill behind the tomb. Even through the windy dark and the evident panic, James recognized Comstock's voice. It rose again, thin with distance. Hey! You lot need to come here and right quick! 
Don't leave me alone with this! What's wrong with him now? Scorpius muttered, even as he turned and began to run back towards the tomb. Rose followed, dashing into the shadow of the woods. We'd better go with them, James sighed. It's best if we all stay together. Lucia gripped James's arm with such sudden, painful ferocity that he startled, glancing aside at her. Her face was wide-eyed with terror, gazing mutely back towards the white tomb. James turned back. The tomb's copper door was wide open, revealing a standing figure. Even in the dimness, James recognized the cloak and peaked hat of the man they'd been following. Only now he could see the figure's face, the narrow, crooked nose, the snowy beard. Stormlight glinted from the man's half-moon spectacles as he glared back at them. It's him, Lucia quavered, raising a trembling, pointing hand. It's Dumbledore! But James knew better, even amidst the startled fear that fell over him like a shroud. It wasn't Albus Dumbledore. Or if it was, it wasn't only Albus Dumbledore. It was Avior Dorchaskathan. Avior's stern grey eyes met James's over the windy distance. Lightning flashed, flooding the neat lawn and illuminating the tomb as if it was made of white fire. When darkness fell again, James blinked. The copper door was closed, its single window black and empty. No figure stood there. Tell me I didn't really see that? Lucia asked in a high, faint voice. James shook his head slowly. I wish I could, he replied, the steady wind batting his words away into the darkness. Believe me, I really wish I could. Chapter 13 Dead Warlock's Clue Comstock continued to yell, allowing the others to follow the sound of his voice through the dense trees. James and Lucia caught up to Rose and Scorpius as they neared the main path. You can shut it now, Scorpius called wearily. We're right here. About bleeding time, Comstock shrilled as the others met him in a small, weed-choked clearing. I got sick of waiting for you and decided to try to follow you. Made it all this way, did you? Scorpius said, spying the path only a dozen yards away. Rose plucked a twig out of her thick hair. Really, Comstock, there's nothing to be afraid of this close to the castle. Is that so? Comstock countered wildly. Maybe you ought to try telling that to him. He pointed to a dark hollow where two fallen logs poked from the brush. James gasped in surprise, realizing that the shapes weren't logs at all, but a pair of legs clad in dark trousers, ending in a pair of natty black shoes tilted akimbo towards the sky. Lucia let out a little scream and clamped her hands over her mouth. Rose grabbed Scorpius's sleeve in both fists, her eyes bulging in the darkness. Who is it? she asked weakly. Bloody hell if I know! Comstock quavered. I tripped over his legs on the way into the clearing. Do you hear me? I tripped over a dead man's legs. We don't know for sure that he's dead, James suggested faintly, approaching the body with great reluctance. Lumos! His wand flared a light, revealing the man's face. It stared blankly up from the weeds, the mouth open slightly. A black beetle trundled slowly across the man's forehead. He's dead. Scorpius confirmed with a nod. Comstock spluttered and ran both hands through his bristly hair. Is this, you know, common for you magical types? Finding dead people willy-nilly under bushes and stuff? Because it sure blooming isn't where I come from. Shut up, Morton, Lucia said gently, putting an arm over his shoulders and turning him away from the sight. Rose renewed her grip on Scorpius's sleeve. We need to go for help, she said firmly. Back to the castle. Professor McGonagall will know what to do. Hold on. James suddenly frowned, lowering his wand over the dead man's face. I know this bloke. Scorpius leaned closer as well, dragging a reluctant rose along with him. Never seen him before myself. Are you sure? James nodded slowly. I am. How could I forget? He nearly killed me with my own wand last summer, out in the North Sea. Rose stared hard at the dead man's face and then looked back at James. You mean the man who escaped from Azkaban? 
The specialist in dark magical weapons and curses? Warlick, James said with grave certainty. He shuddered. I never thought I'd see him again. Scorpius extricated himself from Rose's grip and knelt next to the body. Bring your wand lower, Potter, he said, pushing aside the weeds and opening the dead warlock's robes. Scorpius, James said, repulsed. What are you doing? This is the bloke that might have been helping the Collector with his big magical superweapon, right? Scorpius explained impatiently. The one who's now the new American vice president? What do you think I'm doing? Rooting around for spare galleons? I'm searching for clues. Shouldn't... James gulped. Shouldn't we, you know, leave that to the professionals? Scorpius's eyes were bright in the wand light. You mean, like, grudge? I mean my dad. Your dad's out of the loop, Potter. Scorpius rolled his eyes. I thought you knew that. My father told me all about it. No one in the ministry trusts Harry Potter anymore, he says. They've unofficially handed all aura operations over to that great brute Titus Hardcastle. Honestly, do I really need to be the one to tell you these things? James pressed his lips together in mingled fear and anger. He did know these things, of course. It was just very difficult to accept. He shook his head and gestured with his wand. Fine, do it, but be quick about it. What's he doing? Comstock demanded from behind them. This is a crime scene. Don't you know never to interfere with a crime scene? Rose, Scorpius muttered tensely, rummaging through the dead man's clothes. Tell me you know some memory charms. You know I don't, Rose rasped. We're not even allowed to practice them. Just because there's the chance you might accidentally wipe someone's mind totally blank? She fumed and then shrugged. I'll go and talk to Lucia and Comstock. Tell them to keep this quiet. Aha, Scorpius muttered, plucking a wand from Warlick's inner pocket. Never even got it out. You think someone killed him? James asked breathlessly. Scorpius shot him a scornful look. He sure didn't die of ugly. Somebody cursed him, and he wasn't expecting it. Otherwise, I'd have found this in his hand. He waggled the dead man's wand. The voices we heard, James said, realization dawning on him. The figure we saw earlier. Maybe they were having a secret meeting and things turned sour. Scorpius returned to his search of the body. Or the other guy who got what he needed and decided to get rid of a possible witness. Makes the most sense, really. James realized he was shivering. Your mind is a pretty scary place, Scorpius. And that reminds me. This your wand? You told us he stole yours when he got away from Azkaban. James peered at it and shook his head. No. He was secretly glad. The idea of getting his old wand back from a corpse was extremely unsettling. Hold on. The blond boy cocked his head as he stuffed the dead man's wand back into his robes. What's this? What now? James demanded, vaguely dreading the answer. Scorpius withdrew a neatly folded newspaper from Warlick's robe pocket. James recognized it as a copy of the Daily Prophet. Scorpius studied it for a long moment as he knelt next to the body. Finally, he lowered it and climbed to his feet, his eyes narrowed thoughtfully. What? James repeated, holding out his free hand for the paper. Scorpius handed it to him and turned back to the others. Lowering his wand, James read the headline that the newspaper had been folded to reveal. Ministry confirms. Hogwarts to host Magical Muggle Quidditch Summit. The headline had been circled several times in red ink. James unfolded the newspaper to reveal the photograph that went with the headline. A grainy image of Headmaster Grudge shook hands with Minister of Magic Loquacious Knapp. Between them stood the Muggle Prime Minister, his eyes flicking from Grudge to Knapp and then up out of the photograph at James. His practiced smile looked a bit frayed about the edges. The caption beneath the photo ran, Muggle government officials worldwide to witness firsthand the benign nature of the wizarding world. Knapp, what better than a Hogwarts Quidditch final? Fine, James heard Comstock saying behind him. Your business is your business. I don't care. Just get us out of here. Was he? Lucia asked a bit hopefully. You know, like a bad guy? Bad enough, Scorpius concurred. Come on, 
will lead you back to the castle. From there you can make your own way to the rotunda entrance. After that you're on your own. Unhappily so, Comstock said truculently. Let's just get this over with. James, Rose called as they turned back to the path. I'm not coming back with you, James announced suddenly, refolding the newspaper. Rose stopped and peered back at him in the darkness. What do you mean, not coming back? Look, he said briskly, stepping forward to rejoin the others. Scorpius found this on Warlick. It's a daily prophet story about some big meeting between magical and muggle governments from all over the world, set to happen right here at Hogwarts. He handed the newspaper to Rose, who opened it, and scanned the headline by the light of his wand. The Quidditch final, she frowned thoughtfully. But why show that to a bunch of muggle world leaders? To prove we're harmless, Scorpius answered simply. Look what we do with our magic world. We chase flying balls around a pitch on brooms. Nothing to be afraid of here. Feel free to sign some treaties and agreements. Lucia stepped away from Comstock, her brow furrowed. But why would some bad wizard be running around the forest with, with that newspaper clipping in his pocket? Because, James sighed reluctantly, we're not all harmless. He's a warlock, Rose said thoughtfully, realization darkening her face. He may well have helped create the Morrigan Web, the mythical doomsday weapon of the magical world. All that his partners needed was the perfect place to set it off. James nodded and held up the newspaper. He found the perfect place. If they succeed, they can wipe out muggle and magical leaders from all over the world in one swipe. Leaving those positions open to be conveniently filled by an assortment of plotting witches and wizards, Scorpius added a note of something like admiration in his voice. That explains why the Collector wormed his way into the American Vice Presidency. If he succeeds in knocking off the President, he'll be next in line. It's the ultimate dark wizard endgame, complete rule over the Muggle world. Quite brilliant, actually. But, Lucia said skeptically, nodding towards the newspaper photo, that's your Minister of Magic, right? Are you saying that he's part of this plot to take over the governments of the world? James shook his head. I don't think he has any clue. He's just a politician stuck in a tight place. What with the vow of secrecy falling apart and people demanding action, he's doing what makes sense to him. He's doing what Grudge tells him, Scorpius countered seriously. He tapped the photograph, emphasizing the handshake between Grudge and the Minister of Magic. Ten Galleons says this was the headmaster's idea. Now look, Rose said, Grudge may be a horrible headmaster, but this is some super serious stuff here. And besides, it's the Collector who threatened us all. Why, that was probably him we were following just now. But it wasn't, Lucia suddenly exclaimed. Scorpius and Rose both looked at her, frowning in surprise. Lucia glanced past them to James. James gulped and drew a deep breath. We saw someone, down by the white tomb. Rose boggled at him in confusion. When? Right as Comstock started yelling, he answered. A man appeared in front of the door of the tomb. He wasn't in front of it, Lucia clarified. He was inside it. The door was opened, and it was... Professor Avior, James said, at exactly the same moment that Lucia exclaimed, Headmaster Dumbledore! Scorpius's eyes narrowed even further as he looked back and forth between Lucia and James. I don't know, James finally said, tossing up his hands. It was Avior, but it was also Dumbledore. That's how it's been all along. Avior is Dumbledore somehow. But, Rose said, turning to peer closely at Lucia, you saw him too? What's that supposed to mean? James demanded. I knew you'd think I was mad. Why do you think I didn't want to bring it up? Look, James, Rose explained patiently. We can argue about how you feel about this later. I'm not arguing about how I feel about it. But this is important, so if you don't mind, just belt up for a minute. She met James's eyes, waiting for him to agree. He fumed silently at her for a moment, and then slumped. Rose turned back to Lucia. Now, tell me exactly what you saw. Lucia suddenly pressed her lips together as if afraid to answer. Finally, nervously, she said, I don't know who this Professor Avior is, but what I saw was 
Well, it was Albus Dumbledore. He had the beard, the, the little half-moon glasses, everything. Not to mention that he was standing in the doorway under his own name. Rose nodded. But this is the important bit, she said earnestly, her gaze unflinching from Lucia's face. Was it a ghost? Lucia looked from Rose to James again, as if begging him to answer for her. She seemed to struggle with her thoughts for a moment. Finally, slowly, she shook her head. I've never seen a ghost, not even Professor Binns. They won't let us take his class, think we're not ready for it, but— Her eyes cleared as she looked at James again and exhaled deeply. No, I don't think he was a ghost. Rose nodded. Then it had to be Professor Avior. Thank you, James said, both relieved and annoyed. But why? Avior's no ghost, but he is apparently identical to Dumbledore, Rose explained with a shrug. It's just logic. And now it begins to make sense, Scorpius said, at least in one small way. Avior was one of the experts on the Morrigan web. If he was here tonight, he might have been consulting with Warlick. Or trying to stop him. Lucia suggested, brightening. I mean, if he looks that much like Dumbledore, then he might be good like him, right? James avoided answering Lucia's question. Either way, this is beyond anything we can handle, he said, straightening his shoulders and stuffing the newspaper into his pocket. And that's why I can't go back to the castle right now. Why not? Rose demanded worriedly. Because we need help, James answered and there's no way to ask for it from inside the castle. Every method of communication is monitored by grudge. If I'm going to get word out to my dad, I need to do it from somewhere else. Scorpius nodded reasonably. So what is your plan? James shrugged in frustration. I don't know. Back to Hogsmeade, I guess. James, Rose said warningly, if you don't come back with us, Corsica will be sure to report you to Filch. I know, James proclaimed helplessly but I don't have any choice. Maybe if I hurry, I can be back before dinner's over. I'll sneak in through the old rotunda, like Comstock and Lucia. Corsica won't just stop looking for you, Rose insisted. She's itching to nail you with something. I know, Rose, James pounded his thigh in frustration, but there is no other way. He's right, of course, Scorpius agreed. Let it go, Weasley. That's easy for you to say, Rose rasped, turning on him. It certainly is, he agreed blandly. Come on, hopefully Corsica and the rest will be too distracted by the news of Warlick's body to notice James's late return. Finally, Comstock declared dramatically. Lucia nudged him hard in the ribs with her elbow. Rose seemed mired in indecision, shifting her gaze from James to Scorpius and back again. Finally, inevitably, she growled her assent. Fine! But run! Go now! We'll do what we can! James sighed hesitantly. Thanks, and don't talk about what we discovered tonight when you get back. Tell them about Warlick's body, of course, but not the newspaper clipping about the Quidditch Summit or the appearance of Dumble, uh, Professor Avior. Like Professor Longbottom said, there are ears everywhere. You're still here! Rose exclaimed, flapping a hand at him. Go! Go! James nodded resolutely. He drew a deep breath turned towards the path that led back to Hogsmeade, and began to run. As James ran along the path back towards Hogsmeade, night settled firmly overhead, reducing the wood to a cathedral of pillar-like tree trunks stretching up into darkness. He did not light his wand for fear of being seen, but strained his eyes to follow the dim path. Wind still hustled busily all around, shifting directions capriciously, and drying the sweat even as it sprang to his forehead. He tried not to think about everything that had just happened, about how Professor Avior had appeared standing inside the tomb of Albus Dumbledore, staring out like a vengeful spectre, purposely allowing James and Lucia to see him. Why? What was to be gained by deliberately revealing himself? Was he taunting James somehow, or inviting him into his secret? Soon enough the trees thinned, and Hogsmeade lay ahead, a collection of steep roofs and crooked chimneys rising against a moonless sky. Windows glowed yellow, flickering with firelight, and James instinctively hung back from them, skulking from shadow to shadow along the narrow streets. 
How would he send a message to his father? Surely the three broomsticks were still open? Madame Rosmerta happily provided parchment and post services in exchange for a few knarts, with purchase of a drink, of course. But even she would be suspicious of a Hogwarts student showing up past dark, no matter how many knarts he spent. The post office was a possibility, of course, assuming it was still open. Turning the corner onto the high street, however, James's heart sank. The post office was dark, its doors shut tight for the night. As he stood, staring helplessly at the street, a gaggle of noisily cackling old witches bustled out of Madame Puttyfoot's tea shop, drawing their shawls around their sloped shoulders and drifting in James's direction. He ducked into a narrow alley and pressed against the wall, waiting for them to pass. The witches were in no hurry, however, and seemed to stop every few feet to jostle each other amiably and cackle at some indecipherable private joke. Finally, the gathering passed onwards, casting a many-headed, shambling shadow along the brick-lined alley floor. A few minutes later, the cackling voices fell away to distant echoes. James peered around the corner of the alley. Voices and music emanated from the entrance of the three broomsticks, but for the moment the high street was empty. James hung back, filled with indecision. Where was he to go? He considered banging on the door of Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, but he knew it would be no use. The shop was closed and dark. Uncle George had surely apparated home to Aunt Angelina by now, and Ted would be out and about, doing whatever young men did on a random spring night. And then James's eyes are lit on the two-story newsstand, leaning crookedly on the corner, just past the three broomsticks. Perched atop it, a complicated silhouette against the night sky, was the giant news announcer's funnel and the miniature owlery. Even at a distance, James could see the subtle flutter of news owls in their wire mesh cubicles. It was a long shot. The owls were probably trained only for official news business, but it was the only option available at the moment. As nimbly and quietly as he could, James darted out onto the street and angled towards the newsstand. A small brass chain and padlock had been closed over the newsstand's wrought iron stairway. James scurried beneath this and clanked up the narrow stairs to the wraparound balcony. Doors had been closed over the second-story shelves and pay counter. Slipping his wand from his pocket, James tapped the lock over the main counter, attempting an unlocking spell. The lock did not spring open when the spell struck it, but emitted a short, piercingly loud alarm whistle. James threw himself to the floor of the balcony, hiding as well as he could in plain sight. Fortunately, the brief whistle had coincided with a sudden, raucous scuffle inside the three broomsticks. There was a flash of wandfire in the pub's lower windows, a cacophony of laughter and angry catcalls, and a pair of figures stumbled out of the front door, wands out, grappling into the street. James watched, his heart hammering in his throat. The pair of wizards grunted and cursed each other, both firing spells wildly as they wrestled. One red bolt struck the newsstand's sideboard, sending it spinning squeakily around its spindle. A moment later, both figures tripped over the curb, toppled onto each other in the gutter, and cried out in surprise and pain. And then, strangely, both of them began to wheeze with laughter. Clumsily, they assisted each other to their feet, their quarrel suddenly forgotten in a slur of apologies and drunken laughter. Hugging each other precariously, they shambled back into the pub, leaving James alone again with his pounding heart. He scrambled back to his feet, pocketing his wand again. The newsstand's locks were obviously protected with some sort of counter-jinx. If Rose was here, she could probably get them open regardless. Without her, he had to find another route up to the newsstand's third level. For lack of any other idea, James hoisted himself up onto the protruding lip of the counter and began to climb. Fortunately, he was just thin enough and nimble enough to scrabble for a handhold and clamber up to the third-floor walkway, resisting the instinct to look down at the hard cobbles below. The owls in the newsstand's tiny owlery fluttered their wings and raised their feathered hackles on their foreheads as James shimmied under the railing, hunting with exertion and hunkering low beneath the giant broadcasting funnel. Glancing around, he saw the curved desk of the news announcer hulking in the shadow of a canvas awning. His head still spinning with the vertigo of his climb, 
James skulked towards the desk and began to search through its many drawers and cubbyholes. Soon enough, he found a collection of tiny parchment scrolls made to fit the brass tubes on the legs of the news owls. Grabbing a quill, James thought hard for a moment, and then scribbled a note in shaking, cramped handwriting. Dad, important news about the one that got away. Contact me as soon as possible. Same as last time. I'll be watching. He thought for a moment, reading what he'd written. Surely his dad would know who he meant by the one that got away, as that could only refer to the escaped prisoner Warlick, and same as last time would mean another appointment via the Gryffindor hearth. As an afterthought, he quickly added, P.S. Make it you this time. Uncles are great, but you need to hear this. Unsure if he made himself clear enough, but worried about trusting too much to a strange owl, James rolled up the tiny scroll and approached the nearest owl. It was a sleek brown owl, much smaller than Nobby, with a sternly pointed head and huge amber eyes. It regarded him with obvious disdain, not proffering its leg. This goes to Harry Potter, James said in a low voice, holding up the scroll, and it's extremely urgent. The owl merely glared at him. Look, I know this isn't your normal job, but you're an owl, right? This is what you do. Now stick out your leg and let me— Ow! James had been reaching for the scroll tube on the owl's leg, but yanked his hand back as the owl nipped with its sharp little beak. A faint scratch welled beads of blood across James's knuckles. Look, you stupid, grotty sack of feathers, James hissed angrily, but deflated before the owl's implacable stare. It shuffled languidly on its perch, then, with obvious aloofness, swiveled its head entirely backwards, ignoring him. James sucked the blood from the back of his hand, thinking hard. Finally, an idea occurred to him. You know, there's a major story behind this message, he said, lowering his voice to a conspiratorial hush. Murder and intrigue. That's headline material, that is. The owl did not look back at James, but a distinct alertness crept into its posture. It shuffled on its perch, and the hackles on its head ruffled. People should know what happened tonight. So far it's a secret, but perhaps, just perhaps, if you were to deliver this message for me, I could include a special news bulletin just for you. You could take it directly to the Daily Prophet if you wished. A major story like that. Well, it could make great things to a certain news owl. The owl swiveled its head back towards James and cocked a sceptical amber eye at him. Here. James hunkered over the news announcer's desk again and grabbed another scroll. I'll write down the details. Major story of murder and mystery. He scribbled quickly on the tiny parchment. Who is the victim? Where was he killed? It's all right here, and you can be the first to report it. But... James produced his wand and showed it to the owl, whose interest was obviously piqued. Other owls craned in their mesh cubicles, leaning to listen and peer at the parchment. But... James said again, gesturing with his wand. Only if you take the other note to Harry Potter first. James rolled the new scroll inside the note to his father, and then tapped them both with his wand. Hedwig Obscura, he said firmly. That's a code charm. Makes both notes completely unreadable, unless my dad, Harry Potter, performs the decoding charm. Take my note to him, and he'll decode both. Then you can take your headline to the Daily Prophet. Do we have a deal? The owl continued to glare at James sceptically. Finally, it sidled close to him on its perch and stuck out its leg, proffering the tiny brass tube. James heaved a sigh of relief and slipped the scroll into the tube, doing it as quickly as he could in case the owl changed its mind and attempted to scratch him again. Go! James hissed. If you hurry, you can make it to the Prophet before they go to press in the morning. But remember, go to Harry Potter first, otherwise no one will be able to make any sense of what I wrote. The owl rolled its huge eyes, as if to say, I know how to do my job, thank you very much. It flexed its wings, tested the breeze for a moment, and then launched into the dark air, buffeting James's hair with the backwash of its tail. A moment later it was gone, vanished against the night sky. The other owls peered at James with a mixture of grudging anticipation. Sorry, mates, he whispered, sighing deeply. Only one headline per night. He hoped that the news owls did not know how to read. There was no such thing as a Hedwig Obscura code hex, of course. He'd made it up entirely on the spot. Not that it mattered. 
The markings on the second parchment were scribbled gibberish. He felt slightly bad about tricking the owl, but this was offset by the satisfaction that he had succeeded in getting a note sent to his father, despite Headmaster Grudge's most careful monitoring. With shaky legs and a shiver of nervousness, James turned around and began to clamber back down to the newsstand's second level. Five minutes later, he dashed into the impenetrable shadows of the forest path, leaving the lights of Hogsmeade thankfully behind him. He wondered if he would meet anyone on the path. After all, if things had gone as planned, Scorpius and Rose had already told Professor McGonagall about the body of Warlick. Surely someone would be coming to collect the body and launch an investigation? What would they do if they discovered James lurking through the forest alone, long after he was supposed to be back at Hogwarts? Worse still, what if no one was coming yet? What if he had to pass by the body of Warlick alone in the dark? James shivered violently at the thought. Warlick had been a specialist in dark magic, he remembered. What if the warlock had invented a means to come back after his death? What if, even now, he was shuffling through the forest as an inferior, a living corpse? James stopped on the dark path, his eyes bulging against the darkness as he looked around. Nothing moved. In fact, the forest suddenly seemed eerily quiet. There was no breath of breeze, nor the slightest rustle of leaves. Cold fear closed over his heart like a fist. I'm winding myself up, he whispered. I have to get a grip. There's nothing out here to be afraid of. Of course, as James well knew, this was not true, even under the best of conditions. He began to walk forward again, following the path as it snaked into the dark. He cast around, searching the trees for any sign of movement. Did the forest look different somehow? Had the trees always been this close, this clustered and crooked? Nothing looked familiar. The sense of fear and of being secretly watched intensified. A narrow valley creased the path before him. He descended into it swiftly, his breath coming in short bursts, and glanced around. A small clearing opened at the base of the valley, marked with two monuments, each as tall as James and constructed of loose stones. Vines enclosed the monuments, clutching at them. The sight of the twin cairns chilled James deeply. He had never seen them before. This was not the path back to Hogwarts. It was narrower, far more overgrown, and crowded with leaning, spindly trees. He forged ahead, fighting panic, pushing through the weeds and crowding brush. A flicker of moonlight on water shone through the trees ahead, and yet James felt an undeniable suspicion that this was not the comforting familiarity of the Black Lake he was approaching. The gentle lap of waves reached his ears now, small breakers sucking at a rocky shore. James finally emerged from the wood, pushing between the trees as the path dissolved to obscurity. A small farm lake stretched before him, marked with a single band of silvery reflected moonlight. Silhouetted against this, positioned at the end of a short, warped dock, was a gazebo. It stood atop its own reflection on the lake, black and foreboding and full of shadows. James could not approach the lake. He stopped on the dewy grass overlooking it, his heart sinking at the sight. He recognized this place, even though he had never seen it with his own eyes, He'd only ever read about it. Hi, James, a young woman's voice said out of the darkness. James squinted and saw her standing in the gazebo's entrance, the pale circle of her face, her drab dress blending into the shadows. Come and join me. I've missed you, and we need to talk. Petra? James called faintly, beginning to walk towards her without even realizing it. Is this where you... I mean, your dream story? How is this even? His words fell away as he stepped onto the dock, moving to join her in the entrance of the gazebo. It was cold there. The air around Petra was as icy as a January tomb. James's breath formed a wreath of mist as he shivered. We've always been here, Petra shrugged, ever since that night on the back of the Gwindermere, when you saved my life. This is where the connection between us lives, right here, on this dock, in this gazebo. I wish it didn't. I hate this place, but I can't change it. James shook his head, 
glancing around at the quietly rippling lake, the dark shore. But how are we here now, like this? Because, like I said, Petra answered tiredly, we need to talk. Come inside. Sit by me. Numbly, James followed Petra as she stepped through the gazebo's entrance, moving onto its neat plank floor. Lattice railings formed an octagon around them, lined with shallow benches. Across from the dock entrance, another opening framed the lake. On a summer's day, this opening would invite a dive into the happy coolness of the water. Now it looked like a hungry, waiting throat. James turned away from it, joining Petra on one of the narrow wooden benches. She didn't speak, merely stared past him, studying the waves as if gathering her thoughts. James spoke first, unable to wait. What's happening to you, Petra? he asked in a hushed voice. What happened on that night, the night of the unveiling? Petra shook her head vaguely. I did what had to be done. I satisfied my destiny. You saved my dad, James shivered again. He wanted to draw closer to Petra, but sensed that the coldness was coming from her, as if she was made of ice. Of course I did. She knew that I would, that we would, Izzy and me. It was never not going to happen. James nodded. He knew exactly who Petra was talking about. Nobody believes me about her, the Lady of the Lake. They think I imagined her. Of course they do, Petra replied, smiling at him. The greatest lie of the greatest evil is that it doesn't exist. James met Petra's eyes in the darkness. She's behind all of this somehow, isn't she? I assume you mean the Morrigan Web, Petra said, breaking eye contact with James and looking out of the waves again. The Collector, Avior Dorchaska Thurn, Headmaster Grudge, all of it, yes, of course she is. She torments you personally as well, just to keep you busy and distracted, and because she thinks it's fun. I watch and intervene when I can, like on first night. James's eyes widened, remembering. It was her that whispered my name, he nodded, but it was you that appeared on the Marauder's map. I can trace her when she appears in places like Hogwarts. I watch her whenever I can, and I chase her there, like I did on first night. But she never stays long, and neither do I. Neither of us can afford to get noticed. Not yet. She'll do it, won't she? James asked, trying not to shiver. Her and the people she's partnered with. They'll set off the Morrigan web, killing who knows how many people. Petra nodded. Judith pulls the strings. But I pull the strings as well, even if I don't mean to. And so does Izzy. We're sister fates, after all. How could it be otherwise? But you're not like her, James said suddenly, sitting up on the bench. You and Izzy, you're good. She's the evil one. Sometimes I wonder, James, Petra said, almost dreamily, if there even is such a thing as good and evil. I tried to do good last time I was here, on this farm, but in the end, both my grandfather and his wife ended up dead. I tried to do good last year in New Amsterdam, and ended up breaking the vow of secrecy for the whole magical world. Does doing good matter if it always ends up playing into the hands of evil? Judith pulls her strings, and Izzy and I, we pull ours. But in the end, we're all sister fates, and destiny gets its way. The chill that came from Petra was like a silent wind. James's teeth were chattering as he said, It doesn't have to be that way, does it? You don't have to play into her plan. You can stop her. I can help you. No, James, Petra said her voice going firm. That's why I brought you here tonight. You're getting involved in things that you cannot control or understand. There is danger here like nothing you've ever known. The Morrigan Web, James exclaimed. I know, but none of us even knows what it's supposed to do or how it works. Can you tell us? I'm a sorceress, James, Petra said, her voice softening again. But I don't know everything. I don't know what the Morrigan Web is any more than you do. I just know that she intends to use it, she and her temporary helpers. The Collector, James nodded, but why are they temporary? Petra sighed. You know why. You saw it tonight. In the end, true evil breaks all its tools. There was silence between them for a long moment, punctuated only by the monotonous drone of the waves. 
Finally, James straightened. I'm not afraid. I can help you, Petra. Me and Ralph, Zane, Rose, even Scorpius and Albus. We can help you stop her. Petra looked at James again, and the look in her eyes froze him in place. James, she said, shaking her head slowly. I don't intend to stop her. The cold seat beneath James's skin, as he looked into her eyes, saw her unshakable resolve. An icicle seemed to push into his heart, chilling him so deeply that his shivers ceased. But, Petra, he whispered, you have to stop her. All those people, you can't just— Every time I try to stop her, Petra said, her eyes hardening, she wins. The strings that Izzy and I pull only further her aims. We can't help it. As long as we are three, we are one. Fate prevails. There is only one way to end it forever. You can't understand it, James, and I don't intend to explain it to you. Your part is to back away. As of tonight, you're getting too close. Stop asking questions. Stop trying to work it all out. I'm not asking you. I'm warning you. People will die. She stood up and drew a deep, regretful breath. I don't want you to be one of them. James sat speechless, staring up at Petra as if he had never seen her before. What about Izzy? he said faintly. Will you allow her to kill? Petra's lips thinned. She refused to look at him. She and I have killed before, right here in this gazebo. We sent her mother to her doom. That was different, James insisted, standing as well. There has to be something we can do. What about that other bloke, the one who's been travelling with you? My dad and Mr. Malfoy were talking about him at Christmas. Paris something or other. Petra narrowed her eyes and glared at him. Stop reading my dream diary, James, she said quietly, emphatically. Leave Marshal Paris out of it. Leave yourself out of it. What is meant to happen has to happen. I can't stop it. I don't want to stop it. It's the only way to end this whole nightmare. James shook his head. Petra, he croaked, his breath puffing into mist. I can't just... None of us can let this happen. The hard glare in Petra's eyes slowly melted. A breath of warmth pushed in from over the waves, threading through Petra's long hair and blowing away the icy chill, leaving only the girl that James had known ever since his first year, the one that liked to suck on the ends of her hair when she was thinking, who had a secret soft spot for romantic stories and treacle tarts. She shook her head again, even more slowly, and took a step towards him. She leaned close, meeting him in the centre of the gazebo. Fleetingly, James realised that he was taller than her now. Her lips parted slightly in the darkness. He could smell her, the mingled scent of soap and hyacinth and faint spice. She's going to kiss me, his mind raced. But she did not kiss him. She leaned close, placing her lips next to his ear. He could feel her breath on the nape of his neck. Remember your own dream, she whispered. The dream of the graveyard, of me and Albus and the dark mark. Remember what you wrote when you woke up? James's eyes widened. He remembered, although he hadn't thought of it in a long, long time. If you don't want that to happen, she whispered, so quietly that he felt it as much as he heard it, then don't, James. Don't try to stop me. On her last word, darkness fell over the lake and the forest beyond. It consumed the gazebo, absorbed the waves, and covered Petra in an impenetrable shadow. Blackness pressed against James's eyes, blinding him. He reached out for her, sensing that she was falling away from him, sucked away into that waiting dark. Petra! he cried out. His voice echoed in the confines of the Gryffindor dormitory. He was standing next to his trunk in a pool of light cast by his own lit candle. No one else was there. Somehow Petra had transported him straight back to Hogwarts, bypassing the prowling Tabitha Corsica and Filch. James's knees shook. He sat heavily on his trunk. Something crinkled beneath him. Wearily he reached for it, leaning aside and pulling out a sheet of wrinkled parchment. It was Petra's dream story. The pages were entirely blank now, 
but for a single line written neatly across the center in Petra's distinctive, careful handwriting. As long as we are three, we are one. Fate prevails. James stared at it, reading it over and over by the light of the single candle. Drifting up through the curving stone stairs, raucous voices echoed from the common room, implying warmth, frivolity, and evening cheer. Despite this, even now, the chill of Petra's gazebo hung around James like a cocoon. It was under his skin, racking him with shivers, chilling him all the way to the bone. Chapter 14 Durmstrang's Depths Scorpius's prediction proved to be correct in that it was Titus Hardcastle who had been called in to investigate the murder of Warlick. James saw him the next day, along with Lucinda Lyon, the young Aura with whom he had scuffled over Christmas break. They stood in the courtyard with Headmaster Grudge and Professor McGonagall, talking seriously, their voices hushed as James, Ralph, and Scorpius made their way to advanced flight. McGonagall looks about fit to spit nails, Ralph muttered as they passed, their brooms slung over their shoulders. She hasn't forgotten what happened over Christmas holiday, if you ask me, James nodded. I still can't believe they're freezing my dad out of all of this. As they neared the courtyard gates, James noticed Tabitha Corsica lurking near Grudge and Hardcastle, listening in, her face taut. She saw James and narrowed her eyes dangerously. She's not just going to forget that you somehow got past her last night, Scorpius mused airily. If she can't punish you for that, she'll come up with something else. She's persistent, that one. James sighed as they passed through the gate. Scorpius was right, of course. Late that afternoon was physical education at York. In the wake of the previous night's revelations, James had nearly forgotten all about the dreaded muggle class. Tabitha Corsica, in her older teacher's guise, however, was waiting for them outside the York gymnasium, a smarmy grin on her face, her eyes twinkling behind her oversized spectacles. It's such a beautiful spring day! she announced, tilting her chin towards the low grey clouds and misting rain, that I've decided to hold today's class out of doors. A groan rippled over the Hogwarts students, while the York students merely nodded and stretched, flexing their beefy legs and necks. Even the girls, James noticed, seemed a head taller than him and ropey with muscle. He wondered for the first time if Tabitha Corsica had purposely teamed the Hogwarts students with older, stockier York students. Not rugby again, Ralph muttered next to James, crossing the fingers on both hands. Please, not rugby again. Anything but that. Corsica tilted her head thoughtfully. Today, I think we shall play a spirited game, she exclaimed as James hunched his shoulders expecting the worst. Of football. Both Ralph and James glanced up in surprise. Now it was the York students' turn to moan. Football's for hooligans, a tall ginger girl complained. Do we have to? Now, now, Corsica chided sweetly. We must make an effort to accommodate our guests. They come from, uh, less fortunate circumstances and have not had the blessing of more advanced team sport. Surely we can extend the hand of friendship and grant them this small favour? Joseph Torrance scoffed incredulously under his breath. She thinks rugby is an advanced team sport? Football, Ralph elbowed James in the ribs, nearly doubling him over. She's talking about muggle studies during our first year, when Professor Curry had us playing muggle sports all term, remember? And if I recall correctly, Fiona Fourcompass admitted somewhat grudgingly, you were quite the star player, James. James glanced at her and felt his face heat with mingled embarrassment and anticipation. He had been quite good at the muggle sport, had even scored the goal that won the final match for Gryffindor. In fact, Corsica went on, beginning to lead the class towards the sodden field, bouncing a shiny new football lightly on her palm. Let us make the game interesting and have a friendly competition. York versus our guests. The winners earn bragging rights, while the losers must run laps for the entirety of next class. With a decisive nod, Corsica tossed the ball towards James. He caught it clumsily. Corsica glared at him over a tight smile. You have two minutes to determine player positions, starting 
Now! The class swiftly scrambled into separate groups and broke into harsh whisperings. I don't even remember how to play this ruddy game, Graham Wharton complained. Is this the one where we hit the ball with that odd little paddle? That's cricket, you git, Kevin Murdoch rolled his eyes. This is the one where you can't touch the ball with your hands. Fiona Fourcompass rolled her eyes. All these muggle games are completely daft. Ralph implored James. We can win this, right? I can't run all next class. I'll drop dead on the spot. I'm not even kidding. Calm down, all of you, James said. Football obviously isn't a big thing here at York, and that gives us a decent chance. We just have to stay organised and keep our wits. Here's what we'll do. As swiftly as he could, James assigned positions for his team, putting himself, Joseph Torrance and Graham Wharton on the front line, Ralph in goal and the rest mounting defence. As they trotted into position on the squelching field, he bounced the ball off his knee and gave it a sharp kick as it dropped before him. It bounced into the centre of the field, where Tabitha Corsica stood with a shiny whistle between her teeth. James joined her there, avoiding eye contact. Across the centre line, an imposing brick wall of a boy named Lunt hunkered low, screwing his studs into the mud with grim determination. With no preamble, Corsica gave a short, piercing tweet on her whistle. James was not prepared for it, allowing Lunt a free swipe at the ball. With a ringing thump, it rocketed away from the bigger boy's foot. Lunt leapt to follow it, elbowing James roughly out of the way. The rest of Team York followed. Defence! James called, spinning around and scrambling to catch up. Everyone fall back! Despite the inglorious start, James found that what Team Hogwarts lacked in brawn, they made up for in mingled nimbleness and raw desperation. Fiona Fourcompass surprisingly erected a nearly maniacal defence of the goal, rushing out to meet opposing players with her teeth bared and her eyes bulging. From his vantage point in front of the Hogwarts goal, Ralph watched the match with grim intensity, his stance wide and his arms spread, trying to distribute his already bulky frame over as much space as possible. Kevin Murdoch, being woefully clumsy with the ball, contented himself with simply kicking it as hard as he could whenever it rolled into his general vicinity, sending it far out of bounds as often as not, but managing to at least get it to the opposing end of the field. James found, despite everything, that not only was his team holding their own against York, he was actually enjoying himself. By the middle of the match, with neither team having scored a single goal, he found himself in a fortunate position as Murdoch gave the ball another of his mighty kicks. Being already at the centre line, James dashed backwards, watching the ball hurtle towards him. The York defence was caught off guard, leaving James plenty of room. He steeled himself, getting beneath the dropping ball, and let it carom off his chest, deadening its momentum. It struck the ground, and he immediately trapped it beneath his foot, pivoting on it to face the opposing goal. The York goalie, a tall, gangly ginger girl with a mass of freckles, glared at him and spread her arms. James dashed towards her, knocking the ball lightly ahead of him as he went. Footsteps pounded behind him, but they were too late. James reared back for the kick, aiming for the high right corner of the York goal. Suddenly, and for no apparent reason, his planted foot skated forward, drawing a muddy skid on the field. He flailed wildly, trying to salvage his kick, but succeeded only in tripping over the ball. He fell full length onto the wet grass, with enough force to drive his teeth together with an audible clack. His right foot was still resting on the ball. Frantically, James clambered to get his feet beneath him again, scooping the ball forward, but Lunt had finally caught up with him. The bigger boy swept James's feet out from under him, stealing the ball and bowling James into the mud again, cursing vividly. Studs pounded past him as the action moved back to the opposite end of the field. As James finally regained his feet and pelted to rejoin the match, he saw Tabitha Corsica standing on the sideline, watching him smugly, her eyes narrowed behind her ridiculous glasses. James knew immediately what had happened. While she had confiscated their ones as usual upon their arrival at York, she had of course kept her own. She was using magic to surreptitiously sabotage him from the sideline. The look on her face as he passed was a small, challenging smile. York scored their first goal quickly thereafter. What happened up there? Murdoch demanded, 
panting heavily as James headed back towards the center line. You had a clean shot. It's not my fault, James spat. Corsica's cursing me. Fiona Fourcompass gave him a skeptical look, her face speckled with mud. James glared back at her defiantly. It's true, he declared, pointing at the sideline. Fiona merely shook her head and rolled her eyes. Hey, Potter, Lunt called, grinning. Have a nice trip. Behind him, the rest of Team York snickered. As the game resumed, James began to sense that Corsica was subtly cursing him at almost every turn, making the grass supernaturally slick beneath his feet, causing the ball to take unexpected and unnatural bounces, or giving it unusual momentum so that it bowled over him as he tried to trap it. As a result, he missed two more opportunities for goals, while York scored three goals under extremely suspicious circumstances. The last goal was a long kick from centre field, which seemed to hang in the air far longer than possible, arcing towards the goal and squirrelling past Ralph as if it was alive. Team York erupted into ecstatic cheers as James skulked back towards his team. What's happening out there? Ralph muttered angrily, flinging his sweaty hair out of his face. I've never seen you so clumsy, James. For the first time, I think I could do a better job out there than you. And believe me, that's not a happy thought. It isn't me. James insisted furiously. It's Corsica. It's got to be. She's cursing me from the sideline. Have you seen her doing it? Joseph asked. Because I have to say, it looks like you've just sort of lost your touch. James, Fiona seethed, grabbing him by the shoulder and turning him around. I am not running all next class, and I am not going to listen to these muscle-headed morons gassing on and on about how they beat us into the ground. You've got to score. The match is nearly over. I know, James exclaimed, throwing a hand off his shoulder. It isn't my fault. It's Corsica. Stop blaming your clumsiness on others, Fiona hissed, shoving James in the chest. I'm not getting mud in my hair for nothing out here. Win this match or I'll curse you myself. James opened his mouth to argue, but was interrupted by a sharp, long whistle from the sideline. Score three to zero in favour of York Academy, Corsica called letting the whistle drop from her teeth and dangle around her neck. With only five minutes left to play, perhaps our guests would like to forfeit the match? She eyed James across the field with one eyebrow arched, still smiling that smug half-smile. James shook his head. No chance, he called. The match isn't over yet. As you wish, Corsica shrugged lightly. Proceed. She retrieved the whistle and gave it a sharp tweet pointing towards the ball on the centre line. James dashed forward to claim it as the match resumed. He had no hope of actually winning at this point, but there was no chance that he was going to let her see that she had defeated him. He chased Lunt as the big boy zigged down the side of the field. When Lunt attempted to pass the ball to a teammate nearer the goal, James lunged to intercept. He trapped it against his foot, pivoted, and kicked it back towards his own goal. Joseph Torrance bolted to catch it, followed by Graham Wharton and, to James's surprise, Kevin Murdoch and Fiona Fourcompass. Almost all of Team Hogwarts collapsed towards the York goal, desperate to muscle the ball toward at least one score. James joined them. For a moment it appeared that it was going to work. Surrounded by the herd of Hogwarts players, the ball zigged and bounced gradually forward. Lunt and his teammates muscled into the herd, but could not manage to turn the ball around. Finally, the entirety of both teams crowded in front of the York goal, rioting and shouting and kicking viciously. James saw his opening. Through a mist of rain and flying gobbets of mud, he sensed that the York goalie had inched too far forward, leaving a gap. The ball, now streaked with grime and pummeled by feet from every direction, suddenly squirted loose of the melee. James lunged for it, drew back his foot to kick, and missed. His foot swiped forward, skidded over the wet grass, and completely bypassed the ball, which continued to roll idly towards the corner of the field. At that moment, the scrum recaptured James, knocking him down and brawling over him. A boot landed on his chest, mashing the air from his lungs. Another kicked him in the ear. Still another landed on his wrist with an audible crunch. Someone was screaming in pain. After a second, James realized it was himself. He rolled over and cradled his wounded wrist. It felt horribly loose, and a soft grinding sensation accompanied its movements. The fingers on that hand tingled numbly. 
Tabitha Corsica's whistle sounded in three short bursts. Everyone back away now, she called as she approached. Give the young man some air, thank you. Lunt, if you would be so kind as to line everyone up, we shall return to the locker rooms now. James felt Corsica hunkering over him. Her shadow blocked the dull grey sky. He resisted as she reached for his broken wrist, but she was persistent. Nasty break, that, she said, gripping and turning his forearm like a dead fish. Unfortunately, medical methods here at York are not quite what you may be accustomed to. Here there is no magic remedy for a broken bone. Of course, she mused, cocking her head and lowering her voice. I do have my wand with me, as you know. I could help you, but that would rather defeat the purpose of this program, don't you think? I fear you will simply have to bear the pain until you return through the cabinet. You can bear the pain, can't you? James didn't reply, but simply attempted to wrench his wrist from her grasp. It hurt immensely as the broken bones ground together. She saw this on his face, and her eyebrows rose slightly, along with the corners of her mouth. I didn't curse you that last time, she whispered conspiratorially. That was good old-fashioned Potter clumsiness. Perhaps that adds a bit of insult to your injury, but I thought you should know it, nonetheless. James pushed her away and struggled to sit up. His ribs felt bruised where they had been stepped on, but he pushed through the red mist of pain, using his good hand to leverage himself to his feet. Next to him, Tabitha Corsica sighed as she also stood. I hope you'll take note of what happened here today, James, she said, glancing aside to where the rest of the class was lining up along the edge of the field. You can't get away with your little shenanigans any longer. You can't beat me. You never really could. Your luck's run out and I'm not done with you. I'll be watching every little thing you do. If you so much as stick one toe out of line, she smiled as if this was her greatest wish. Believe me, I'll be there to chop it off. She met his eyes, still smiling wistfully, assuming he saw that she meant it. Then, with a brisk sigh, she turned away, addressing the rest of the class. He's all right, everyone. Just a little sprain, nothing to be concerned about. Much ado about nothing, quite frankly. Back to the locker rooms now, and in honour of how our guests will be spending their next class period. She glanced back at James again with a vicious smile. Why don't we run? She's gone completely mental, Ralph seethed as he stood next to James in the hospital wing half an hour later. Sorry I didn't believe you straight away, mate. I should have known there was nothing she wouldn't stoop to. "'Cursing you to the point of injury?' Rose said wonderingly, settling into a seat opposite the little metal table upon which James sat, his arm outstretched in a bath of sparkling magical light. He winced with each enchanted flash as the bones in his wrist slowly realigned. "'Not that anyone would know that she was responsible,' he sighed. "'She's sneaky. No one saw a thing.' "'And technically,' Rose admitted dually, "'she didn't actually cause your injury.' She just created the conditions that allowed it to happen. And refused to help when it did. Ralph's face was stony. There was a time when I actually thought of her as almost a friend, or at least someone to look up to, he admitted. And later, after the old mess with the gatekeeper, and her thinking she was the bloodline of Voldemort, I sort of thought she might have learned her lesson. I wanted to think she wasn't all bad after all, just a little twisted and misguided. That's because she's pretty, Rose rolled her eyes. Boys always think the best of pretty girls. It's like a mental illness. Nobody asked you, Weasley, Ralph muttered with surprising venom. The swift clacking of boots announced Madame Curio's return along the ward floor. She threw a disapproving glance at Rose and Ralph, who retreated away from the examination table. Unsheathing her wand from an apron pocket, she teased the glowing, sparkling field over James's wrist, intensifying it. This will sting a bit. James nodded, but didn't reply. He well knew of Madame Curio's disdain for sport-related injuries, and didn't want to provide her any more opportunities to lecture him about it. She pressed her lips into a thin line and sighed briskly, finally dispersing the magical field with a sweep of her wand. It will ache throughout the night as the bones knit, no doubt, but the bricks are sufficiently set. Lift anything heavier than a fork for the next twenty-four hours, however, and I'll need to re-break the bones and begin all over again. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Madame Curio, James nodded, seeing in the head nurse's eyes that she believed re-breaking his wrist would be a valuable lesson indeed. 
I won't touch so much as a quill. Promise. She shook her head irritably. Give a student medical advice, she muttered, and he takes it as an excuse to skive off his homework. She waved a hand at him. Be off, the tree of you. And Mr. Potter, sincerely, if you appear in my ward one more time, I promise I will start charging you. Later that night, James slumped in a patched armchair before the Gryffindor common room hearth, his legs akimbo and his arm throbbing monstrously. Curio could have given me something for the pain, he complained bitterly. I mean, that's what she's there for, isn't she? She wants you to learn your lesson, Rose shrugged from the hearth rug, her nose buried in a gigantic book propped open against a table leg. After all, stupid injuries and maladies seem to be a speciality of yours. James was too tired to argue. What are you reading now, anyway? I thought you were done with your homework. I'm researching, she sighed irritably, glancing back at him over her shoulder. She tapped the book with a forefinger. The Art and History of Magical Warfare. There's a whole chapter on dark superweapons and doomsday hexes. Anything on the Morrigan web? Rose shook her head and slumped. Who can tell? Every magical war machine had its own code name and secrecy charms, and even its own special language. There's no way to figure out what's legend and what's true. For instance, here, she turned back a few enormous pages, this is a whole section on something called the Wrath of Caruenvar. According to the legend, a centuries-long wizarding war had so poisoned an entire region with dark magic, buried curses, and demon armies that it became a complete wasteland, the Tempest Barrens, they called it. Merlin himself ended the war by harnessing the power of a volcano, making it erupt with so much force, she leaned over the book and read, that the earth broke like a plate, creating a rift one hundred leagues wide and a thousand feet tall. The crag rack cliffs ever since form an impenetrable barrier and a permanent stalemate between the two warring nations. She heaved the heavy book shut, sending a whoomp of dust into the air. See what I mean? Legends and myths. Even if I found a section on the Morrigan web, how would we know it wasn't just some story for scaring little kids? James frowned. Like maybe the earth is going to erupt in a volcano when all those government people show up for the Quidditch tournament. Rose glared back at him with one eyebrow raised. Are you even listening? Look! James suddenly sat up and pointed towards the hearth. Is that... Dad? The dying coals in the hearth shuffled and sparked as a head reared out of them revealing Harry Potter's glasses, perpetually unruly hair, and distinctive famous scar. He glanced swiftly around the room, spotted James, and smiled. Hi, James, he said in a hushed voice. Hi, Rose. I don't have much time. I've been watching the Marauder's map ever since I received your note, James. I thought Devendar Das was never going to go up to bed. Oh, he's been up late every night brushing up on classic Quidditch strategy, Rose nodded thinks he can still squeak Gryffindor into a victory with proper play formations, despite Lance Vassar dragging the whole team down. For once, James's dad didn't rise to the topic of Quidditch. Considering what's happening, he said quietly, staying out of the tournament might not be a bad thing. James slid off his armchair onto the hearthrug, wincing as he accidentally bumped his wrist. So you know about the big Quidditch summit with all the magical and muggle government people? Harry's face tensed and James could see that it was a sensitive topic. I only know because it was in the Prophet. Titus is in charge of security for the whole event, while I'm being sent to Pakistan to audit a flying carpet warehouse. But, James spluttered, but that's not even aura work. Dad, what's going on? That's what I asked loquacious Knapp, Harry nodded darkly. I went straight to his office, didn't even say hi to Percy when he tried to stop me. The Minister of Magic says that I'm too valuable to risk on such tetchy missions. He also says that since Revalvier's books were famous even in the Muggle world, my presence would be a distraction. Rose frowned. But that's ridiculous. The whole point of showing the Muggle leaders a Quidditch match is to show them we're friendly. If you're already known to them, at least as a fictional character, you'd form the perfect bridge into the magical world. You're thinking about it too logically, Rose. Harry shook his head. Or not with the right kind of logic. None of what the minister said makes any sense, unless there's something else going on, some other more secret plan. They want you gone, James said slowly, his eyes widening. Because you might not go along with this secret plan of theirs. You might stop them. Harry seemed to shrug wearily. It may not be that obvious. 
I honestly don't think Lucretius Knapp himself knows what he's doing or why he's doing it. He's a politician, not a strategist. Talking's what he's best at. Managing the crisis of a crumbling vow of secrecy is completely out of his depth. He's relying more and more on his team of advisors. He goes along with pretty much everything they say. Rose narrowed her eyes suspiciously, making her look to James very much like her mother. Who are these advisors? Do you know them? There are several of them, Harry said. People from the Office of Ambassadorial Relations, mostly. But there's one that Knapp seems to rely on more than anyone. An unspeakable. James cocked his head quizzically. An unspeakable? Rose grunted with impatience. Someone who works for the Department of Mysteries. They're called unspeakables because no one really knows what they do. And they never, ever talk about it. James glanced from Rose's annoyed expression to the face of his father, gazing up at him from the glowing coals. Who is it, Dad? You know, but you're not telling us. I'm not telling you for a good reason, Harry admitted. I don't want you to worry about it, and I know you well enough to know that you will. He shifted his gaze to Rose. Both of you. Headmaster Grudge, Rose exclaimed suddenly, her eyes brightening. That's it, isn't it? He was in the photo with the Minister of Magic when the summit was announced, along with the Muggle Prime Minister. That's why no one had ever heard of him before he was named Headmaster. He's an unspeakable from the Department of Mysteries. Next time, Harry said, trying to conceal a disgruntled smile. I'm waiting until you go to bed too, Rose. Oh, tosh, Rose objected. None of you would get anywhere without my mum and me. So if Grudge is the Minister's main advisor, James thought aloud, then he's the one keeping you away from the big Quidditch summit. For some reason, he doesn't want you to be there. Rose looked uncomfortable. But Grudge is the headmaster. He can't be the one planning to set off some magical doomsday weapon. It would kill him as well, along with any number of students. She shivered, apparently reluctant to believe anyone would be capable of such things. James, however, saw the truth on his father's face. Some people would indeed be willing to murder hundreds of students, and even die themselves, if they were crazy enough, or committed enough to their cause, or both. For what it's worth, Rose, he said carefully, I think you're half right. If there is indeed a plot to attack the Quidditch summit, and if Warlick was murdered to cover it up, then I don't believe that Grudge is behind it. He may be like the minister himself, a willing dupe, influenced by someone deeper in the shadows. Dad, James said, lowering his voice and leaning close to the fire. We may know who that person is. From the hearth, Harry studied his son's face. I have a pretty good idea myself, James. I've been calling in some favours with a few low-level contacts at the American Muggle Integration Bureau. This new vice president of theirs, the wizard who you say calls himself the Collector, virtually no one has ever heard of him. Apparently, he was the protégé of the senator that was killed last year, Charles Fillmore. At least, that's the story the Muggle newspeople are reporting, but there's no evidence that it's actually true. As far as I can tell, he simply appeared out of nowhere. If he is indeed a wizard taking advantage of the broken vow of secrecy, then his plan may be to murder the American president and assume his position. Rose nodded. Sorry, Uncle Harry, we already figured that bit out. But that's not who I'm talking about, James said, exasperated. When we discovered Warlick's body, we saw someone else. Well. At least Lucia and I did. Harry tilted his head. Who's Lucia? That's not important, James insisted. The point is... He paused, suddenly unsure how precisely he should proceed. How should he tell his dad that one of the most important people in his life, the long-dead Albus Dumbledore, seemed to have a sort of evil twin, a mysterious dark mirror in the form of Avior Dorchaskathan? Suddenly James heard Avior's own words echoing in his head accompanied by the deep chill of the Durmstrang classroom. "'It would be best, Mr. Potter,' the hauntingly familiar wizard had said calmly, almost kindly, "'if you did not tell your father about this, Harry might be a bit conflicted.'" James felt stymied before the patient gaze of his father. The words dried up, and he found he simply could not speak. Finally, Harry himself broke the silence. I know this is all very worrisome and confusing, he said, addressing both James and Rose, and I'm sorry that you lot have got involved in this at all. I wish I could tell you what I've told you in the past, that this isn't your problem, that we adults will handle it. 
But the fact is, you are no longer exactly children yourselves. You've seen too much. Here Harry looked directly at his son, and James knew what he was thinking of. Poor, lost cousin Lucy, held in Ralph's arms, carried through nightmare after nightmare. No matter how much I might wish otherwise, Harry went on, this isn't only my battle. I told you at the beginning of this year, James, that I might need to rely on you, that you might be in a position to do what I cannot. It seems that that time has come. A sudden chill of fear descended upon James at these words. He hadn't realized how comforting his father's old reassurances had been, assurances that the world was an essentially safe place and didn't need to be saved by him and Ralph, Zane and Rose, that the adults were in charge and were fully equipped to handle anything that came their way, that his only duties were to his schoolwork and his friends and to enjoy being young and free of weighty responsibilities. He had always rejected those assurances, always chosen to involve himself anyway, and to bring along those of his friends who were willing to help. Now he realized that there was a secret luxury in assuming responsibilities that weren't his, the luxury of knowing that no one expected him to succeed, the luxury, at the heart of it all, to fail. James met his father's eyes and nodded slowly. He swallowed and heard an audible click in his throat. Whatever you need, Dad. Harry closed his eyes, seeming to war within himself. He drew a deep breath. Your mother would kill me if she knew I was asking this, he admitted seriously. But here it is. What I need from both of you is to be my ears. Loquacious Knapp may not know what is really happening, but Rector Grudge just might. Surely he knows more than the minister at any rate, but— he added quickly, his expression turning stern. I am not telling you to go spying on him. I'm not giving you permission to do anything daft that might get you caught. Filch would love nothing more than to pour his torture out on you lot. Corsica too, James added fervently. I'm only telling you, Harry went on, ignoring this, to keep your ears open. If there are any more attempts to stifle the flow of information in and out of the school, if there are any new decrees or rules about what teachers are allowed to teach or what clubs are permitted to meet, or if there are any other changes to the way things are done, I need you to let me know. Grudge won't come out and say what's coming, but we might learn something just by the preparations he makes. James ran a hand through his hair in frustration. But how can we tell you anything even if we want to? All our post here is searched, remember? I've already thought about that. Harry said, firming his voice. Just send a note to your mum saying you miss her cooking. She'll be happy to hear from you, and I'll know that you need me to contact you. Be here in the common room when everyone else goes to bed, and I'll find you. James nodded his understanding. But what should we be watching for most of all? What are we most hoping to figure out? Harry shook his head slowly. Anything at all. I'm totally in the dark here. You have no idea how frustrating that is. If I get caught so much as asking the wrong questions, I suspect I'll be shut down completely, possibly put on extended leave. But what we really need to know, more than anything, he admitted with a sigh, is if the Morrigan web is a real thing. And if so, what does it do? We can't hope to stop it if we can't answer those questions first. Rose glanced at James, her face tense and her eyes bright. James resisted the urge to look back at her. Got it he said soberly. We'll keep our ears open, Dad, and let you know if anything changes around here. Harry seemed to accept this. I need to go. Your mother says hello and that she loves you. She also says to be sure to keep up with all your studies and to eat a vegetable every now and then, and pass the same on to Albus and Lil. I will, Dad, James replied, hardly listening. And Rose, Harry added, turning to her. Much love from your mum and dad as well. Keep your eye on James, Albus and Lil, won't you? Rose brightened and sat up straight. I will, Uncle Harry. You can trust me. Harry gave her a bemused half-smile. Good night, you two. I expect you both to be in bed in five minutes. The map will tell me if you aren't. James and Rose offered mumbled assurances and bid Harry good night. A moment later, his head vanished from the coals. You know what we have to do, Rose prodded James the moment they were alone. 
We have to go with Zane into the cellars at Alma Alaron and find that old witch, Crone Lauser. She's the only person who might know what the Morrigan Web really is. You're right, James nodded thoughtfully. I guess. But there's something else I need to do first. What? Rose demanded. You heard your dad. The Morrigan Web is our biggest concern. Until we figure that out, it's all hopeless. James stared into the fire, frowning deeply. I saw Petra the other night, he admitted quietly. The night we found Warlick dead in the woods. I talked to her. Rose was silent as she stared at him, her mouth pressed into a worried line. She seemed to consider several questions, but finally settled on, What did she say? She said that we were getting too close, he said, finally raising his eyes to hers. She warned me to let it go, to not try to stop her. Rose's face paled and her eyes widened. When she spoke, her voice was a harsh whisper. So she really is involved in all of this then? But why? Why would she do anything so awful? I don't know, James said emphatically, but I've been thinking about it ever since. It's almost like... Like she doesn't think there's any other way. Like, as terrible as it's going to be, it's better than the alternative. Rose narrowed her eyes at him seriously. James, she said, I know you've always had a sort of thing for her. James blinked at his cousin in surprise and annoyance. Rose, don't be— Petra is pretty, she interrupted. But that doesn't mean she's good or right. We've discussed this. I know, Rose, James rolled his eyes and slumped back against the armchair. Don't you think I know that by now? So what are you going to do? That's what I was about to tell you, he sighed deeply. She thinks we are getting too close. She said it after we found Warlick's body, but I don't think that's what made her appear to me to warn us away. Rose shook her head impatiently. Well, what was it then? James turned his head to look at her. I think it's Avior, he said firmly. Petra knew that we saw him, maybe even that he wanted us to see him. Somehow she knows that Avior is the key to the whole thing. Rose considered this. So what do we do? That's the easy part, I guess, James replied reluctantly. I take him up on his offer of a visit in his office. He won't just tell you all of his deepest, darkest secrets, Rose frowned. You know? James said, raising his eyebrows consideringly. I think he just might. The plan, as it turned out, was deceptive in its simplicity, but fraught with hazards. I feel like I'm going to vomit, James mumbled through a fake smile, weaving his way through intimidatingly unfamiliar Durmstrang corridors lined with imposing statues, pillars, and frowning grey-clad young men. Next to him, smiling much more eagerly and comfortably, Nastasha shrugged. Maybe you should just you can get it over with, you know? It sure couldn't make us any more totally conspicuous than we already are. As she spoke, James sidled past a knot of Durmstrang boys in the crowded hall. One of the boys scowled at him suspiciously, while the others muttered, their eyes narrowed at the scurrying interlopers. We don't have anything to worry about, Nastasha proclaimed, pushing out her chin as they turned a corner. We've been invited to Professor Avior's office. Or at least you have, but I'm totally his favorite student. What's your problem, Jughead? This last was to a very stocky boy with a brick-red face and a flat crew cut who bumped her shoulder as she passed. She glared back at him challengingly. You want to tango with me? I'm walking here. Nastasha, shut up, James hissed, grabbing the sleeve of her Alma Alaron blazer and yanking her onward. Are you trying to start a row? Not afraid of one, if that's what you mean? she answered loudly, still glowering back over her shoulder. These stuffed robes are all bark and no bite, am I right? James shook his head nervously, resisting the urge to run the rest of the way to Avior's office. Are you sure this is the right way? How should I know? Nastasha shrugged. You're the one with the written invitation. You were there when we planned this. Didn't you pay any attention? Oh, for hexing hinky punks, a voice rasped behind James. It's right there at the end of the hall. Signs on the door. Can't either of you read? James wheeled on the spot, but there was no one behind him. Who said that? he demanded. You're already nervous, a second voice whispered out of nowhere. You probably don't want to know. Oh, give it up, Nastasha sighed, 
glancing around the suddenly empty corridor. Classes have started. The coast is clear. She reached out, groped in thin air for a moment, and then closed her fist and yanked. A pair of heads appeared from beneath a flutter of invisible cloth. Hi, big brother, Albus grinned, his hair matted to his forehead. Rose and I thought it would be best to tag along all invisible-like. Hope you don't mind. James spluttered. But the invisibility cloak! He gestured wildly towards their still unseen bodies. It was just in Filch's office, Rose said. He may have Grudge's magical cane, but that doesn't make him any good at locking spells. We just popped in this morning and nicked it from his drawer of contraband. If we're careful, we'll get it back tonight before he even knows it's gone. And we'd bloody better well succeed, Albus nodded. Because if Filch catches on that it's gone, there's only one person he'll blame. Yeah, James exclaimed desperately, tapping his own chest. That'd be me, you great git. Are you trying to get me murdered by that sadistic squib? Nastasha tilted her head and said in a sing-song voice, I told you not to tell him. I didn't say anything, Rose frowned. It was Loudmouth here that couldn't keep quiet. Albus elbowed Rose under the cloak. You know, if I hadn't spoken up, we'd be stuck wandering these halls all day. James couldn't find his own bum with a beacon charm. Look, James interrupted. This is completely bloody mental. Why are you two even here? Rose firmed her jaw defensively. I'm here to snoop around Avia's quarters while you and Nastasha distract him. And I'm here because I helped Rose nick the cloak, Albus nodded. James pulled his own hair in exasperation. We don't need your help. If you get caught here, we're all totally doomed. We can't know that Avior will tell us anything meaningful, Nastasha sighed. And besides, they won't get caught, will you? Not if Loudmouth here can keep his lips sealed for more than thirty seconds, Rose said, tilting her head at Albus, who shrugged and rolled his eyes. All right, James declared helplessly. Just get back under the cloak and don't bump anything. Even if Avior can't see you, he's no idiot. If you so much as breathe wrong, he'll know you're there. Not to mention that he might have a sneakerscope or faux glass, Rose added, her voice muffled, as Albus yanked the cloak over them again. Good to know you've at least thought of all the ways this can go totally pear-shaped, James muttered, turning back towards Avior's closed door. Nastasha was already approaching it. She glanced back, assuring that Albus and Rose were sufficiently hidden, and then raised her hand and gave the brass door-knocker a sharp rap. Several seconds ticked by with no response. Experimentally, Nastasha tried the door latch. It was locked firm. Maybe he's not here, Albus said from beneath the cloak. Is he teaching, maybe? It's his scheduled office hours, James replied. At least it will be in a few minutes. We got here a little early. Still, he should be here. He reached up and rapped the door knocker himself, harder this time. The door knocker was fashioned in the shape of a brass tentacle attached to a squid headed figure with a man's body. It was exceptionally ugly, but thankfully, unlike many such ornaments, didn't seem to be enchanted with magical personality. Nobody here but us chickens, Nastasha sighed. Give it a go with an unlocking charm, James, Rose muttered, unseen behind his left shoulder. Those never work, James rolled his eyes. Every time I try one, it triggers some sort of counter jinx. I tried it on the newsstand in Hogsmeade and nearly got myself caught for it. Rose huffed impatiently. A moment later, her fist appeared from beneath the cloak, her wand outstretched. She tapped the latch of Avior's door with it. Hello, Amora! The latch flashed bright yellow and produced an audible click. The door creaked open slightly on its hinges. Honestly, James, Rose said as her wand hand vanished again, you're as bad with unlocking doors as Filch is with locking them. Nastasha giggled. Too nervous to be embarrassed, James leaned forward and gave the door a tentative push. It creaked ominously open, revealing a dim, circular room lined with high, straight-backed chairs, stocked bookshelves, and an assortment of freestanding, evil-looking divining instruments. There were no Yuxa Baslatma plants here, James saw as he inched into the shadowy room, but there was a complicated telescope-like device, its lenses pointed strangely at the floor. A dark crystal ball, like a gigantic black pearl on an ancient stone pedestal, and, strangest of all, a sort of ornately polished wooden box, as tall as a man, with a window set into its front. 
Behind the glass, encased in the box like a corpse in a coffin, was a thin man-shape wearing a turban and a pointed black beard. Arcing above the figure's window were the words, Tawil at Umur, Knows all, tells all. I've seen one of those before, Nastasha commented, approaching the boxed figure. At a muggle carnival in New Jersey. It's a clockwork wizard. Put a coin in the slot, and he's supposed to tell your future. Daft, if you ask me, Albus muttered, unseen. No fireplace, Rose whispered with a shiver in her voice. The room was, James noticed, wintry cold. This is just the waiting area, he commented, looking around. There's got to be a way further in. I bet this guy knows it, Nastasha said, cocking her head up at the clockwork wizard in the wooden box. Old Tawil at Umur, any of you have any money? She tapped the coin slot with her wand. At the touch of her wand, lights glared to life inside the box, illuminating the bearded figure. With a series of ratchets and clanks, it jerked to life, leaning back and tilting its head towards the ceiling. Its sculpted hands raised and made a clumsy ratcheting dance before its pointed beard. James jumped backwards, bumping into the hidden shapes of Albus and Rose. No coin is required for such as thee, a deep recorded voice crackled loudly, emanating from a brass speaker on the front of the crate. Only the unwashed need pay for their glimpse of the beyond. Ask what ye will, my masters, while the curse of life lies upon me. The light of the clockwork wizard illuminated Nastasha's face as she stared up at it, beaming. She glanced back at James and rolled her eyes. Oh, you big baby, it's just a talking machine. What are you afraid of? James shook his head. Are you sure it's just a, you know, a machine? It's a bunch of gears and flywheels in a turban, you dolled, Nastasha said, looking back up at the bearded figure. But, boy, is it good. Professor Cloverhoof would flip his horns if he could see it. Behind James's shoulder, Rose's voice was slightly higher than usual. So, ask it how to get into Avior's main quarters, why don't you? Alas, the recorded voice blared, accompanied by the halting movements of the clockwork wizard. None but the great master himself may proceed thence. Seat thyselves and await his return. There's got to be another way in, Albus complained. This is getting us nowhere. Look around for a door or something. James shook his head, glancing around the dark, cold room. Maybe this isn't Avior's quarters at all. Maybe it's just where he meets students and stuff. You mean we tacked along with you under this smelly old cloak for nothing? Rose groused. Nobody asked you to come along, James countered. I still say you're both completely mad. Nastasha was studying the clockwork figure in its box, a thoughtful look on her face. Hey, Towel, she said. You know where Professor Avior's rooms are, don't you? The figure's painted eyes didn't move. After a moment, the head cocked back and forth jerkily, and the hands made their complicated dance again. Alas, none but the great master himself may proceed thence, the recorded voice repeated. Seat thyselves and await his return. It shut off with an audible click, and the lights fell dead. The mechanical figure slumped forward. Nastasha narrowed her eyes. What? Albus said from the center of the round room. With a shuffle, he tossed off the invisibility cloak and ran a hand through his matted hair. Am I missing something here? Nastasha didn't take her eyes from the dormant figure in its darkened box. Acid pops, she said. James blinked. Excuse me? What is she talking about? Rose said in a brittle voice. Shouldn't we just be heading back? Albus turned to glare at his cousin. What's the matter with you all of a sudden? This was your idea. I've just got a bad feeling about this thing, she declared defensively. And, well, cockroach cluster, Nastasha said, taking a step closer to the wooden box. Inside, the dormant figure hunched motionless. What's she on about? Albus muttered out of the corner of his mouth, nodding towards Nastasha. Is she, you know, quite all right? Nastasha? James said worriedly, moving to join her next to the dark box. Maybe we should— Fizzing Wisby, Nastasha interrupted, raising her voice. Inside the box, the dark figure remained motionless, silhouetted behind the dusty glass. Why is she doing that? Rose demanded. Make her stop. 
Wait just a moment here, Albus said slowly, realization dawning on him. Rose is afraid of clockworks. That's it, isn't it? I'm not afraid of them, she hissed shrilly. I just don't trust them. They're really, really dodgy. Everyone knows that. Always turning evil at the drop of a hat, getting cursed and coming to life and developing a taste for human blood. Rose is afraid of clockworks. Albus sang gleefully. I can't believe it, brave cousin Rose. What time is it, Rose? Oh, you wouldn't know, because you'd have to consult a clock. Shut up, Al, James demanded. Nastasha, seriously, let's just get out of here. There's no point. Sherbet Lemon, Nastasha announced, nodding to herself with satisfaction. The lights popped back on inside the clockwork wizard's box. Rose clutched James's shoulders in alarm as the mechanical wizard jerked back to life ratcheting and squeaking noisily. Password accepted, the recorded voice squawked from its speaker. Enter if you dare, and let the consequences be upon thine own head. With a complicated clank, the front of the box pivoted aside, forming a door. Behind it, the clockwork figure of Tawil at Umar stood full length, its robe hanging limp around hinged mechanical legs. Its wooden feet were carved with sandals and covered in flaking, flesh-coloured paint. It stepped haltingly out of the cabinet, its joints squeaking, and its head bowing obediently. Lights flickered to life deep inside the wooden box, and James saw that it was actually a doorway into a much larger room. He glanced from the suddenly revealed doorway to Nastasha. How do you know? She shrugged evasively. Lucky guess? Well, Alba spoke up. Are you going in or what? James glanced back. Rose's face was as pale as a tombstone. She tore her gaze away from the clockwork man and met his eyes. Jerkily, she nodded. Let's be quick about it, he said. If Avior isn't here, he's bound to be back at any moment. He turned back to the doorway formed by the wooden box. Beyond it, a large dark room flickered with blue light. Complicated shadows leapt on the high walls and ceilings. He braced himself, felt Rose clutch his shoulders again from behind, and stepped forward. Chapter 15 Origins Unveiled The inner chamber of Professor Avior's office was circular and much warmer than the waiting area had been. Flames roared in the maw of a monstrous fireplace. Pillars lined the room, stretching up into shadowy vaults. Looks a lot like the headmaster's office back at Hogwarts, Albus commented. And what is it in that cage? That's not an actual phoenix, is it? James and Rose followed Albus to a very large cage standing on an ornate brass stand. The creature inside seemed to take up every inch of space where it hunched on a low perch. The cage floor was littered with what appeared to be rodent bones, all charred black. That's no regular phoenix, Rose said, curling her lip. It's a jiskra, sometimes called a black phoenix. See the two heads? Cool. Albus leaned close, peering through the bars. It looks more like a feathered lizard than a bird. The head nearest him reared back between its furled wings. The beak split open, revealing rows of tiny pointed teeth, and the creature hissed exhaling a foul-smelling mist. Holy! Albus spat, leaping back and waving his hands to disperse the Jiskra's wet, acrid breath. What the bloody hell was that? Defense mechanism, Nastasha giggled. Another name they go by is Death Breath. It's a good thing the other head's asleep. James kept a safe distance from the monstrous bird thing. Dumbledore had his phoenix, he mused darkly. Avior has... This thing. Near the enormous cage on its stand, a large wooden desk was covered to overflowing with parchments, inks, books, instruments, and, strangely, an oversized wizard chess set. James approached this, examining the pieces where they stood in mid play on the board. The black figures seemed to be made of ebony, while the white figures sparkled in the firelight like diamond. Someone really likes their board games, Albus said as he joined James near the desk. Who's winning, do you think? James shook his head. Ralph would know. He's the chess player, not me. Too bad Ralph wasn't invited to this little party, Albus shrugged, turning away. Neither were you, James mumbled grumpily. 
In truth, he would have preferred Ralph under the cloak than Albus. He leaned closer to the chess set, intrigued. The figures seemed strangely familiar. He studied the ebony king where it stood on its square. It was tall, robed, with a hood covering most of its face and thin, knuckly hands protruding from its sleeves. He gasped with recognition. What? Rose whispered immediately. What did you find? Come here, James gestured, not tearing his eyes from the board. Look! Rose joined him, huddling shoulder to shoulder. She leaned over the board with a puzzled expression. James glanced at her. Do you see it? The Ebony King? Rose studied the figure for a moment and then clapped her hands over her mouth. It's that horrible wizard we ran into in New Amsterdam, she said through her fingers. The Collector! The new American Vice President, James nodded. But look next to him. Look at the Queen. Rose leaned closer, her eyes bright, worried. Is that? She frowned, confused. Who is it? James glanced down at the tall, feminine figurine, resplendent in long robes, her carved hair falling down her back in waves, and her proud chin raised. The eyes were tiny green emeralds. It's the Lady of the Lake, he said firmly. I'd recognize her anywhere. Rose's frown deepened as she studied the figure. Are you... are you sure? Of course I'm sure, James answered. He glanced aside at his cousin. Why? Rose seemed reluctant to answer. Because, well, to me, she sort of seems like... She looked aside at him, her eyes bright in the darkness. Like Petra. James opened his mouth to protest, but as he did so, he dropped his eyes to the chessboard again. Carved in black ebony, the figure's cascading hair did suddenly look like Petra's dark locks. The raised chin could be seen as determined rather than proud. The eyes now seemed to be pale blue amethysts. Who were the figures on the other side? Rose asked, changing the subject. It's hard to tell. What are they made of? Crystal? Diamond? James leaned closer. Firelight played on the facets of the opposing figures, obscuring their details. The king was tall, with unruly hair and a pair of tiny, unmistakable spectacles. As if there was any doubt about the identity of this figure, a tiny lightning bolt glowed faintly, etched onto its forehead. Rose saw this at the same time as he. She grabbed his elbow. It's your dad, she whispered. And the queen! It's... Is that my mum? But James shook his head slowly, tensely. No, Rose, that's not your mum. That's Jackpot! Nastasha's voice suddenly sang out. I think you're all going to want to see this! James looked up, following the sound of Nastasha's voice. He was about to tell her that what she had found certainly couldn't compare to the eerily familiar chess pieces but closed his mouth as the pink-haired girl parted a heavy, intricately embroidered curtain. Beyond it, a blue torch flickered to life, illuminating a tiny circular alcove. The space was entirely empty, but for a high wooden table, and upon it, a small book. Nastasha glanced back at them with a crooked smile. I may be mistaken, she said, but I think that is a diary. James glanced at Rose, whose face was still unusually pale. Together, they rounded the desk and approached the curtained alcove. Albus joined them there. As one, the four students crept inside, surrounding the tiny table. The book was surprisingly small, its page edges rough and thick, its cover made of deeply tanned leather. To James's eye, it did indeed look like a sort of personal journal or notebook. You found it, nasty, Albus said, nudging Nastasha. You do the honours and open it up. Not me, she replied, taking a step backwards. I'm all for snooping around and all, but I smell curse on that thing. She glanced at James, and for the first time there was something like fear in her expression. He shuddered and turned back to the book. Well, he gulped, what else did we come here for? Quickly, before he could reconsider, he reached forward and touched the leather cover, bracing himself. Nothing happened. He glanced back at the others. Get on with it, Albus declared. 
What, are you hoping it'll suck you into its pages or something? The moment broke. James rolled his eyes and turned his attention back to the book. He flipped back the cover carefully, revealing a creamy blank page. Was the writing invisible, perhaps? He stared at it, waiting for something to happen. When it didn't, he turned the first page, then the next. There, on the third page, was a neat column of handwriting. He leaned over it. In a low, tense voice, he began to read. This is an account of the unspoken and hidden life and times of— He paused as a wave of coldness fell over him, chilling him to his heels. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. Behind him, Rose gasped. Holy hinky-punks, Albus said in an awestruck voice. My namesake, the Big Al himself. Hush, Nastasha said quietly. Go on, James. James nodded. Taking a deep breath, he continued. I fear that this shall not be a happy account, and it is quite possibly as private a record as has ever existed, chronicled by my own hand for whatever peace of mind it may offer. The memories caged in these written words would much more cheerfully be relegated to the comfort of the pensive, hidden away and forgotten, but alas, as will soon be revealed, that is an impossible luxury forbidden to this woeful tale. But first a forewarning for anyone who, either by mistake or subterfuge, finds themselves viewing these words. As you peer into the void, be assured that the void peers into you. Let it be known that by reading this account, I shall be reading your thoughts and marking you. The curse that will result shall not be on my head. Indeed, I may not even wish you harm, but it will befall you nonetheless. Some costs cannot be paid with other than blood. For your sake and my peace of mind, turn back now. James took an involuntary step back from the table and the leather diary. Called it, Nastasha said faintly. Should we go on? Rose asked, her voice nearly a whisper. Oh, good grief, Albus rolled his eyes. It's just a standard warning curse. We Slytherins put them on everything, up to and including our to-do lists. Only first years are afraid of them. But this is the diary of Albus Dumbledore, Rose countered. He wasn't just some Slytherin with a power complex. He was one of the most powerful wizards ever. Fine, whatever, Albus shrugged tersely. Back out now. Let's head back home and do our arithmancy homework. What do you say? Nastasha giggled again and then nudged James gently forward. Dumbledore is dead and buried, she said. He can't curse anyone any more. Go on, James. Keep reading. Easy for you to say, he mumbled. And yet he knew that Nastasha and Albus were right. This is what they had come for, after all. He used his finger to find his place on the page again and resumed reading. I suppose one could say that I grew up in a happy home, and that there were times of simple, uncomplicated joy. I abided with my mother, Kendra, after the imprisonment of my father, Percival, a man I only dimly remember, but have always known by the rather confused legacy he left behind. He was sentenced to Azkaban after attacking a cabal of muggle boys, an act of fatherly vengeance. The boys had traumatized my young sister, Ariana, over a display of simple, childlike magic. This is what is known. What is not known is that I blamed my father for his absence in the years to follow. His act of revenge on those who had devastated his only daughter was understandable, but thoughtless. It took him from us, and I cannot but think that if he had remained... If his blind rage had not overwhelmed his prudence and sent him to prison, this unfortunate tale would have ended much differently. For instance, my father would not have liked Gellert Grindelwald. Had he been there, he'd have said Gellert was a boy with airs, a pompous, talented young aristocrat who enjoyed more than anything hearing himself speak. I know this because my mother told me so on many occasions and I remembered my father well enough to know that she was quite correct. It was this very thing, most likely, that drove me to befriend young Gellert Grindelwald, despite his careless arrogance and heady delusions of grandeur. 
He was living with his aunt for the summer, having been expelled from Durmstrang Academy for recklessness and rabble-rousing. That fact alone would have prompted my father to forbid any fraternization with Gellert, but my father, quite simply, was not there. He had betrayed all of us by being sent to Azkaban. Indeed, mine was a small boy's hurt, buried under a young man's rebellion, and this had but one inevitable result. Since my father would not have approved of Gellert Grindelwald, I intended to wholeheartedly embrace him. And it was not difficult. Gellert and I were very much of one mind, idealistic, ambitious, ready to change the world and damn the age-old institutions that held us back. Of course, many of our ideas were foolhardy. Some of them were, in point of fact, dangerously naive, even fascistic. But we were young and essentially powerless. Rhetoric was free, without consequence, and we reveled in it. I spent more and more of my time with Gellert as I finished my own schooling and embarked on careless adventures. We pursued the vaunted Deathly Hallows. We campaigned for changes in the laws of secrecy, extolling the mutual benefits of full disclosure to the muggle world. Besides being a formidable wizard, Gellert was a gifted speaker, using his natural charm and magnetism to gather a following everywhere he went. Within two years, we had earned enough of an audience to no longer be merely young men toying with revolution. When I looked around us, I saw that the revolution was no longer hypothetical. It was swiftly becoming a reality. And I began to doubt. It was an exquisitely uncomfortable time for me. Gellert did not understand my reservations, of course. I tried to persuade him, discovering perhaps a step too late that I was, despite my best efforts, my father's son after all. On the most instinctive level, I sensed the flaws and dangers in our plan. I realized Gellert's idealism was driven less by altruism and more by ego. He did not merely wish to benefit the Muggle world, but to oversee them. To him, they were rather like a race of talking pets, friendly animals for which one feels some affection and concern, but which one must eventually rule for the greater good of all. I could not debate Gellert in public, for I had no wish to undermine him. I hoped to persuade him in private, to subtly alter the direction of the revolution that was bubbling around us. But he was immune to doubt. His unshakable conviction, bolstered by both his natural confidence and his singular magical prowess, was beyond the reach of my persuasion. Eventually, regrettably, we parted ways. Disillusioned and defeated, I returned to Godric's Hollow, only to find that my absence, like that of my father, had taken a marked toll on my family. My mother appeared to have aged a decade. Aberforth had become sullen and angry. Ariana was, if anything, even more withdrawn, buried so deep in the web of her own haunted memories that even I could not always coax her to speak. In the years after being attacked by the boys in our old neighborhood, Ariana continued to stifle her magic, to compress it deep inside her, so that it occasionally burst forth involuntarily. This was sometimes harmless, mere flashes of light or freakish rains of frogs outside the cottage windows, and sometimes dangerous, with crockery hurtling suddenly against the walls, fire erupting from the hearth or the entire cottage shaking on its foundation as if in the teeth of an earthquake. It had always been bad, but it was getting far worse. I understood this more than anyone in my family. Magical power is like any other energy, essentially indestructible. If it is not spent, it does not go away, but builds, creating pressures that, in even the most benign cases, inevitably burst forth. The most disturbing detail of my return home, however, was in learning that my father had died in Azkaban. This simultaneously seemed the least obvious but most pervasive influence over our household. 
Naberforth stubbornly refused my help in caring for the cottage and our meager land. In my heart I did not blame him, although my youth would not allow me to admit it. I had been gone for nearly three years, after all, leaving my brother to manage everything on his own. Nonetheless, I did what I could, attempting to relegate myself to a life of simple hard work, at least for a time. And yet, as the days passed, I sensed an abiding secret in our home. My return to Godric's Hollow had complicated the lives of my family in some deep, unspoken way. It needled at me with a sense of something under the surface driving Aberforth's rage, deepening the lines on my mother's face, pushing Ariana further into the fugue of her thoughts and the increasing pressure of her stifled powers. Three weeks after my return, as night settled beyond the windows of the cottage and the fire crackled in the hearth, I confronted them all, asking to know what they were keeping from me. Even now, Quite honestly and sincerely, I wish I had not. I have devoted my life to the accumulation of knowledge, and yet if there is one thing I have learned that I wish I had known on that night, it is this. Some things are best left unknown. Sometimes curiosity is a poison, not only for he who drinks it, but for everyone around him. I had not yet learned this, Thus, I demanded that my family tell me their poison truth. They did not wish to. They resisted me passionately, but I would not be denied. My frustration at not being able to change Gelert Grindelwald's mind made me stubbornly insistent to have my way with my much more pliable family. And in the end, after much shouting, after Aberforth had stormed out into the night, not even closing the door behind him, my mother sobbing by the fire, and Ariana kneeling before her, silhouetted so that I could not even see her face as she spoke. It was she herself that told the tale. Ariana, my young sister, was with child. With that knowledge, I understood everything. Aberforth's worried rage, my mother's mounting fear, and Ariana's increasing instability. After all, what could cause more raw havoc in a woman's mind and body than the fundamentally visceral process of pregnancy? The father was a muggle, a young man in the village. Ariana insisted that she loved him, that he understood her, and that she ardently desired to marry him. Aberforth patently refused this, of course, going so far as to threaten the young man if he so much as showed his face at the cottage door. My mother, for her part, was torn between desiring her daughter's happiness and the abject terror that, without the constant supervision of her family, Ariana would lose control of her stifled powers with catastrophic results. In this, of course, she was quite unfortunately prophetic. On that night, the powder keg that was my family became fully known to me. Ariana was entering her third month with child, only just beginning to show the bulge of her belly, and as the baby grew, so did the tension in the cottage. Ariana's uncontrollable fits became more pronounced. One morning, as the common sickness of pregnancy took her, she split the kitchen butcher block with a mere look. A week later, as she took to the weeds behind the cottage to wretch, a quantity of black ooze vomited from the chimney like a volcano of tar. It became more and more difficult to predict what might spawn one of Ariana's events, which subsequently made them much more difficult to manage. Aberforth spent his time out of the house working the land, which left me and my mother to tend to Ariana. These were some of the most interminable and difficult months of my life. My only distraction, unpleasant as it was, was the news of my old friend Grindelwald. On his own, he had become a political power, so pervasive that he threatened the Ministry of Magic itself. Those who followed him did so with a nearly fanatical devotion. Those who opposed him portrayed him as a totalitarian powermonger, threatening not only the stability of society, but the very foundation of muggle and magical coexistence. And in my heart, 
I knew that those fears were not unreasonable. Grindelwald would not deviate from his plan to eventually subjugate the muggle world beneath his purportedly benevolent boot heel. He would not doubt himself, because he was utterly convinced that his goals were right and good. His mantra, our mantra, if I am to be completely honest, was the prevailing doctrine that anything was acceptable for the greater good. Of course, I now knew that the vilest evils in the world could be justified by that cause. I gradually came to accept the fact that somehow, some way, my long-time friend and compatriot had to be stopped. And yet, this problem would have to wait. I had learned my lesson. The duty to my family was my first priority. And amazingly, in the midst of it all, there were still moments of beauty. The time I spent with my sister necessarily drew me closer to her than I had ever been. I began to understand her unconscious impetus to deny her powers. What had begun as a defense mechanism had become a habit so ingrained that it was insurmountable. She had erected a barricade in herself so strong that she herself could no longer breach it. But the young witch inside that barricade was still there, beautiful and charming and eerily intelligent, whenever I could coax her to show herself. We talked for hours at a stretch, and I began to realize something amazing. She truly did love the father of her child. She had met him on one of the frequent trips into the village, accompanied, as always, by the watchful eye of our mother. In a way, it was my mother's vigilance that facilitated their meeting. Ariana was always left outside the shop, waiting patiently on a bench for fear of having an incident inside. There, waiting primly and obediently, she had caught the eye of the son of the shop owner, himself just back from university and preparing to begin a new life. He wanted nothing more than to make Ariana a part of that life. He had no knowledge of her heritage. To him, she was just a girl in the village with a rather overbearing mother. He began to watch for her appearances on the bench outside his father's shop and to meet her there. Their courtship, short but bright, took root during those brief meetings. Soon enough, Ariana began to meet him in secret, arranging rendezvous in the wood between our cottage and the village. Now, of course, those meetings were prohibited. Aberforth watched over Ariana fiercely, never allowing her to leave the cottage on her own. I could not argue with my brother. Like my father, Aberforth's passions ran deep and implacable, but I could not allow Ariana's heart to be so broken. I took her with me, just once, into the village to see her man. As I bided my time in the shop, using muggle money to purchase a deliberately time-consuming list of sundry goods, Ariana met the young man once again on the bench outside. I observed this through the window, and it was, to be sure, a wistfully sweet sight. The young man, Timothy was his name, was obviously quite smitten by Ariana. They barely touched as they spoke, forming the very picture of demure propriety. But he did once place a hand upon her protruding belly, carefully concealed beneath an oversized frock and apron. It was rather heartbreaking and I wondered, fleetingly, if I was perhaps doing more harm than good by allowing it. And yet, I did not regret it, neither then nor now. One month later, the first defining tragedy of our family occurred. There are those who know that my sister Ariana inadvertently killed our mother, Kendra Dumbledore. It happened when Ariana lost control of her powers catastrophically causing a magical explosion that destroyed the rear bedroom of our cottage. No one knows the impetus of that explosion, other than that Ariana was disturbed, psychologically damaged, a danger to herself and everyone around her. I, of course, know the whole truth. Ariana did not lose control because she was mad or angry or mentally broken. She lost control because she was giving birth. 
The stress of bringing her baby into the world unleashed every shred of the magic that she had pent inside herself for the past decade. The birth of one life marked the ending of another. Some might call that rather poetic, I suppose. James paused his reading as the shock of these revelations took root in his mind. He had heard about Dumbledore's unfortunate past, of course, Thanks to Rita Skeeter's tell-all book, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, the whole of the magical world knew of Dumbledore's one-time friendship with the notorious Gellert Grindelwald, as well as his defining family tragedies. And yet, not even the salacious gossip of Skeeter's book had hinted at the darkest secret of all. Young Ariana's illegitimate child, born of a muggle father, whose birth served as a harbinger of death. I feel like we shouldn't be reading this, Rose said softly. James nodded. It isn't the curse, it's just too private. Bugger privacy, Albus countered. All due respect and everything, but the bloke's dead. What I want to know is how in the world this diary got here. Why does some dodgy Durmstrang professor have it? How did he get his hands on such a thing? Read some more, James, Nastasha nodded with uncharacteristic gravity. What happened next? James was reluctant to go on, but knew it was the only thing to do. They'd come too far to turn back now. He leaned over the table once again and turned the page. Aberforth and I buried our mother in the cemetery in Godric's Hollow. Few attended the funeral, which occurred on a dismayingly bright and cheerful day. Birds sang overhead, and the infant boy, as yet unnamed, cooed and squealed along with them, comfortable in his mother's arms, ignorant of the gravity of the occasion. Ariana did not speak at the funeral. Indeed, she was nearly mute from that day onward. She felt responsible, of course. In her mind, she had killed our mother. I tried to console her, but my words were empty, even to my own ears. The death of one's last parent is a singularly unsettling experience under the best of circumstances. These were hardly the best of circumstances. Unfortunately, as anyone who has lived through a tragedy knows, life does rather infuriatingly go on. Aberforth returned to his care of the cottage and the fields. Ariana devoted herself exclusively to her infant son, and I reconciled myself to the task I had known would inevitably fall to me, to confront my old friend, Gilead Grindelwald. Thanks to him and his growing numbers of supporters, rumors of revolution were shaking the Ministry of Magic to its roots. Nothing was certain, and fear was everywhere. Lines were being drawn between friends, neighbors, even family members, as both sides solidified, threatening an all-out fracture of the wizarding world. Thus, I wrote to Grindelwald, inviting a meeting. Do not bring an entourage, I requested. Come to where we first met, I suggested, to Godric's Hollow and our little cottage. There I proposed we meet as we had in years past as long-term comrades, brothers, friends. And he agreed. I see now that he thought I had changed my mind and repented of my disagreement with him. He came not as one prepared for confrontation, but rather as one embracing a contrite, wayward partner, a former dissenter who had seen the error of his ways. Perhaps that is why things went so poorly, so very quickly. The warm embrace that marked our reunion swiftly turned to strained conversation as we sat in the cottage kitchen, a pair of teacups growing cold between us. Gilead was, if anything, even more stubborn than in the past. He overruled my objections without pause, turning the debate against me, insisting that I was siding with the very forces I had formerly railed against, the old institutions of ignorance and tradition. He was passionate and zealous, repeating our old mantras as if they were natural laws. Progress demands change, restricting a wizard's full potential is slavery. The muggle world needs magical rule for its own good. 
Dominion is the natural course of human development. I grew angry as he overruled me point by point, but I managed to keep my composure, to attempt to win him over with reason and friendship, despite the growing heat in our voices and the fists that pounded the table, rattling our teacups. Finally, however, he stood abruptly, knocking over his chair. He pointed towards the still-damaged bedroom at the rear of the cottage. Your own mother is dead because of the ignorance of the muggles, he shouted. They attacked your poor sister, broke her mind, sent her spiraling into years of denial of her very magical nature. Your father was the only one with sense enough to strike back. And did the Ministry of Magic reward his bravery? No, they punished him for it. As a result, he is dead. Your mother is dead. Your brother is a hopeless herder of goats. And your poor witch sister is deranged beyond words. You are the worst kind of fool, Albus. A fool whose folly is a weapon unto itself. The blood of your family is on your hands. And I, for one, despise you for it. With this, of course, my temper broke. It was inevitable. I leapt to my feet. Wands flashed. I attempted a mere disarming spell, meaning only to subdue and shame him. He was too fast, however, countering instantly. And with that, the duel was engaged. Technically, we were quite evenly matched. Gilead, however, had expanded his grasp of dark magic since I had last seen him. And this threw me off balance, forced me to retreat, to defend rather than to attack. And yet, as the duel progressed, this was not my greatest weakness. The simple fact was that I did not truly wish to defeat my old friend. I had summoned him to reason with him, to convince him of the error of his plans. I had no desire to destroy him. I was partly responsible for him, after all. I had helped define his revolutionary ideologies, and even in that moment, some small part of me still clung to them. My divided mind hobbled me. Grindelwald, however, had the zeal of absolute conviction on his side. He was an unstoppable force, firmly in the teeth of his perceived destiny. He would kill me, I realized, and feel quite justified in doing so. It would be regrettable, but necessary, for the greater good. Spells flashed and exploded all around, illuminating and damaging the cottage as we fought. Fortunately, we were alone in our duel, both Ariana and Aberforth being out in the fields. The noise was indescribable, and I wondered that the cottage should be able to withstand such a magical onslaught. This was a distant concern, however, as my lack of conviction foretold my own impending loss. Gelert would defeat me, and all because I could not separate myself from the memory of our years together. I simply could not think of him as a true enemy, worthy of my fiercest attacks. Desperately, I broke away from the duel, turning my wand towards the hearth, destroying it and summoning an avalanche of broken stone. In the chaos, I escaped into the hall and ducked into a bedroom, sealing the door with an immobility charm. And only then did I learn that Gellert and I were not, in fact, alone in the cottage. Ariana's baby lay in the crib at the foot of the bed, his eyes wide, his tiny fists curled against his chest. He blinked at me, silently, still wrapped in bedclothes. Coldness enveloped me. I could not allow harm to come to the child, especially not after what Gellert had said to me, because deep down I feared he was correct. Perhaps I was partly responsible for everything that had happened so far. Perhaps I should have joined my father in attacking those who had harmed Ariana. Perhaps my mother's blood was indeed on my hands. I shook these thoughts from my head and clamped my eyes shut. It was this very duplicity that weakened me. At the moment, I had no luxury for self-doubt. If I was to save myself and my infant nephew... If I was to defeat my former friend and newfound nemesis, I needed something more than magical prowess. I needed conviction. I needed to rid myself of the memories that hobbled me. 
I had no pensive in those days, but I knew of their existence and had experimented with them. I knew that they allowed a wizard to extract and view his own memories. What I needed in that moment, however, was a method of completely removing memories from my own mind, if only temporarily, if only for the time it would take to defeat Grindelwald. I knew such magic was possible, albeit fraught with dangers. But, with no pensive at my disposal, how could I accomplish such a thing? Where could I store the memories of my old friend? Where could I temporarily hide the clouding influence of our long history and shared ideas? Gelert pounded upon the door, not with his fists, but with a convulsive spell. I recognized the strength of it. He called to me, demanding that I open the door, that I face him and finish what was begun. I knew that he would not relent, and that the sealed door would not keep him long at bay. The walls shuddered and cracked as he renewed his attacks, and it is at this point in the tale that I hope the reader, not that there shall ever be one, will extend to me some small grace. I was young and desperate and afraid. I had, perhaps, a bit more intelligence than wisdom, for when I turned back to the darkness of the bedroom, I saw the very thing I most needed. I saw a pensive. It awaited me, patiently, silently, sucking its tiny fist as it regarded me with solemn, wide eyes. The infant could hold my conflicting thoughts for me. There was no harm in it. The child's tiny brain would no sooner comprehend them than it could comprehend the words in my spellbooks. My own thoughts and memories could lie undiluted in that tiny brain for the time it would take to defeat Grindelwald, leaving me unconflicted and steady of conviction. And that, I fear, is exactly what I did. I approached my infant nephew's crib, even as the floor shook and the door pounded, even as magical light exploded through widening cracks in the ceiling and walls. I touched my wand to my head, and amidst the increasing chaos, I concentrated, calling on every shred of my creative magical energies. I siphoned off all memory of my friendship with Gellert Grindelwald, leaving no echo of it in my own mind. For good measure, I included all of our shared ideas, the inherent weakness of the muggle world, the justification of all in the name of the greater good, the memories of my mother's death, and before that, Ariana's demented fugues, and even before that, the attack of those who did not understand her and her powers. I poured it all into a long, silvery thread, pulled it carefully from my own temple, and felt it emptying blissfully from my mind. The thread pulsed on the end of my wand, long and thick, loaded with my own haunting past. Even in the midst of the ensuing chaos, I felt some small thrill of gratification. The experiment had worked. Echoless memory extraction was indeed possible. With no compunction, carefully, gently, I placed the memory against the temple of my infant nephew. He absorbed it without blinking. I saw it vanish into his head, slowly but surely. When I took my wand from him, it was dark, empty, and cold. It was ready for battle, as was I. And here, dear impossible reader, is where my direct memory of these events falters. The rest I only know by the retelling of others, by guesswork, and by my own considerable skill at divination. The duel recommenced, but there was no clear winner. Ariana and Aberforth returned to the cottage in a panic at the very height of the battle, finding two figures locked in warfare so bright, so intense, so devastating that it destroyed what remained of the cottage. Ariana, unfortunately, was killed, crushed in the wreckage. Aberforth was thrown some distance away, unconscious as the cottage burned merrily, sparking with magical aftermath. Gellert Grindelwald barely escaped with his life, chased by his nemesis, 
a man whose conviction had returned in force, shocking in its severity and grim in its determination, and forgotten amidst it all, if only for a moment, was a young baby boy crying amidst the flames as the cottage crashed all around him. His cries floated into the night air, reaching the ears of a man who had run to the cottage in alarm, summoned by the noise of the duel. Finding the cottage collapsing in flames, the man, a poor, itinerant muggle of nearly fifty, braved the inferno, burning his hands quite severely as he sought out his tiny, wailing cries. He took the baby home to his wife. He assumed that the baby's family had died in the fire. He and his wife raised the baby as their own, taking him with them on their interminable travels, naturally untraceable, even when some years later they finally settled on the coast of Norway's Svalbard region. And as the baby grew, as his tiny brain expanded and took on language and began to form its own memories, the thoughts that had been planted inside him began to blossom like an invasive vine consuming an entire garden. The power of those memories took control of the boy. He somehow knew they were not his, but he absorbed them helplessly. They defined him. His innate personality bent before the personality injected into him, even influencing his appearance. He became the person from whom those memories originated. He resented this, and simultaneously embraced it. He hated the person that had invaded him, made him his dark mirror. But there was a good side, because that person had been powerful. And even at a young age, even in the midst of a perfectly prosaic muggle upbringing, the boy knew that power was good. Some day it would allow him to become everything that his benign double had been afraid to be. I, of course, was that boy. I have adopted the name given to me by my muggle family, Avior Dorchaska Than. But I am now, and will forever be, Albus Dumbledore's unwitting doppelganger. He abandoned me to my fate. Admittedly, he searched for me. I know this now. I have made quite a study of my now-dead benefactor. But he failed to find me. He failed because I did not wish to be found. I used his own prodigious magic to construct a shield to hide myself from him and others like him. He made me. He gave me both his convictions and his powers. The guilt of this consumed him, but I would not allow him relief. I was a mere ghost to him, untraceable, haunting his past. I desired nothing more than he live with the torment of what he had done. Not to mention the fact that, had he found me, he could have undone his work. He could have removed the memories that define me, and with them, the exceptional power that drives me. I refuse to allow that to happen, despite the fact that his memories imprison me. I am their slave, and for me there is no respite, no bliss of a pensive. I am a pensive, you see. This is the burden that I have borne throughout my years. I lived in the terror that Albus Dumbledore would find me and take from me his dark gift, and yet I lived in the hope that he would find me nonetheless and grant me release. The friction of these two desires was like a fault line in my soul, tearing me in two. But now, thankfully, blessedly, Albus Dumbledore is dead. His body lies buried in a white tomb. I go there to be sure of it sometimes, to assure myself that he is indeed gone, a mere husk of dead flesh and bone. His death has freed me. Now, finally, I will accomplish the destiny that he was too conflicted to fulfill. I will finish the work of the man he bested, for I have the best of both of them. I have Gilead Grindelwald's singular conviction, and Albus Dumbledore's unmatched power. Let this record stand for the manifesto I could never write, but which will surely arise once my work is complete. My plan is set into motion. The pieces move according to my design. Allies have come to my side. 
Soon the destiny of all magical kind will be fulfilled with finality. For wizard kind. For progress. For the natural order. For the greater good. James stared at the diary's last phrase, too stunned to move. Albus stirred next to him. Tentatively, he reached forward and turned the page. It was blank. You were right, James, Rose said, awed. Avior is Dumbledore's magical twin. James shook his head. He's not a twin at all, he said, stepping back from the diary. He's something else, something worse. He's a golem. Nastasha said soberly. Albus glanced at her. A what? A golem. We just learned about them in Professor Bunyan's History of Magic. It's a clay statue brought to life by a magical scrawl on its head. The words on the scrawl give it its personality and drive its every action. Except the words on Avio's scrawl are all the worst things about Albus Dumbledore. Rose nodded, her eyes wide and grave. It's all of his faults, but without any of his virtues. He's... he's... Evil Dumbledore. The words hung in the air, sounding simultaneously preposterous and chilling. And in the main chamber of Avior's office, the hearth flared bright green, illuminating the room and throwing shadows up onto the flimsy curtains of the diary alcove. He's coming, Albus declared, slamming the diary shut. Quick, hide! Instinctively, James jerked the alcove curtain shut and threw himself against the wall next to them, dragging Nastasha alongside. Albus and Rose disappeared in a flurry of vanishing fabric. At precisely the same moment, a pair of footsteps clunked onto the stone floor of the main chamber. A shadowy silhouette appeared against the alcove curtains as the green light died away, replaced with flickering yellow. For nearly a minute, the shadowy figure did not move. James struggled to hold his breath. He realized he was still clutching Nastasha to him. Silently, he let go of her and pushed her backwards into the alcove. She sidled up next to him. And then, startling James severely, the shadowy figure spoke his name. James Potter, I knew we would meet again. Do come out. There is no need to hide. James couldn't move. His eyes bulged in the darkness. It wasn't just that he was caught. It was that the voice was all wrong. He had expected Professor Avior, but this voice was different. It was deeper, more vicious, with a hint of a teasing growl in it. He recognized it. The last time he had heard it, he had been in New Amsterdam. He turned to Nastasha, his eyes wide and shocked. The Collector, he mouthed. She frowned at him in the darkness. Finally, the silhouette on the curtains moved. You've been reading my diary, Mr. Potter, the voice chided. You should not be surprised that I know this. The warnings at the beginning were quite clear. As you read my words, I read you. Be grateful that I waited for you to finish before interrupting you. Nastasha was still frowning at James in the dark. She shook her head. Avior, she mouthed. She was right. Despite how the voice had initially sounded, it was now unmistakably that of Avior Dorchaska Than. Behind James, the curtains jerked back, opening fully and admitting the yellow flicker of the hearth, as well as a long, tall shadow on the back wall. There is no need to fear, Mr. Potter, the shadow said. And good evening to you as well, Miss Hendricks. Tea? Nastasha smiled and shrugged. Why not? When in Rome? Lots of sugar, lots of cream, if you don't mind. Of course, the figure sighed. James turned and looked up, studying the tall figure. It was Professor Avior, right down to the half-moon spectacles, crooked blade-like nose, and rakish peaked hat. He smiled coolly at James, then, with a welcoming sweep of his arm, beckoned them into the office proper. You now know all of my secrets, Mr. Potter, he said, noticing James's hesitance. Please let us not stand on formality. We are like the closest of friends and the deepest of confidants. You need not hesitate in my presence. Nastasha tugged at James's arm, drawing him out of the alcove. 
He followed her to a large, low sofa near the hearth. She plopped onto it easily, but James remained standing. Ask what you will, Mr. Potter, Avior called as he flicked his wand, summoning a silver tea set from across the room. It lofted effortlessly, glinting in the darkness, and followed him to the sofa. It does not take an expert at divination to know that you are simply bursting with questions. James's lips remained clamped shut. The truth was that he was so full of questions and no small amount of fear that he felt completely stymied. Finally, as Avior used his wand to levitate the teapot and fill a steaming cup, one question pushed to the forefront of his curiosity. Why did you let us read your diary? Avior smiled as he poured a second cup. Straight to the root of the matter, he nodded. Your forthrightness is one of your strongest traits, Mr. Potter. It's a gift, really. He finished pouring the tea and then settled himself into a large armchair opposite the sofa. He stared at James over his raised teacup, smiling faintly. I allowed you to read my diary, Mr. Potter, he answered slowly, because I wished you to. I knew you were curious about me. That is why I invited you to my quarters, if you'll recall. I knew that if we were to be friends, and perhaps even compatriots, then we needed to start with a foundation of trust and honesty. I already knew your story, James. I have been quite a student of your exploits, albeit secretly. It was only fair, then, that you should know mine. James shook his head, confused. But why? What's the point? I mean, I feel sort of bad for what happened to you and all. Tut, Avior said, closing his eyes and raising a thin hand. You misunderstand me, James. You really might try being a bit more like Miss Hendricks here. She understands these things very well, I suspect. Am I correct, young lady? Nastasha bobbed her head and swirled her tea. You wanted James to know your story because it makes you both even. It's fair that way. No secrets. Precisely, Avior nodded. I do not require your sympathy, James, nor anyone else's. I do not begrudge my fate any longer. No, in fact, I embrace it. The simple fact is that I do not suffer from my benefactor's greatest flaw. Albus Dumbledore, you see, was a legendary keeper of secrets. He hid them away from those who most deserved his trust. Your father, James, suffered for this. For months at a stretch, Albus Dumbledore kept him deliberately in the dark, starved of information and trust. Even today, this torments your father, although I doubt he is fully aware of it himself. Had Dumbledore been fully honest with Harry, things might have been different. Why, Dumbledore might even still be alive. Avior paused, his face clouding slightly at the idea. After a moment, he shook himself. My point is this. Albus Dumbledore spent a lifetime hiding much and revealing little. I do not suffer from that error. I have laid bare my complete past to you, James, as a sign of trust, of balance. James finally sank onto the couch next to Nastasha. But I still don't understand. Why? Avior turned from James to Nastasha, his eyebrows rising inquisitively. Have you read the books based on the famed Harry Potter, Miss Hendricks? The ones by the talented Miss Revalvier? Nastasha nodded and grinned. Who didn't? When I was a kid, we devoured them like candy. Tell me, Avior went on, gazing thoughtfully into the darkness overhead. Why do you believe it is important to me that I undo the mistakes of my unwitting twin? Nastasha drew a deep breath and seemed to give the question a moment's thought. James watched her, both impressed and annoyed at her apparent ease. I suppose, because just as old Dumbledore needed Harry, you need James, she finally suggested, shrugging. Wheels within wheels, history repeating itself and all that. Well, Avior hedged, need is a rather strong word. But I do believe you have hit upon the crux of the matter nonetheless, Miss Hendricks, and I am not surprised. Time, James, is a circle. You are too young to know this, but the past does repeat itself all the time, endlessly. Even the muggles understand this. 
they have a saying. Those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. But this is a flawed idea. The wisest of us do not shy away from repeating history. The wisest of us seek to recognize the patterns and not just repeat them, but improve upon them. Harry Potter and Albus Dumbledore were the first cycle. You and I, James, are the second. We must not make the mistakes they did. I have done my part by not withholding my past from you, as Dumbledore did with your father. Similarly, I have hopes that you will make an effort not to repeat your father's uh, miscalculations. James's mind was reeling. The frown on his face felt permanently plastered there. I... he shook his head worriedly. I don't know what you mean. What am I supposed to do? It's simple, James, Avior answered easily. You have begun to oppose me. You do not know it, but it is true. You followed me in the Forbidden Forest, uncovered some small corner of my plan, and attempted to reveal it to the powers that be, for all the good that it will do. This is not the way it is supposed to happen, my young friend. Destiny has a different plan for you. He glanced towards his desk, towards the oversized chessboard with its arranged pieces. We all have our parts to play. We must improve upon history, not thwart it. We must not make the same errors as Dumbledore and your legendary father. James shook his head again, more firmly this time. But they didn't make any mistakes. They won, didn't they? I mean, sure, Dumbledore died. Maybe that could have been prevented somehow. But together with a load of friends and helpers, they beat Voldemort. And under the circumstances, Avior nodded, setting his teacup aside on a small table. That was somewhat regrettably necessary. The Dark Lord suffered from delusions of crippling grandeur. He had become a caricature, a megalomaniac. He had forgotten his true purpose and therefore become a liability. I watched all of this, knew how it must end even without the aid of my divinations. The cycle was not ready to be complete, but now the cycle is begun anew. Now it will be accomplished as it should have been then. The strategy of visionary, if misunderstood, wizards since Salazar Slytherin himself will finally be brought to fruition. A cold chill ran down James's back, settling in his feet and turning them to blocks of ice. Not for the first time, he longed for the steadying counsel of Headmaster Merlin, whose world view had always seemed so comfortingly simple, if frustratingly black and white. You're talking about destroying the vow of secrecy and taking over the muggle world. Avior shook his head and chuckled. My dear James, the vow of secrecy is already destroyed. It was shattered by the hand of your own friend and soulmate, Petra Morganston. Like it or not, you were instrumental in that act. You see, you have already begun to fulfill the role destiny has determined for you. Just as Harry Potter was instrumental to Albus Dumbledore, so are you destined to walk beside me, to help bring the wizarding world into its long-awaited golden age. James wanted to leave, to run, to find himself anywhere other than this room, surrounded by these mad, impossible words and that knowing, all-too-familiar face. Helplessly, he glanced aside at Nastasha. She sipped her tea and looked back at him mildly. Seeing no help there, James returned his attention to the professor. This isn't really you talking, he said, trying to make sense of what was happening. It's the bits of Dumbledore he put into your head when you were a baby, the parts he knew were bad. You're just... you're just a golem. Avior's face darkened as James spoke. I'll thank you not to use my generosity against me, Mr. Potter, he said coolly. I shared my history with you to prove my honesty not to provide you the illusion of leverage. Has it ever occurred to you that Albus Dumbledore was, in fact, right? Not the old man that befriended and used your father, but the young man that was my uncle, the friend and co-revolutionary of Gellert Grindelwald? It was Albus Dumbledore himself who coined the phrase, for the greater good. 
The man you revere once knew that Wizardkind's true destiny was to rule, to rise to a rightful position of superiority over the Muggle world, not as a tyrant, such was Lord Voldemort's mistake, but as a shepherd, a guardian, and, yes, a warden. This is both the burden and the glory of Wizardkind, for the Muggles' benefit as well as ours. They need us, after all. We have thus far failed them. Young Dumbledore was right. Surely you must see this. James was shaking his head slowly as Avior spoke, his brow furrowing. Dumbledore changed his mind. He got older, wiser. He knew that if the wizarding world ever rose to power over muggles, the power would become corrupted. Tyrants would take over. Nobody can handle that much control without abusing it. This is what you are taught, Avior nodded. And as a rule, it is true. But there are a select few of us for whom such axioms do not apply. For this unique handful, it is our duty to prove the rule by being its exception. Nastasha nodded blithely. Makes sense to me. James turned towards her in disbelief, his eyes wide. She grinned at him, and James saw the mean glint in her eye of her other. Nasty. She winked at him. So it really is you, then? James said, speaking to Avior, and standing once again, shoving a hand into his pocket for his wand. You really are planning to set off some sort of magical superweapon at Hogwarts at the end of the year, attacking and killing a bunch of muggle world leaders. Revolutions are simple mathematics, Mr. Potter, Avior bowed his head sadly. The winner is always the one willing to provide the right number of casualties. The Morrigan Web is a mysterious, dastardly weapon, of that there is no doubt. But its black grandiosity is what makes it so effective. Better a single strike, cutting down all opposition at once, than an interminable war rife with unintended victims, innocent bystanders, and unfortunate human shields. This, after all, is how human leaders maintain the illusion of superiority, not by being the most powerful, but by hiding behind the most soldiers. If you think about it, my plan targeting the leaders themselves, surgically, like the cancers that they are, is more than humane. It is our moral responsibility. You're completely bloody mad! James shook his head slowly. You're not just planning to kill muggle world leaders, you'll kill wizard leaders as well. The Minister of Magic himself will be there, as well as loads of other wizard presidents and kings and chancellors. Avior nodded, grimacing. Alas, the cancer has spread to the ranks of wizard kind as well, James. But even amongst wizards, government leaders are simply the tools in the hands of the populace. If a tool ceases performing its function, it must be destroyed and replaced. James backed away slightly, slowly, his right hand still buried in his robes, fist on his wand. The Morrigan Web, he said slowly. Sure, all right then. So tell me. If I'm going to join you, work with you, what does it do? How does it work? Avior chuckled breezily. There is a reason I had to destroy Mr. Warlick, he said, his eyes twinkling. Even my greatest allies can become liabilities simply by knowing too much. Warlick knew very, very much. It was a shame to kill him, for he was an effective tool, but it was prudent and necessary. Had he been captured, say, by your father, James, as he already was once, he might have revealed the very secrets you ask. Believe me, I'm doing you a favor by not revealing to you the mysteries and secrets of the Morrigan Web. Besides, you do me a disservice. You do not mean to assist me even now, but to find a weakness, to take advantage of me, to thwart me. I do not blame you for this. Alliances such as ours take time. A thought occurred to James, creasing his brow as he looked directly at Avior. How do you know all this? The Morrigan Web was created by some bloke in the United States, some daft American wizard using a bunch of muggle slaves to gather his supplies. He's got to know all of your secrets too, doesn't he? Are you planning on killing him as well? We've met him, and I've got a pretty good idea that killing him would be a lot harder than killing Warlick. He'd expected Avior to be angry at this, or shocked and surprised. 
Instead, the old professor simply shook his head and laughed softly, closing his eyes again. James, my boy, I admit I expected more from you. You are smart. I provided you with all of the necessary pieces. All you had to do was put them together. But perhaps I should not blame your wit. It takes more than mere intelligence to comprehend such cunning. In time you may develop the proper skills, as Miss Hendricks has done. Avior leaned forward now, meeting James's gaze, his own eyes piercingly blue above his half-moon glasses. Look closely at me, James. What do you see? James did look closely, squinting. As usual, he hadn't brought his glasses. He shook his head vaguely. It is not unusual for witches and wizards to learn the art of the Animagus, Avior said, lowering his voice to a low rumble. Your own Professor McGonagall has mastered this skill. She transforms herself into a common feline at will. I have simply taken this technique to the next level. He stood, removing his spectacles and tucking them into his robe. Still smiling, he withdrew his pointed hat from his head and dropped it unceremoniously to the chair behind him. I have mastered the art of transfiguring myself into the most dangerous animal of them all. His smile widened, showing all of his teeth. He spread his arms slowly. The human animal. As he spoke, he changed. His narrow shoulders expanded. His thin arms grew round with muscle beneath his robes. His beard shortened, darkened, and shrank away to no more than a grey shadow on his cheeks and chin. But worst of all was his face. The kindly, wizened visage of Albus Dumbledore grew cold, chiseled with cruel, sneering lips and eyes black as tar. I need not fear what my compatriot in the United States knows the professor's new face said with its deeper, gloating voice, because I am he. The collector is my alter ego, my mask. It is the face I shall wear as I ascend to power in the United States, and soon after, the world. James nearly fell backwards onto the sofa. He stared at himself clumsily, unable to take his eyes away from the professor's new, dark visage. But, he stammered, his voice suddenly very dry. But you sent monsters after us. You tried to kill us. I did indeed, the transformed figure said, bowing his head as if offering an apology for an accidental slight. I was perhaps a bit rash. I invented the Collector as a sort of puppet, a decoy. But he has developed rather a personality of his own. When I am in his guise, I admit he occasionally gets the better of me. And yet, in my defense, I did not then know how important you might be to me, James. I did not respect the role you would play. Things are different now. I do beg your forgiveness as we forge our potential new alliance. I won't form any alliance with you, James said, finally drawing his wand shakily from his robe. I just won't. The collector looked pained. That would be regrettable, James. Please, for your own sake, I beg you not to answer so quickly. History will repeat itself, but with subtle changes. Think back to the past. Albus Dumbledore was killed in the course of the last cycle, cut down by the wand of a friend disguised as an enemy. If you resist me, if you attempt to stand in the path of destiny, I fear this time... You may be cut down by the wand of an enemy, disguised as a friend. James sensed movement out of the corner of his eye. He glanced aside and saw that Nastasha had stood as well. Her wand was out, pointed at him. The look on her face was regretful, but steady and unflinching. Sorry, James, she shrugged one shoulder. I tried to tell you not to trust me. Really, I gave you plenty of warning. James shook his head his confusion steadily overwhelmed by a sort of disgusted anger. You're in on this? She rolled her eyes impatiently. Don't get all high and mighty on me. I just figured it all out a few days before you did. The only difference between you and me is that I know the professor is right. 
that's a pretty major difference, James spat, raising his own wand. He nearly killed us in New Amsterdam. Expelliarmus, Nastasha called in a bored voice, flicking her wand at him. James's wand wrenched out of his hand and spun through the air. Nastasha caught it deftly. Wow, she said, impressed with herself. That was pretty good, wasn't it? You totally should have seen that coming. Power belongs to those unafraid to use it, the collector said approvingly, still standing before his armchair. You could learn a lot from Miss Hendricks, James. The Americans have always appreciated the inevitability of progress. Of course, she is helped very much by her family heritage. I recognized this immediately about her. Blood carries its own memories, and hers is a very rich blood indeed. James studied Nastasha's face. Nasty? That would be easier, wouldn't it? She smiled wanly, her wand still pointed unflinchingly at him. James was dismayed to see that this wasn't some fractured half-version of Nastasha's personality. This was all of her, both Nasty and Asher, working together, if reluctantly. He backed further away from her, although he sensed it was no use. Behind him was bare stone wall, flanked by pillars. Across from him, the chamber entrance was guarded by the imposing clockwork figure of Tawil at Umur. All right. James stammered quickly, glancing from Nastasha to the collector. What do you want? The collector spread his hands, palms up. All I want, James, he smiled, is your consideration, your patience, your willingness to entertain the idea that I may, in fact, be right. You will find this difficult to believe, but I am not a bad man. I myself am simply a tool in the hand of destiny. Fortunate enough to be available at this all-important, pivotal moment in history. What I desire from you is a decision. Will you help take us forward into a new golden age of wizard kind? Or will you, like so many others, be crushed in the teeth of progress? As he spoke, the collector turned aside, approaching the desk. You see, James... There is no mechanism by which the cycle can be stopped this time. Forces beyond comprehension have aligned to assure this. Destiny is no longer a moot force, cold and distant. Destiny is now one of our tools, a cord to be stretched and tied at will. He glanced back at James, smiling conspiratorially. A crimson thread, as it were, is very nearly within our grasp, ready to be sewn as we wish forming a tapestry of our own design. James knew what the horrible figure was referring to. In his mind, he saw the mysterious loom of destinies in the cellar of Alma Aleron's archive, frozen in place, no longer weaving its magical, interminable tale of human history, all because of a single, stolen red thread. He heard the voice of Merlin, both grave and foreboding. This changes everything. The crimson thread, he whispered. The Lady of the Lake. The collector ignored him. He turned back to the desk and, almost daintily, plucked a piece from the oversized chessboard. It was one of the crystal knights. The tiny figure glimmered and sparkled in his hand. Your choice, James, he mused, staring at the chess piece, is not whether to join me or to attempt to stop me. There is no stopping me now. The pieces are very nearly in place. The secrets of the Morrigan web are safely hidden. The plan of months and years and centuries is now in motion. No, James, your choice is to join me or to die. The collector's words hung in the air like smoke, lingering, echoing in James's head. Was he really being threatened with death right here, right now? He glanced towards Nastasha's outstretched wand then to her eyes. She offered him an impatient grimace and a minute shake of her head, as if to say, What are you waiting for, stupid? Across the room, a ruffle of fabric and a sudden movement caught James's attention. A hand appeared in midair, hovering a few feet behind the collector. The hand, James recognized it as Albus's, was fisted around a wand. Petrificus, he called, his voice muffled beneath the invisibility cloak, and then interrupting himself. Now, bugger! 
There was a scuffle, a grunt, and Albus's hand swung towards the floor, dropping his wand. James' relief was replaced with annoyed frustration as both Albus and Rose tumbled out from beneath the cloak, falling atop each other onto the stone floor. The collector did not turn around. Amazing things, invisibility cloaks, he commented idly, but with the fatal flaw of being a constant tripping hazard. Miss Hendricks, please assure that our new guests won't cause any trouble. Nastasha rolled her eyes irritably, and, cursing under her breath, summoned both Rose's and Albus's wands. They clacked against James's as they flew into her hand. Welcome, my young friends, the collector announced. I'd have offered you tea as well, but you seem to be so enjoying your sense of secret adventure. Please, if you would just stand over there, we'll be finished here quite soon. Rose made to throw herself upon Nastasha, but a mere wave of the collector's wand tossed her backwards, knocking Albus aside. Both tumbled messily to the floor next to the Jiskra's giant birdcage. Stop it! James cried, stepping forwards again. Leave them alone! Still holding the crystal knight in his left hand, the collector looked back at James, his expression serious. Let this be a lesson, Mr. Potter. Your decisions are never yours alone. The repercussions influence everyone around us, your brother and cousin, for instance. But I know what you're thinking. You are thinking of your poor, unfortunate cousin Lucy. He nodded slowly, his eyes unwavering. She paid the ultimate price for your decisions, did she not? A pity you haven't learned to avoid such errors. Or have you? Be careful. Your next words will decide the course of many, many lives. But it was not James who spoke next. It was Albus. Hey, Professor, he said, adopting his most churlish tone of voice. You forgot. We Slytherins don't need wands to cause trouble. James turned towards his brother, as did Nastasha and the Collector. Albus had both of his hands hooked into the framework of the Jiskra's cage. With a hard grin, he heaved it over. The cage toppled, crashed, and broke open. With an ear-splitting screech, the Jiskra burst out of it, seeming to immediately double in size as it reared, unfurling great leathery wings matted with red feathers. The two heads pivoted on goose-like necks, swiveling furiously and locking fixedly onto Albus. Oh, bugger! Albus cried again, grabbing Rose and yanking her aside. The Jiskra screeched, this time exhaling a directed spray of mist from one head. The other head spat a streak of white sparks like a stone striking a flint. The sparks ignited the mist, which exploded into blue-orange flame. James boggled as the flames filled the space where, only a moment before, Albus and Rose had been standing. Fire bloomed against the wall, lighting an enormous tapestry. A hand suddenly seized James's wrist. He glanced up to see Nastasha, her wand lowered, her face wide-eyed and impatient, dragging him towards the fireplace. Come on, Cornelius, she declared. You want to become a permanent resident? The collector strode forwards, his wand raised. For the moment, however, he was distracted by the burning tapestry. A jet of water erupted from his wand, hissing against the flames. Ow! James cried. Rose! Nastasha grabbed a small pot from the mantle over the fireplace. Flu powder, of course. She heaved it into the fire, where it shattered. Jump! she commanded, pulling James along with her. Green flames swirled around him as he half leapt, half fell into the hearth. Behind him, Rose screamed. Albus cursed. The collector roared. An instant later, the noise fell away, engulfed in spinning green flames. Wherever James and Nastasha were headed, he could only hope that his cousin and brother had both the good sense and great fortune to follow.